Chapter 16 of Edison, His Life and Inventions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 16 the first Edison Central Station. A noted inventor once said at the end of a lifetime of fighting to defend his rights that he found there were three stages in all great inventions. The first in which people said the thing could not be done, the second in which they said anybody could do it, and the third in which they said it had always been done by everybody. In his Central Station work, Edison has had very much this kind of experience, for while many of his opponents came to acknowledge the novelty and utility of his plans, and gave him unstinted praise, there are doubtless others who to this day profess to look upon him merely as an adapter. How different the view of so eminent a scientist as Lord Kelvin was may be appreciated from his remark when in later years in reply to the question why someone else did not invent so obvious and simple a thing as the feeder system, he said, The only answer I can think of is that no one else was Edison. Undaunted by the attitude of doubt and the predictions of impossibility, Edison had pushed on until he was now able to realize all his ideas as to the establishment of a central station in the work that culminated in New York City in 1882. After he had conceived the broad plan, his ambition was to create the initial plant on Manhattan Island, where it would be convenient of access for watching its operation, and where the demonstration of its practicability would have influence in financial circles. The first intention was to cover a district extending from Canal Street on the north to Wall Street on the south. But Edison soon realized that this territory was too extensive for the initial experiment, and he decided finally upon the district included between Wall, Nassau, Spruce, and Ferry Streets, Peck Slip, and the East River, an area nearly a square mile in extent. One of the preliminary steps taken to enable him to figure on such a station and system was to have men go through this district on various days and note the number of gas jets burning at each hour up to two or three o'clock in the morning. The next step was to divide the region into a number of sub-districts and institute a house-to-house -house canvas to ascertain precisely the data and conditions pertinent to the project. When the canvas was over, Edison knew exactly how many gas jets there were in every building in the entire district, the average hours of burning, and the cost of light. Also, every consumer of power and the quantity used, every hoist away which an electric motor could be applied, and other details too numerous to mention, such as related to the gas itself, the satisfaction of the customers, and the limitations of day and night demand. All this information was embodied graphically in large maps of the district by annotations in colored inks and Edison thus could study the question with every detail before him. Such a reconnaissance, like that of a coming field of battle, was invaluable and may help give a further idea of the man's inveterate care for the minutia of things. The laboratory notebooks of this period, 1878 through 1880 more particularly, show an immense amount of calculation by Edison and his chief mathematician, Mr. Upton, on conductors for the distribution of current over large areas, and then later in the district described. With the results of this canvas before them, the sizes of the main conductors to be laid throughout the street of this entire territory were figured block by block, and the results were then placed on the map. These data revealed the fact that the quantity of copper required for the main conductors would be exceedingly large and costly and, if ever, Edison was somewhat dismayed. But, as usual, this apparently insurmountable difficulty only spurred him on to further effort. It was but a short time thereafter that he solved the knotty problem by an invention mentioned in a previous chapter. This is known as the feeder and main system, for which he signed the application for a patent on August 4, 1880. 
as this invention affected a saving of seven-eighths of the cost of the chief conductors in a straight multiple arc system, the mains for the first district were refigured and enormous new maps were made, which became the final basis of actual installation, as they were subsequently enlarged by the addition of every proposed junction box, bridge safety catch box, and street intersection box in the whole area. When this patent, after protracted fighting, was sustained by Judge Green in 1893, the electrical engineer remarked that the General Electric Company must certainly feel elated because of its importance, and the journal expressed its fear that, although the specifications and claims related only to the maintenance of uniform pressure of current on lighting circuits, the owners might naturally seek to apply it also to feeders used in the electric railway work already so extensive. At this time, however, the patent had only about a year of life left, owing to the expiration of the corresponding English patent. The fact that thirteen years had elapsed gives a vivid idea of the ordeal involved in sustaining a patent and the injustice to the inventor. While there is obviously hardship to those who cannot tell from any decision of the court whether they are infringing or not. It is interesting to note that the preparation for hearing this case in New Jersey was accompanied by models to show the court exactly the method and its economy as worked out in comparison with what is known as the tree system of circuits, the older alternative way of doing it. As a basis of comparison, a district of 36 city blocks in the form of a square was assumed. The power station was placed at the center of the square. Each block had 16 consumers using 15 lights each. Conductors were run from the station to supply each of the four quarters of the district with light. In one example the feeder system was used, in the other the tree. With these models were shown two cubes which represented one one-hundredth of the actual quantity of copper required for each quarter of the district by the two-wire tree system as compared with the feeder system under like conditions. The total weight of copper for the four-quarter districts by the tree system was 803,250 pounds, but when the feeder system was used it was only 128,739 pounds. This was a reduction from $23.24 per lamp for copper to $3.72 per lamp. Other models emphasize this extraordinary contrast. At the time Edison was doing this work on economizing in conductors, much of the criticism against him was based on the assumed extravagant use of copper implied in the obvious tree system, and it was very naturally said that there was not enough copper in the world to supply his demands. It is true that the modern electrical arts have been a great stimulator of copper production, now taking a quarter of all made, yet evidently, but for such inventions as this, such arts could not have come into existence at all, or else, in growing up, they would have forced copper to starvation prices. 11. Footnote 11. For description of feeder patent, see Appendix. It should be borne in mind that from the outset, Edison had determined upon installing underground conductors as the only permanent and satisfactory method for the distribution of current from central stations and cities, and that at Menlo Park he laid out and operated such a system with about 425 lamps. The underground system was limited to the immediate vicinity of the laboratory and was somewhat crude as well as much less complicated than would be the network of over 80,000 lineal feet, which he calculated to be required for the underground circuits in the first district of New York City. At Menlo Park, no effort was made for permanency. No provision was needed in regard to occasional openings of the street for various purposes. No new customers were to be connected from time to time to the mains, and no repairs were within contemplation. In New York, the question of permanency was of paramount importance, and the other contingencies were sure to arise as well as conditions more easy to imagine than to forestall. These problems were all attacked in a resolute, thoroughgoing manner, 
and one by one solved by the invention of new and unprecedented devices that were adequate for the purposes of the time, and which are embodied in apparatus of slight modification in use up to the present day. Just what all this means, it is hard for the present generation to imagine. New York and all the other great cities in 1882, and for some years thereafter, were burdened and darkened by hideous masses of overhead wires carried on ugly wooden poles along all the main thoroughfares. One after another, rival telegraph and telephone, stock ticker, burglar alarm, and other companies had strung their circuits without any supervision or restriction. And these wires, in all conditions of staggered decay, ramified and crisscrossed in every direction, often hanging broken and loose-ended for months there being no official compulsion to remove any dead wire. None of these circuits carried dangerous currents, but the introduction of the arc light brought an entirely new menace in the use of pressures that were even worse than the bully of the West, who kills on sight because this kindred peril was invisible and might lurk anywhere. New poles were put up, and the lighting circuits on them, with but a slight insulation of cotton impregnated with some weatherproof compound, straggled all over the city exposed to wind and rain and accidental contact with other wires or with the metal of buildings. So many fatalities occurred that the insulated wire used, called underwriters, because approved by the insurance bodies, became jocularly known as undertakers, and efforts were made to improve its protective qualities. Then came the overhead circuits for distributing electrical energy to motors, for operating elevators, driving machinery, etc., and these, while using a lower or safer potential, were proportionately larger. There were no wires underground. Morse had tried that at the very beginning of electrical application in telegraphy, and all agreed that renewals of the experiment were at once costly and foolish. At last, in cities like New York, what may be styled generically, the overhead system of wires broke down under its own weight, and various methods of underground conductors were tried, hastened in many places by the chopping down of poles and wires as the result of some accident that stirred the public indignation. One typical tragic scene was that in New York, where within sight of the city hall, a lineman was killed at his work on the arc light pole and his body slowly roasted before the gaze of the excited populace, which for days afterward dropped its silver and copper coin into the alms box, nailed to the fatal pole for the benefit of his family. Out of all this in New York came a board of electrical control, a conduit system, and in the final analysis, the Public Service Commission, that is credited to Governor Hughes as the furthest development of utility corporation control. The Road to Yesterday, back to Edison and his insistence on underground wires, is a long one, but the preceding paragraph traces it. Even admitting that the size and weight of his low-tension conductors necessitated putting them underground, this argues nothing against the propriety and sanity of his methods. He believed deeply and firmly in the analogy between electrical supply and that for water and gas and pointed to the trite fact that nobody hoisted the water and gas mains into the air on stilts, and that none of the pressures were inimical to human safety. The arc lighting methods were unconsciously and unwittingly prophetic of the latter-day long-distance transmissions at high pressure that, electrically, have placed the energy of Niagara at the command of Syracuse and Utica, and have put the power of the falling waters of the Sierras at the disposal of San Francisco, 200 miles away. But within city limits, overhead wires with such space-consuming potentials are as fraught with mischievous peril to the public as the dynamite stored by a nonchalant contractor in the cellar of a schoolhouse. As an offset, then, to any tendency to depreciate the intrinsic value of Edison's lighting work, let the claim be here set forth modestly and subject to interference that he was the father of underground wires in America, and by his example outlined the policy now dominant in every city of the first rank. Even the comment of a cynic in regard to electrical development may be accepted. 
Some electrical companies wanted all the air. Others apparently had use for all the water. Edison only asked for the earth. The late Jacob Hess, a famous New York Republican politician, was a member of the commission appointed to put the wires underground in New York City in the 80s. He stated that when the commission was struggling with the problem and examining all kinds of devices and plans, patented and unpatented, for which fabulous sums were often asked, the body turned to Edison in its perplexity and asked for advice. Edison said, all you have to do, gentlemen, is to insulate your wires, draw them through the cheapest thing on earth, iron pipe, run your pipes through channels or galleries under the street, and you've got the whole thing done. This was practically the system adopted and in use to this day. What puzzled the old politician was that Edison would accept nothing for his advice. Another story may also be interpolated here as to the underground work done in New York for the first Edison station. It refers to the man higher up, although the phrase had not been coined in those days of lower public morality. That a corporation should be held up was accepted philosophically by the corporation as one of the unavoidable incidents of its business. And if the corporation got back by securing some privilege without paying for it, the public was ready to condone if not applaud. Public utilities were in the making, and no one in particular had a keen sense of what was right or what was wrong in the hard practical details of their development. Edison tells this illuminating story. When I was laying tubes in the streets of New York, the office received notice from the Commissioner of Public Works to appear at his office at a certain hour. I went up there with a gentleman to see the Commissioner, H. O. Thompson. On arrival, he said to me, You are putting down these tubes. The Department of Public Works requires that you should have five inspectors to look after this work, and that their salary shall be five dollars per day, payable at the end of each week. Good morning. I went out very much crestfallen, thinking I would be delayed and harassed in the work which I was anxious to finish, and was doing night and day. We watched patiently for those inspectors to appear. The only appearance they made was to draw their pay Saturday afternoon. Just before Christmas in 1880, December 17th, as an item for the silk stocking of Father Knickerbocker, the Edison Electric Illuminating Company of New York was organized. In pursuance of the policy adhered to by Edison, a license was issued to it for the exclusive use of the system in that territory, Manhattan Island, in consideration of a certain sum of money and a fixed percentage of its capital and stock for the patent rights. Early in 1881, it was altogether a paper enterprise, but events moved swiftly as narrated already, and on June 25th, 1881, the first jumbo prototype of the dynamo electric machines to generate current at the Pearl Street station was put through its paces before being shipped to Paris to furnish new sensations to the flaneur of the boulevards. A number of the Edison officers and employees assembled at Girk Street to see this gigantic machine go into action and watched its performance with due reverence all through the night until five o'clock on Sunday morning, when it respected the conventionalities by breaking a shaft and suspending further tests. After this dynamo was shipped to France and its successors to England for the Holborn Viaduct plant, Edison made still further improvements in design, increasing capacity and economy, and then proceeded vigorously with six machines for Pearl Street. An ideal location for any central station is at the very center of the district served. It may be questioned whether it often goes there. In the New York 1st District, the nearest property available was a double building at numbers 255 and 257 Pearl Street, occupying a lot so by 100 feet. It was four stories high, with a firewall dividing it into two equal parts. One of these parts was converted for the uses of the station proper, and the other was used as a tube shop by the underground construction department, as well as for repair shops, storage, etc. Those were the days when no one built a new office for station purposes. 
That would have been deemed a fantastic extravagance. One early station in New York for arc lighting was an old soap works whose well-soaked floors did not need much additional grease to render them choice fuel for the inevitable flames. In this Pearl Street instance, the building erected originally for commercial uses was quite incapable of sustaining the weight of the heavy dynamos and steam engines to be installed on the second floor. So the old flooring was torn out, and new one of heavy girders supported by stiff columns was substituted. This heavy construction, more familiar nowadays and not unlike the supporting metal structure of the Manhattan Elevated Road, was erected independent of the enclosing walls and occupied the full width of 257 Pearl Street and about three-quarters of its depth. This change in the internal arrangements did not at all affect the ugly external appearance, which did little to suggest the stately and ornate stations since put up by the New York Edison Company, the latest occupying whole city blocks. Of this episode, Edison gives the following account. While planning for my first New York station, Pearl Street, of course, I had no real estate, and from lack of experience had very little knowledge of its cost in New York, so I assumed a rather large, liberal amount of it to plan my station on. It occurred to me one day that before I went too far with my plans, I had better find out what real estate was worth. In my original plan, I had 200 by 200 feet. I thought that by going down on a slum street near the waterfront, I would get some pretty cheap property. So I picked out the worst dilapidated street there was, and found I could only get two buildings, each 25 feet front, one 100 feet deep, and the other 85 feet deep. I thought about $10,000 each would cover it. But when I got the price, I found that they wanted $75,000 for one, and $80,000 for the other. Then I was compelled to change my plans and go upward in the air where real estate was cheap. I cleared out the building entirely to the walls and built my station of structural ironwork, running it up high. Into this converted structure was put the most complete steam plant obtainable, together with all the mechanical and engineering adjuncts bearing upon economical and successful operation. Being in a narrow street and a congested district, the plant needed special facilities for the handling of coal and ashes, as well as for ventilation and forced draught. All of these details received Mr. Edison's personal care and consideration on the spot, in addition to the multitude of other affairs demanding his thought. Although not a steam or mechanical engineer, his quick grasp of principles and omnivorous reading soon supplied the lack of training, nor had he forgotten the practical experience picked up as a boy on the locomotives of the Grand Trunk Road. It is to be noticed as a feature of the plant, in common with many of later construction, that it was placed well away from the water's edge and equipped with non-condensing engines, whereas the modern plant invariably seeks the bank of a river or lake for the purpose of a generous supply of water for its condensing engines or steam turbines. These are among the refinements of practice coincidental with the advance of the art. At the award of the John Fritz Gold Medal in April 1909 to Charles T. Porter for his work in advancing the knowledge of steam engineering and for improvements in engine construction, Mr. Frank J. Sprague spoke on behalf of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers of the debt of electricity to the high-speed steam engine. He recalled the fact that the French Exposition of 1867, Mr. Porter installed two Porter Allen engines to drive electric alternating current generators for supplying current to primitive lighthouse apparatus. While the engines were not directly coupled to the dynamos, it was a curious fact that the piston speeds and number of revolutions were what is common today in isolated direct coupled plants. In the dozen years following, Mr. Porter built many engines with certain common characteristics, i.e. high piston speed and revolutions, solid engine bed, and Babbitt metal bearings. But there was no electric driving until 1880, when Mr. Porter installed a high-speed engine for Edison at his laboratory in Menlo Park. 
Shortly after this, he was invited to construct for the Edison Pearl Street Station the first of a series of engines for so-called steam dynamos, each independently driven by a direct coupled engine. Mr. Spray compared the relations thus established between electricity and the high-speed engine not to those of debtor and creditor, but rather to those of partners, an industrial marriage, one of the most important in the engineering world. Here were two machines destined to be joined together, economizing space, enhancing economy, augmenting capacity, reducing investment, and increasing dividends. While rapid progress was being made in this and other directions, the wheels of industry were humming merrily at the Edison Tube Works. For over 15 miles of tube conductors were required for the district, besides the boxes to connect the network at the street intersections and the hundreds of junction boxes for taking the service conductors into each of the hundreds of buildings. In addition to the immense amount of money involved, this specialized industry required an enormous amount of experiment, as it called for the development of an entirely new art. But with Edison's inventive fertility, if ever there was a cross-fertilizer of mechanical ideas, it is he, and with Mr. Crusey's never-failing patience and perseverance applied to experiment and evolution, rapid progress was made. A franchise having been obtained from the city, the work of laying the underground conductors began in the late fall of 1881, and was pushed with almost frantic energy. It is not to be supposed, however, that the Edison tube system had then reached a finality of perfection in the eyes of its inventor. In his correspondence with Crucy, as late as 1887, we find Edison bewailing the inadequacy of the insulation of the conductors under 1,200 volts pressure. As for example, Dear Crucy, there is nothing wrong with your present compound. It is splendid. The whole trouble is air bubbles. The hotter it is poured, the greater the amount of air bubbles. At 212, it can be put on rods, and there is no bubble. I have a man experimenting and testing all the time. Until I get at the proper method of pouring and getting rid of the air bubbles, it will be waste of time to experiment with other asphalts. Resin oil distills off easily. It may answer, but paraffin or other similar substances must be put in to prevent brittleness. One thing is certain, and that is, everything must be poured in layers, not only the boxes, but the tubes. The tube itself should have a thin coating. The rope should also have a coating. The rods also. The whole lot. Rods and rope, when ready for tube, should have another coat, and then be placed in tube and filled. This will do the business. Broad and large as a continent in his ideas, if ever there was a man of finical fussiness and attention to detail, it is Edison. A letter of seven pages of about the same date in 1887 expatiates on the vicious troubles caused by the air bubble and remarks with fine insight into the problems of insulation and the ideas of layers of it. Thus, you have three separate coatings, and it is impossible an air hole in one should match the other. To a man less thorough and empirical in method than Edison, it would have been sufficient to have made his plans clear to associates or subordinates and hold them responsible for accurate results. No such vicarious treatment would suit him, ready as he has always been to share the work where he could give his trust. In fact, he realized, as no one else did at this stage, the tremendous import of this novel and comprehensive scheme for giving the world light, and he would not let go, even if busy to the breaking point. Though plunged in a veritable maelstrom of new and important business interests, and though applying for no fewer than 89 patents in 1881, all of which were granted, he superintended on the spot all this laying of underground conductors for the first district. Nor did he merely stand around and give orders. Day and night he actually worked in the trenches with the laborers amid the dirt and paving stones and hurry-burly of traffic, helping to lay the tubes, filling up junction boxes, and taking part in all the infinite detail. He wanted to know for himself how things went, why for some occult reason a little change was necessary, what improvement could be made in the material. His hours of work were not regulated by the clock, but lasted until he felt the need of a little rest. 
Then he would go off to the station building in Pearl Street, throw an overcoat on a pile of tubes, lie down and sleep for a few hours, rising to resume work with the first gang. There was a small bedroom on the third floor of the station available for him, but going to bed meant delay and consumed time. It is no wonder that such impatience, such an enthusiasm, drove the work forward at a headlong pace. Edison says of this period, When we put down the tubes in the lower part of New York, in the streets, we kept a big stock of them in the cellar of the station at Pearl Street. As I was on all the time, I would take a nap of an hour or so in the daytime, any time, and I used to sleep on those tubes in the cellar. I had two Germans who were testing there, and both of them died of diphtheria, caught in the cellar, which was cold and damp. It never affected me. It is worth pausing just a moment to glance at this man taking a fitful rest on a pile of iron pipe in a dingy building. His name is on the tip of the world's tongue. Distinguished scientists from every part of Europe seek him eagerly. He has just been decorated and awarded high honors by the French government. He is the inventor of wonderful new apparatus and the exploiter of novel and successful arts. The magic of his achievements and the rumors of what is being done have caused a wild drop in gas securities and a sensational rise in his own electric light stock from $100 to $3,500 a share. Yet these things do not at all affect his slumber or his democratic simplicity, for in that, as in everything else, he is attending strictly to business, doing the thing that is next to him. Part of the Russian feverish haste was due to the approach of frost, which, as usual in New York, suspended operations in the earth. But the laying of conductors was resumed promptly in the spring of 1882, and meantime other work had been advanced. During the fall and winter months, two more jumbo dynamos were built and sent to London, after which the construction of six for New York was swiftly taken in hand. In the month of May, three of these machines, each with a capacity of 1,200 incandescent lamps, were delivered at Pearl Street and assembled on the second floor. On July 5th, owing to the better opportunity for ceaseless toil given by a public holiday, the construction of the operative part of the station was so far completed that the first of the dynamos was operated under steam, so that three days later, the satisfactory experiment was made of throwing the flood of electrical energy into a bank of 1,000 lamps on an upper floor. Other tests followed in due course. All was excitement. The field regulating apparatus and the electrical pressure indicator, first of its kind, were also tested and in turn found satisfactory. Another vital test was made at this time, namely of the strength of the iron structure itself on which the plant was erected. This was done by two structural experts, and not till he got their report as to ample factors of safety was Edison reassured as to this detail. A remark of Edison, familiar to all who have worked with him, when it is reported to him that something new goes all right and is satisfactory from all points of view, is, Well, boys, now let's find the bugs and the hunt for the phylloxera begins with fiendish, remorseless zest. Before starting the plant for regular commercial service, he began personally a series of practical experiments and tests to ascertain in advance what difficulties would actually arise in practice, so that he could provide remedies or preventatives. He had several cots placed in the adjoining building, and he and a few of his most strenuous assistants worked day and night, leaving the work only for hurried meals and a snatch of sleep. These crucial tests, aiming virtually to break the plant down if possible within predetermined conditions, lasted several weeks, and, while most valuable in the information they afforded, did not hinder anything. For meantime, customers' premises throughout the district were being wired and supplied with lamps and meters. On Monday, September 4th, 1882, at 3 o'clock p.m., Edison realized the consummation of his broad and original scheme. The Pearl Street station was officially started by admitting steam to the engine of one of the jumbos. 
Current was generated, turned into the network of underground conductors, and was transformed into light by the incandescent lamps that had thus far been installed. This date and event may properly be regarded as historical, for they mark the practical beginning of a new art, which in the intervening years has grown prodigiously and is still increasing by leaps and bounds. Everything worked satisfactorily in the main. There were a few mechanical and engineering annoyances that might naturally be expected to arise in a new and unprecedented enterprise, but nothing of sufficient moment to interfere with the steady and continuous supply of current to customers at all hours of the day and night. Indeed, once started, this station was operated uninterruptedly for eight years, with only insignificant stoppage. It will have been noted by the reader that there was nothing to indicate rashness in starting up the station, as only one dynamo was put in operation. Within a short time, however, it was deemed desirable to supply the underground network with more current, as many additional customers had been connected, and the demand for the new light was increasing very rapidly. Although Edison had successfully operated several dynamos in multiple arc two years before, i.e. all feeding current together into the same circuits, there was not, at this early period of experience, any absolute certainty as to what particular results might occur upon the throwing of the current from two or more such massive dynamos into a great distributing system. The sequel showed the value of Edison's cautious method in starting the station by operating only a single unit at first. He decided that it would be wise to make the trial operation of a second jumbo on a Sunday, when business houses were closed in the district, thus obviating any danger of false impressions in the public mind, in the event of any extraordinary manifestations. The circumstances attending the adding of a second dynamo are thus humorously described by Edison. My heart was in my mouth at first, but everything worked all right. Then we started another engine and threw them in parallel. Of all the circuses since Adam was born, we had the worst then. One engine would stop, and the other would run up to about a thousand revolutions, and then they would seesaw. The trouble was with the governors. When the circus commenced, the gang that was standing around ran out precipitately, and I guess some of them kept running for a block or two. I grabbed the throttle of one engine, and E. H. Johnson, who was the only one present to keep his wits, caught hold of the other, and we shut them off. One of the gang, that ran, but in this case only to the end of the room, afterwards said, At the time it was a terrifying experience, as I didn't know what was going to happen. The engines and dynamos made a horrible racket, from loud and deep groans to a hideous shriek, and the place seemed to be filled with sparks and flames of all colors. It was as if the gates of the infernal regions had been suddenly opened. This trouble was at once attacked by Edison in his characteristic and strenuous way. The above experiment took place between three and four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, and within a few hours he had gathered his superintendent and men of the machine works and had them at work on a shafting device that he thought would remedy the trouble. He says, Of course I discovered that what had happened was that one set was running the other as a motor. I then put up a long shaft, connecting all the governors together, and thought this would certainly cure the trouble. But it didn't. The torsion of the shaft was so great that one governor still managed to get ahead of the others. Well, it was a serious state of things, and I worried over it a lot. Finally, I went down to Girk Street and got a piece of shafting in a tube in which it fitted. I twisted the shafting one way and the tube the other as far as I could, and pinned them together. In this way, by straining the whole outfit up to its elastic limit in opposite directions, the torsion was practically eliminated, and after that the governors ran together all right. Edison realized, however, that in commercial practice this was only a temporary expedient, and that a satisfactory permanence of results could only be attained with more perfect engines that could be depended upon for close and simple regulation. 
The engines that were made part of the first three jumbos placed in the station were the very best that could be attained at the time, and even then had been specially designed and built for the purpose. Once more, quoting Edison on this subject, about that time, when he was trying to run several dynamos in parallel in the Pearl Street station, I got hold of Gardner C. Sims, and he undertook to build an engine to run at 350 revolutions and give 175 horsepower. He went back to Providence and set to work, and brought the engine back with him to the shop. It worked only a few minutes when it busted. That man sat around that shop and slept in it for three weeks until he got his engine right and made it work the way he wanted to. When he reached this period, I gave orders for the engine works to run night and day until we got enough engines, and when all was ready, we started the engines. Then everything worked all right. One of these engines that Sims built ran 24 hours a day, 365 days in the year, for over a year before it stopped. 12. Footnote 12. We quote the following interesting notes of Mr. Charles L. Clark on the question of seesawing, or hunting, as it was afterward termed. In the Halburn Viaduct Station, the difficulty of hunting was not experienced. At the time, the jumbos were first operated in multiple arc, April 8, 1882. One machine was driven by a Porter Allen engine, and the other by an Armington and Sims engine, and both machines were on a solid foundation. At the station in Milan, Italy, the first jumbos operated in multiple arc were driven by Porter Allen engines, and dash pots were applied to the governors. These machines were also upon a solid foundation, and no trouble was experienced. At the Pearl Street station, however, the machines were supported upon long iron floor beams, and at the high speed of 350 revolutions per minute, considerable vertical vibration was given to the engines. And the writer is inclined to the opinion that this vibration, acting in the same direction as the action of gravitation, which was one of the two controlling forces in the operation of the Porter Allen governor, was the primary cause of the hunting. In the Armington and Sims engine, the controlling forces in the operation of the governor were the centrifugal force of revolving weights and the opposing force of compressed springs, and neither the action of the gravitation nor the vertical vibrations of the engine could have any sensible effect upon the governor. The Pearl Street Station, as this first large plant was called, made rapid and continuous growth in its output of electric current. It started, as we have said, on September 4, 1882, supplying about 400 lights to a comparatively small number of customers. Among those first supplied was the banking firm of Drexel, Morgan & Company, corner of Broad and Wall Streets, at the outermost limits of the system. Before the end of December of the same year, the light had so grown in favor that it was being supplied to over 240 customers whose buildings were wired for over 5,000 lamps. By this time, three more jumbos had been added to the plant. The output from this time forward increased steadily up to the spring of 1884, when the demands of the station necessitated the installation of two additional jumbos in the adjoining building, which with the Venus improvements that had been made in the meantime, gave the station a capacity of over 11,000 lamps actually in service at any one time. During the first three months of operating the Pearl Street station, light was supplied to customers without charge. Edison had perfect confidence in his meters and also in the ultimate judgment of the public as to the superiority of the incandescent electric light as against other illuminants. He realized, however, that in the beginning of the operation of an entirely novel plant, there was ample opportunity for unexpected contingencies, although the greatest care had been exercised to make everything as perfect as possible. Mechanical defects or other unforeseen troubles in any part of the plant or underground system might arise and cause temporary stoppages of operation, thus giving grounds for uncertainty which would create a feeling of public distrust in the permanence of the supply of light. 
As to the kind of mishap that was wont to occur, Edison tells the following story. One afternoon, after our Pearl Street station started, a policeman rushed in and told us to send an electrician at once up to the corner of Ann and Nassau Streets. Some trouble. Another man and I went up. We found an immense crowd of men and boys there, and in the adjoining streets. A perfect jam. There was a leak in one of our junction boxes, and on account of the cellars extending under the street, the topsoil had become insulated. Hence, by means of this leak, powerful currents were passing through this thin layer of moist earth. When a horse went to pass over it, he would get a very severe shock. When I arrived, I saw coming along the street a ragman with a dilapidated old horse, and one of the boys told him to go over to the other side of the road, which was the place where the current leaked. When the ragman heard this, he took that side at once. The moment that horse struck the electrified soil, he stood straight up in the air, and then reared again. And the crowd yelled, the policeman yelled, and the horse started to run away. This continued until the crowd got so serious that the policeman had to clear it out, and we were notified to cut the current off. We got a gang of men, cut the current off for several junction boxes, and fixed the leak. One man, who had seen it, came to me the next day and wanted me to put in apparatus for him at a place where they sold horses. He said he could make a fortune with it because he could get old nags in there and make them act like thoroughbreds. So well had the work been planned and executed, however, that nothing happened to hinder the continuous working of the station and the supply of light to customers. Hence it was decided in December 1882 to begin charging a price for the service and, accordingly, Edison electrolytic meters were installed on the premises of each customer then connected. The first bill for lighting, based upon the reading of one of these meters, amounted to $50.40 and was collected on January 18, 1883, from the Ansonia Brass and Copper Company, 17 and 19 Cliff Street. Generally speaking, customers found that their bills compared fairly with gas bills for corresponding months where the same amount of light was used, and they paid promptly and cheerfully with emphatic encomiums of the new light. During November 1883, a little over one year after the station was started, bills for lighting amounting to over $9,000 were collected. An interesting story of meter experience in the first few months of operation of the Pearl Street Station is told by one of the boys who was then in position to know the facts. Mr. J. P. Morgan, whose firm was one of the first customers, expressed to Mr. Edison some doubt as to the accuracy of the meter. The latter, firmly convinced of its correctness, suggested a strict test by having some cards printed and hung on each fixture at Mr. Morgan's place. On these cards was to be noted the number of lamps in the fixture, and the time they were turned on and off each day for a month. At the end of that time, the lamp hours were to be added together by one of the clerks, and figured on a basis of a definite amount per lamp hour, and compared with the bill that would be rendered by the station for the corresponding period. The results of the first month's test showed an apparent overcharge by the Edison Company. Mr. Morgan was exultant, while Mr. Edison was still confident and suggested a continuation of the test. Another month's trial showed somewhat similar results. Mr. Edison was a little disturbed, but insisted that there was a mistake somewhere. He went down to Drexel Morgan and Company's office to investigate, and, after looking around, asked when the office was cleaned out. He was told it was done at night by the janitor, who was sent for, and upon being interrogated as to what light he used, said that he turned on a central fixture containing about ten lights. It came out that he had made no record of the time these lights were in use. He was told to do so in the future, and another month's test was made. On comparison with the company's bill, rendered on the meter reading, the meter came within a few cents of the amount computed from the card records, and Mr. Morgan was completely satisfied of the accuracy of the meter. It is a strange but not extraordinary commentary on the perversity of human nature and the lack of correct observation 
To note that even after the Pearl Street Station had been in actual operation 24 hours a day for nearly three months, there should still remain an attitude of can't be done. That such a skepticism still obtained is evidenced by the public prints of the period. Edison's electric light system and his broad claims were freely discussed and animadverted upon at the very time he was demonstrating their successful application. To show some of the feeling at the time, we reproduce the following letter, which appeared November 29, 1882. To the Editor of the Sun Sir, in reading the discussions relative to the Pearl Street Station of the Edison Light, I have noted that while it is claimed that there is scarcely any loss from leakage of current, nothing is said about the loss due to the resistance of the long circuits. I am informed that this is the secret of the failure to produce, with the power and position, a sufficient amount of current to run all the lamps that have been put up, and that while six and even seven lights to the horsepower may be produced from an isolated plant, the resistance of the long underground wires reduces this result in the above case to less than three lights to the horsepower, thus making the cost of production greatly in excess of gas. Can the Edison Company explain this? Investigator. This was one of many anonymous letters that had been written to the newspapers on the subject, and the following reply by the Edison Company was printed December 3, 1882. To the Editor of the Sun. Sir, Investigator in Wednesday's Sun says that the Edison Company is troubled at its Pearl Street station, with a loss of current due to the resistance of the long circuits. Also that, whereas Edison gets six or even seven lights to the horsepower in isolated plants, the resistance of the long underground wires reduces that result in the Pearl Street station to less than three lights to the horsepower. Both of these statements are false. As regards loss due to resistance, there is a well-known law for determining it, based on Ohm's law. By use of that law, we knew in advance, that is to say, when the original plans for the station were drawn, just what this loss would be, precisely the same as a mechanical engineer when constructing a mill with long lines of shafting can forecast the loss of power due to friction. The practical result in the Pearl Street station has fully demonstrated the correctness of our estimate thus made in advance. As regards our getting only three lights per horsepower, our station has now been running three months without stopping a moment, day or night, and we invariably get over six lamps per horsepower, or substantially the same as we do in our isolated plants. We are now lighting 193 buildings, wired for 4,400 lamps, of which about two-thirds are in constant use, and we are adding additional houses and lamps daily. These figures can be verified at the office of the Board of Underwriters, where certificates with full details permitting the use of our light are filed by their own inspector. To light these lamps, we run from one to three dynamos, according to the lamps in use at any given time, and we shall start additional dynamos as fast as we can connect more buildings. Neither as regards the loss due to resistance, nor as regards the number of lamps per horsepower, is there the slightest trouble or disappointment on the part of our company, and your correspondent is entirely in error, is assuming that there is. Let me suggest that if investigator really wishes to investigate, and is competent and willing to learn the exact facts, he can do so at this office, where there is no mystery of concealment, but, on the contrary, a strong desire to communicate facts to intelligent inquirers, such a method of investigating must certainly be more satisfactory to one honestly seeking knowledge than that of first assuming an error as the basis of a question and then demanding an explanation. Yours very truly, S. B. Eaton, President. Viewed from the standpoint of over 27 years later, the wisdom and necessity of answering anonymous newspaper letters of this kind might be deemed questionable, but it must be remembered that, although the Pearl Street station was working successfully, 
and Edison's comprehensive plans were abundantly vindicated, the enterprise was absolutely new and only just stepping on the very threshold of commercial exploitation. To enter in and possess the land required the confidence of capital and the general public. Hence it was necessary to maintain a constant vigilance to defeat the insidious attacks of carping critics and others who would attempt to injure the Edison system by misleading statements. It will be interesting to the modern electrician to note that when this pioneer station was started, and in fact for some little time afterward, that there was not a single electrical instrument in the whole station, not a voltmeter or an ammeter, nor was there a central switchboard. Each dynamo had its own individual control switch. The feeder connections were all at the front of the building, and the general voltage control apparatus was on the floor above. An automatic pressure indicator had been devised and put in connection with the main circuits. It consisted, generally speaking, of an electromagnet with relays connecting with a red and blue lamp. When the electrical pressure was normal, neither lamp was lighted. But if the electromotive force rose above a predetermined amount by one or two volts, the red lamp lighted up, and the attendant at the hand wheel of the field regulator inserted resistance in the field circuit, whereas if the blue lamp lighted, resistance was cut out until the pressure was raised to normal. Later on this primitive indicator was supplanted by the Bradley Bridge, a crude form of the Howell pressure indicators, which were subsequently used for many years in the Edison stations. Much could be added to make a complete pictorial description of the historic Pearl Street Station, but it is not within the scope of this narrative to enter into diffuse technical details interesting as they may be to many persons. We cannot close this chapter, however, without mention of the fate of the Pearl Street Station, which continued in successful commercial operation until January 2, 1890, when it was partially destroyed by fire. All the jumbos were ruined, excepting number 9, which is still a venerated relic, in the possession of the New York Edison Company. Luckily, the boilers were unharmed. Bell-driven generators and engines were speedily installed, and the station was again in operation in a few days. The uninjured Jumbo Number no. 9 again continued to perform its duty. But, in the words of Mr. Charles L. Clark, the glory of the old Pearl Street station, unique in bearing the impress of Mr. Edison's personality, and, as it were, constructed with his own hands, disappeared in the flame and smoke of that Thursday morning fire. The few days' interruption of the service was the only serious one that has taken place in the history of the New York Edison Company from September 4, 1882, to the present date. The Pearl Street Station was operated for some time subsequent to the fire, but increasing demands in the meantime having led to the construction of other stations, the mains of the first district were soon afterward connected to another plant, the Pearl Street Station was dismantled, and the building was sold in 1895. The prophetic insight into the magnitude of central station lighting that Edison had when he was still experimenting on the incandescent lamp over 30 years ago is a little less than astounding, when it is so amply verified in the operations of the New York Edison Company, the successor of the Edison Electric Illuminating Company of New York, and many others. At the end of 1909, the New York Edison Company alone was operating 28 stations and substations, having a total capacity of 159,500 kilowatts. Connected with its lines were approximately 85,000 customers, wired for 3,813,899 incandescent lamps, and nearly 225,000 horsepower through industrial electric motors connected with the underground service. A large quantity of electrical energy is also supplied for heating and cooking, charging automobiles, chemical and plating work, and various other uses. End of chapter 16 Reading by Anthony Wilson
Chapter 17 of Edison, His Life and Inventions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mitch Leppard Edison, His Life and Inventions By Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 17 we have now seen the Edison lighting system given a complete convincing demonstration in Paris, London, and New York, and have noted steps taken for its introduction elsewhere on both sides of the Atlantic. The Paris plant, like that at the Crystal Palace, was a temporary exhibit. The London plant was less temporary, but not permanent, supplying, before it was torn out, no fewer than 3,000 lamps in hotels, churches, stores, and dwellings in the vicinity of Holborn Viaduct. There, Messrs. Johnson and Hammer put into practice many of the ideas now standard in the art, and secured much useful data for the work in New York, of which the story has just been told. As a matter of fact, the first Edison commercial station to be operated in this country was that at Appleton, Wisconsin. But its only serious claim to notice is that it was the initial one of the system driven by water power. It went into service August 15, 1882, about three weeks before the Pearl Street Station. It consisted of one small dynamo of a capacity of 280 lights of 10 CP each, and was housed in an unpretentious wooden shed. The dynamo electric machine, though small, was robust, for under all the varying speeds of water power and the vicissitudes of the plant to which it belonged, it continued in active use until 1899, 17 years. Edison was from the first deeply impressed with the possibilities of water power, and as this incident shows, was prompt to see such a very early opportunity but his attention was in reality concentrated closely on the supply of great centers of population, a task which he then felt might well occupy his lifetime. And except in regard to furnishing isolated plants, he did not pursue further the development of hydroelectric stations. That was left to others, and to the application of the alternating current, which has enabled engineers to harness remote powers and within thoroughly economical limits, transmit thousands of horsepower as much as 200 miles at pressures of 80,000 and 100,000 volts. Owing to his insistence on low pressure, direct current for use in densely populated districts as the only safe and truly universal, profitable way of delivering electrical energy to the consumers Edison has been frequently spoken of as an opponent of the alternating current. This does him an injustice. At the time, a measure was before the Virginia legislature in 1890 to limit the permissible pressures of current so as to render it safe. He said, quote, You want to allow high pressure wherever the conditions are such that by no possible accident could that pressure get into the houses of the consumers, you want to give them all the latitude you can, end quote. In explaining this, he added, quote, Suppose you want to take the falls down at Richmond and want to put up a water power. Why, if we erect a station at the falls, it is a great economy to get it up to the city. By digging a cheap trench, and putting in an insulated cable, and connecting such station with the central part of Richmond, having the end of the cable come up into the station from the earth, and there connected with motors, the power of the falls would be transmitted to these motors. If now the motors were made to run dynamos conveying low-pressure currents to the public, there is no possible way whereby this high-pressure current could get to the public. End quote. In other words, Edison made the sharp, fundamental distinction between high-pressure alternating current for transmission 
and low pressure direct current for distribution. And this is exactly the practice that has been adopted in all the great cities of the country today. There seems no good reason for believing that it will change. It might perhaps have been altogether better for Edison, from the financial standpoint, if he had not identified himself so completely with one kind of current. But that made no difference to him, as it was a matter of conviction. And Edison's convictions are granitic. Moreover, this controversy over the two currents, alternating and direct, which has become historical in the field of electricity, and is something like the, quote, irrepressible conflict, end quote, we heard of years ago in national affairs, illustrates another aspect of Edison's character. Broad as the prairies and free in thought as the winds that swept them, he is idiosyncratically opposed to loose and wasteful methods, to plans of empire that neglect the poor at the gate. Everything he has done has been aimed at the conservation of energy, the contraction of space, the intensification of culture. Burbank and his tribe represent in the vegetable world Edison in the mechanical. Not only has he developed distinctly new species, but he has elucidated the intensive art of getting $1,200 out of an electrical acre instead of 12 a manured market garden inside London, and a ten-bushel exhausted wheat farm outside Lawrence, Kansas, being the antipodes of productivity, yet very far short of exemplifying the difference of electrical yield between an acre of territory in Edison's, quote, first New York district, end quote, and an acre in some small town. Edison's lighting work furnished an excellent basis, in fact, the only one, for the development of the alternating current now so generally employed in central station work in America and in the McGraw Electrical Directory of April 1909. No fewer than 4,164 stations out of 5,780 reported its use. When the alternating current was introduced for practical purposes, it was not needed for arc lighting, the circuit for which from a single dynamo would often be 20 or 30 miles in length, its current having a pressure of not less than five or 6,000 volts. For some years it was not found feasible to operate motors on alternating current circuits, and that reason was often urged against it seriously. It could not be used for electroplating or deposition nor could it charge storage batteries, all of which are easily within the ability of the direct current. But when it came to be a question of lighting a scattered suburb, a group of dwellings on the outskirts, a remote country residence, or a farmhouse, the alternating current, in all elements, save its danger, was and is ideal. Its thin wires can be carried cheaply over vast areas. And at each local point of consumption, the transformer of size, exactly proportioned to its local task, takes the high voltage transmission current and lowers its potential at a ratio of 20 or 40 to 1 for use in distribution and consumption circuits. This evolution has been quite distinct with its own inventors like Goulard and Gibbs and Stanley but came subsequent to the work of supplying small, dense areas of population, the art thus growing from within, and using each new gain as a means for further achievement. Nor was the effect of such great advances as those made by Edison limited to the electrical field. Every department of mechanics was stimulated and benefited to an extraordinary degree. Copper for the circuits was more highly refined than ever before to secure the best conductivity, and purity was insisted on in every kind of insulation. Edison was intolerant of sham and shoddy, and nothing would satisfy him that could not stand cross-examination by microscope, test tube, and galvanometer. It was perhaps the steam engine, on which the deepest imprint for good was made, 
referred to already in the remarks of Mr. F. J. Sprague in the preceding chapter, but best illustrated in the perfection of the modern high-speed engine of the Armington and Sims type. Unless he could secure an engine of smoother running and more exactly governed and regulated than those available for his dynamo and lamp, Edison realized that he would find it almost impossible to give a steady light. He did not want his customers to count the heartbeats of the engine in the flicker of the lamp. Not a single engine was even within gunshot of the standard thus set up. But the emergency called forth its man in Gardner C. Sims, a talented draftsman and designer who had been engaged in locomotive construction and in the engineering department of the United States Navy. He may be quoted as to what happened. Quote, the deep interest, financial and moral, and friendly backing I received from Mr. Edison, together with valuable suggestions, enabled me to bring out the engine, as I was quite alone in the world, poor. I had found a friend who knew what he wanted and explained it clearly. Mr. Edison was a leader far ahead of the time. He compelled the design of the successful engine. End quote. Quote, Our first engine compelled the inventing and making of a suitable engine indicator to indicate it, the Tabor. He obtained the desired speed and load with a friction brake, also regulator of speed, but waited for an indicator to verify it. Then again, there was no known way to lubricate an engine for continuous running. And Mr. Edison informed me that as a marine engine started before the ship left New York and continued running until it reached its home port, so an engine for his purposes must produce light at all times. That was a poser for me, for a five hours run was about all that had been required up to that time. Quote, a day or two later, Mr. Edison inquired, quote, How far is it from here to Lawrence? It is a long walk, isn't it? End quote. Quote, yes, rather, end quote, he said. Quote, of course you'll understand I meant without oil, end quote. To say I was deeply perplexed does not express my feelings. We were at the machine works, Gork Street. I started for the oil room when, about entering, I saw a small funnel lying on the floor. It had been stepped on and flattened. I took it up and it had solved the engine oiling problem, and my walk to Lawrence, like a tramp actor's, was off. The eccentric strap had a round glass oil cup with a brass base that screwed into the strap. I took it off and, making a sketch, went to Dave Cunningham, having the funnel in my hand to illustrate what I wanted made. I requested him to make a sheet brass oil cup and solder it to the base I had. He did so. I then had a standard made to hold another oil cup so as to see and regulate the drop feed. On this combination, I obtained a patent, which is now universally used. End quote. It is needless to say that in due course the engine builders of the United States developed a variety of excellent prime movers for electric light and power plants, and were grateful to the art from which such a stimulus came to their industry. But for many years one never saw an Edison installation without expecting to find one or more Armington and Sims high-speed engines part of it. Though the type had gone out of existence, like so many other things that are useful in their day and generation, it was once a very vital part of the art, and one more illustration of that intimate manner in which the advances in different fields of progress interact and cooperate. Edison had installed his historic first great central station system in New York on the multiple arc system covered by his feeder and main invention which resulted in a notable saving in the cost of conductors as against a straight two-wire system throughout of the tree kind. He soon foresaw that still greater economy would be necessary for commercial success, not alone for the larger territory opening, 
but for the compact district of large cities. Being firmly convinced that there was a way out, he pushed aside a mass of other work and settled down to this problem, with the result that on November 20th, 1882, only two months after current had been set out from Pearl Street, he executed an application for a patent covering what is now known as the three-wire system. It has been universally recognized as one of the most valuable inventions in the history of the lighting art. See footnote 13. Its use resulted in a saving of over 60% of copper in conductors figured on the most favorable basis previously known, inclusive of those calculated under his own feeder and main system. Such economy of outlay being affected in one of the heaviest items of expense in central station construction, it was now made possible to establish plants in towns where the large investment would otherwise have been quite prohibitive. The invention is in universal use today, alike for direct and for alternating current, and as well in the equipment of large buildings as in the distribution system of the most extensive central station networks. One cannot imagine the art without it. Footnote 13. For technical description and illustration of this invention, see the appendix. The strong position held by the Edison system, under the strenuous competition that was already springing up, was enormously improved by the introduction of the three-wire system, and it gave an immediate impetus to incandescent lighting. Desiring to put this new system into practical use promptly, and receiving applications for license from all over the country, Edison selected Brockton, Massachusetts, and Sunbury, Pennsylvania, as the two towns for the trial. Of these two, Brockton required the larger plant, but with the conductors placed underground. It was the first to complete its arrangements and close its contract. Mr. Henry Villard, it will be remembered, had married the daughter of Garrison, the famous abolitionist, and it was through his relationship with the Garrison family that Brockton came to have the honor of exemplifying, so soon, the principles of an entirely new art. Sunbury, however, was a much smaller installation, employed overhead conductors, and hence was the first to, quote, cross the tape, end quote. It was specially suited for a trial plant also. In the early days, when a yield of six or eight lamps to the horsepower was considered subject for congratulation, the town being situated in the coal region of Pennsylvania, good coal could then be obtained there at 75 cents a ton. The Sunbury generating plant consisted of an Armington and Sims engine driving two small Edison dynamos having a total capacity of about 400 lamps of 16 CP. The indicating instruments were of the crudest construction, consisting of two voltmeters connected by, quote, pressure wires, end quote, to the center of electrical distribution. One ammeter, for measuring the quantity of current output, was interpolated in the neutral bus, or third wire return circuit, to indicate when the load on the two machines was out of balance. The circuits were opened and closed by means of about half a dozen roughly made plug switches. See footnote 14. The, quote, bus bars, end quote, to receive the current from the dynamos were made of number 000 copper line wire, straightened out and fastened to the wooden sheathing of the station by iron staples without any presence to insulation. Commenting upon this, Mr. W. S. Andrews, detailed from the central staff, says, quote, The interior winding of the Sunbury station, including the running of two three-wire feeders the entire length of the building from back to front, the wiring up of the dynamos and switchboard and all the instruments, together with bus bars, etc., in fact, all labor material used in the electrical wiring installation, amounted to the sum of $90. I received a rather sharp letter from the New York office 
expostulating for this extravagant expenditure and stating that great economy must be observed in future, end quote. The street conductors were of the overhead pole line construction and were installed by the construction company that had been organized by Edison to build and equip central stations. A special type of street pole had been devised by him for the three-wire system. Footnote 14. By reason of the experience gained at this station through the use of these crude plug switches, Mr. Edison started a competition among a few of his assistants to devise something better. The result was the invention of a, quote, breakdown, end quote, switch by Mr. W. S. Andrews which was accepted by Mr. Edison as the best of the devices suggested and was developed and used for a great many years afterward. End of footnote 14. Supplementing the story of Mr. Andrews is that of Lieutenant F.J. Sprague, who also gives a curious glimpse of the glorious uncertainties and vicissitudes of that formative period. Mr. Sprague served on the jury at the Crystal Palace Exhibition with Darwin's son, the present Sir Horace, and after the tests were ended, left the Navy and entered Edison's service at the suggestion of Mr. E. H. Johnson, who was Edison's shrewd recruiting sergeant in those days. Quote, I resigned sooner than Johnson expected, and he had me on his hands. Meanwhile, he had called upon me to make a report of the three-wire system, known in England as the Hopkinson, both Dr. John Hopkinson and Mr. Edison being independent inventors at practically the same time. I reported on that, left London, and landed in New York on the day of the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883, May 24th, with a year's leave of absence. Quote, I reported at the office of Mr. Edison on Fifth Avenue and told him I had seen Johnson. He looked me over and said, quote, What did he promise you? I replied, quote, $2,500 a year, end quote. He did not say much, but looked it. About that time, Mr. Andrews and I came together. On July 2nd of that year, we were ordered to Sunbury and to be ready to start the station on the 4th. The electrical work had to be done in 48 hours. Having traveled around the world, I had cultivated an indifference to any special difficulties of that kind. Mr. Andrews and I worked in collaboration until the night of the third. I think he was perhaps more appreciative that I was of the discipline of the Edison Construction Department, and thought it would be well for us to wait until the morning of the fourth before we started up. I said we were sent over to get going, and insisted on starting up on the night of the third. We had an Armington and Sims engine with sight feed oiler. I had never seen one, and did not know how it worked, with the result that we soon burned up the Babbitt metal in the bearings, and spent a good part of the night getting them in order. The next day Mr. Edison, Mr. Insull, and the chief engineer of the construction department appeared on the scene, and wanted to know what happened. They found an engine somewhat loose in the bearings, and there followed remarks which would not look well in print. Andrews skipped from under. He obeyed orders. I did not. But the plant ran, and it was the first three-wire station in this country. Seen from yet another angle, the worries of this early work were not merely those of the men on the, quote, firing line, end quote. Mr. Insull, in speaking of this period, says, quote, When it was found difficult to push the central station business, owing to the lack of confidence in its financial success, Edison decided to go into the business of promoting and constructing central station plants, and he formed what was known as the Thomas A. Edison Construction Department, which he put me in charge of. The organization was crude, the steam engineering talent poor, and, owing to the impossibility of getting any considerable capital subscribed, the plants were put in as cheaply as possible. I believe that this construction department was unkindly named the Destruction Department. It served its purpose, never made any money, 
and I had the unpleasant task of presiding at its obsequies. On July 4th, the Sunbury plant was put into commercial operation by Edison, and he remained a week studying its conditions and watching for any unforeseen difficulty that might arise. Nothing happened, however, to interfere with the successful running of the station, and for twenty years thereafter the same two dynamos continued to furnish light in Sunbury. They were later used as reserve machines, and finally, with the engine, retired from service as part of the collection of Edisonia. But they remain in practically as good condition as when installed in 1883. Sunbury was also provided with the first electrochemical meters used in the United States outside New York City, so that it served also to accentuate electrical practice in a most vital respect, namely, the measurement of the electrical energy supplied to customers. At this time, and long after, all arc lighting was done on a flat-rate basis. The arc lamp installed outside a customer's premises or in a circuit for public street lighting burned so many hours nightly, so many nights in the month, and was paid for at that rate, subject to rebate for hours when the lamp might be out through accident. The early arc lamps were rated to require 9 to 10 amperes of current at 45 volts pressure each, receiving which they were estimated to give 2,000 CP, which was arrived at by adding together the light found at four different positions, so that in reality the actual light was about 500 CP. Few of these data were ever actually used, however, and it was all more or less a matter of guesswork, although the central station manager, aiming to give good service, would naturally see that the dynamos were so operated as to maintain as steadily as possible the normal potential and current. The same loose methods applied to the early attempts to use electric motors on arc lighting circuits, and contracts were made based on the size of the motor, the width of the connecting belt, or the amount of power the consumer thought he used, never on the measurement of the electrical energy furnished him. Here again Edison laid the foundation of standard practice. It is true that even down to the present time the flat rate is applied to a great deal of incandescent lighting, each lamp being charged for individually, according to its probable consumption during each month. This may answer perhaps in a small place where the manager can gauge pretty closely from actual observation what each customer does. But even then there are elements of risk and waste, and obviously in a large city such a method would soon be likely to result in financial disaster to the plant. Edison held that the electricity sold must be measured just like gas or water, and he proceeded to develop a meter. There was infinite skepticism around him on the subject, and while other inventors were also giving the subject their thought, the public took it for granted that anything so utterly intangible as electricity that could not be seen or weighed and only gave secondary evidence of itself at the exact point of use could not be brought to accurate registration. The general attitude of doubt was exemplified by the incident in Mr. J. P. Morgan's office noted in the last chapter. Edison, however, had satisfied himself that there were various ways of accomplishing the task, and had determined that the current should be measured on the premises of every consumer. His electrolytic meter was very successful, and was of widespread use in America and in Europe until the perfection of mechanical meters by Elihu Thompson and others brought that type into general acceptance. Hence, the Edison electrolytic meter is no longer used, despite its excellent qualities. Houston and Kennerly, in their Electricity in Everyday Life, sum the matter up as follows. Quote, the Edison chemical meter is capable of giving fair measurements of the amount of current passing, 
By reason, however, of dissatisfaction caused by the inability of customers to read the indications of the meter, it has in later years, to a great extent, been replaced by registering meters that can be read by the customer. The principle employed in the Edison electrolytic meter is that which exemplifies the power of electricity to decompose a chemical substance. In other words, it is a deposition bath, consisting of a glass cell, in which two plates of chemically pure zinc are dipped into a solution of zinc sulfate. When the lights or motors in the circuit are turned on, and a certain definite small portion of the current is diverted to flow through the meter from the positive plate to the negative plate, the latter increases in weight by receiving a deposit of metallic zinc. The positive plate, meantime, losing in weight by the metal thus carried away from it. This difference in weight is a very exact measure of the quantity of electricity or number of ampere hours that have, so to speak, passed through the cell, and hence of the whole consumption in the circuit. The amount thus due from the customer is ascertained by removing the cell, washing and drying the plates, and weighing them in a chemical balance. Associated with this simple form of apparatus were various ingenious details and refinements to secure regularity of operation, freedom from inaccuracy, and immunity from such tampering as would permit theft of current or damage, as the freezing of the zinc sulfate solution in cold weather would check its operation. Edison introduced, for example, into the meter an incandescent lamp and a thermostat so arranged that when the temperature fell to a certain point or rose above another point, it was cut in or out, and in this matter the meter would be kept from freezing. The standard Edison meter practice was to remove the cells once a month to the meter room of the Central Station Company for examination, another set being substituted. The meter was cheap to manufacture and install, and not at all liable to get out of order. In December 1888, Mr. W. J. Jenks read an interesting paper before the American Institute of Electrical Engineers on the six years of practical experience had up to that time with the meter, then more generally in use than any other. It appears from the paper that Twenty-three Edison stations were then equipped with 5,187 meters, which were relied upon for billing the monthly current consumption of 87,856 lamps and 350 motors of 1,000 horsepower total. This represented about 75% of the entire lamp capacity of the stations. There was an average cost per lamp for meter operation of 22 cents a year, and each meter took care of an average of 17 lamps. It is worthy of note, as to the promptness with which the Edison stations became paying properties, that four of the metered stations were earning upward of 15% of their capital stock, three others between 8 and 10%. 8 between 5 and 8 percent, the others, having been in operation too short a time to show definite results, although they also went quickly to a dividend basis. Reports made in the discussion at the meeting by engineers showed the simplicity and success of the meter. Mr. C. L. Edgar of the Boston Edison System stated that he had 800 of the meters in service, cared for by two men and three boys, the latter employed in collecting the meter cells, the total cost being perhaps $2,500 a year. Mr. J. W. Lieb wrote from Milan, Italy, that he had in use on the Edison system there 360 meters ranging from 350 ampere hours per month up to 30,000. In this connection, it should be mentioned that the Association of Edison Illuminating Companies in the same year adopted resolutions unanimously to the effect that the Edison meter was accurate, 
and that its use was not expensive for stations above 1,000 lights, and that the best financial results were invariably secured in a station selling current by meter. Before the same association, at its meeting in September 1898 at Salt St. Marie, Mr. C. S. Shepard read a paper on the meter practice of the New York Edison Company, giving data as to the large number of Edison meters in use and the transition to other types, of which today the company has several on its circuits. Quote, Until October 1896, the New York Edison Company metered its current in consumers' premises exclusively by the old-style chemical meters of which there were connected on that date 8,109. It was then determined to purchase no more. End quote. Mr. Shepard went on to state that the chemical meters were gradually displaced, and that on September 1, 1898, there were on the system 5,619 mechanical and 4,874 chemical. The meter continued in general service during 1899 and probably up to the close of the century. Mr. Andrews relates a rather humorous meter story of those early days. Quote, the meter man at Sunbury was a firm and enthusiastic believer in the correctness of the Edison meter, having personally verified its reading many times by actual comparison of lamp hours. One day, on making out a customer's bill, his confidence received a severe shock, for the meter reading showed a consumption calling for a charge of over $200, whereas he knew that the light actually used should not cost more than one quarter of that amount. He weighed and reweighed the meter plates and pursued every line of investigation imaginable, but all in vain. He felt he was up against it, and that perhaps another kind of a job would suit him better. Once again he went to the customer's meter to look around, when a small piece of thick wire on the floor caught his eye. The problem was solved. He suddenly remembered that after weighing the plates, he went and put them in the customer's meter. But the wire attached to one of the plates was too long to go into the meter, and he had cut it off. He picked up the piece of wire, took it to the station, weighed it carefully, and found that it accounted for about $150 worth of electricity, which was the amount of the difference. End quote. Edison himself, however, is the best repertory of stories when it comes to the difficulties of that early period, in connection with metering the current and charging for it. He may be quoted at length as follows, quote, When we started the station at Pearl Street in September 1882, we were not very commercial. We put many customers on, but did not make out many bills. We were more interested in the technical condition of the station than in the commercial part. We had meters in which there were two bottles of liquid. To prevent these electrolytes from freezing, we had in each meter a strip of metal. When it got very cold, the metal would contract and close the circuit and throw a lamp into circuit inside the meter. The heat from this lamp would prevent the liquid from freezing so that the meter could go on doing its duty. The first cold day after starting the station, People began to come in from their offices, especially down in Front Street and Water Street, saying the meter was on fire. We received numerous telephone messages about it. Some had poured water on it, and others said, Send a man right up to put it out. End quote. Quote. After the station had been running several months and was technically a success, we began to look after the financial part. We started to collect some bills, but we found that our books were kept badly, and that the person in charge, who was no businessman, had neglected that part of it. In fact, he did not know anything about the station anyway. So I got the directors to permit me to hire a man to run the station. This was Mr. Chinock, 
who was then superintendent of the Metropolitan Telephone Company of New York. I knew Chinock to be square and of good business ability, and induced him to leave his job. I made him a personal guarantee that if he would take hold of the station and put it on a commercial basis and pay 5% on $600,000, I would give him $10,000 out of my own pocket. He took hold, performed the feat, and I paid him the $10,000. I might remark in this connection that years afterward I applied to the Edison Electric Light Company asking them if they would not like to pay me this money, as it was spent when I was very hard up and made the company a success, and was the foundation of their present prosperity. They said they were sorry, that is, Wall Street sorry, and refused to pay it. This shows what a nice, genial, generous lot of people they have over in Wall Street. Quote, Chinook had a great deal of trouble getting the customers straightened out. I remember one man who had a saloon on Nassau Street. He had had its lights burning for two or three months. It was in June, and Chinook put in a bill for $20, July for $20, August about $28, September about $35, July for $20, August about $28, September, about $35. Of course, the nights were getting longer. October, about $40. November, about $45. Then the man called Chinook up. Quote, I want to see you about my electric bill. End quote. Chinook went up to see him. He said, quote, Are you the manager of this electric light plant? End quote. Chinook said, quote, I have the honor. End quote. Quote, well, he said, my bill has gone from $20 up to $28, $35, $45. I want you to understand, young fellow, that my limit is $60. End quote. Quote, After Chinook had had all this trouble due to the incompetency of the previous superintendent, a man came in and said to him, quote, Did Mr. Blank have charge of this station? End quote. Quote, Yes. End quote. Quote. Did he know anything about running a station like this? End quote. Chinook said, quote, Does he know anything about running a station like this? No, sir. He doesn't even suspect anything. End quote. Quote. One day Chinook came to me and said, quote, I have a new customer. End quote. I said, quote, what is it? End quote. He said, quote, I have a fellow who is going to take 250 lights. Quote, I said, quote, what for? End quote. Quote, he had a place down here in a top loft and has got 250 barrels of rot gut whiskey. He puts a light down in the barrel and lights it up and it ages the whiskey, end quote. I met Chinook several weeks after, and said, quote, How's that whiskey man getting along? End quote. Quote, It's all right. He's paying his bill. It fixes the whiskey, and takes the shutter right out of it, end quote. Somebody went and took out a patent on this idea later. Quote, In the second year we put the stock exchange on the circuits of the station, but were very fearful that there would be a combination of heavy demand and a dark day, and that there would be an overloaded station. We had an index like a steam gauge, called an ampere meter, to indicate the amount of current going out. I was up at 65th Fifth Avenue one afternoon. A sudden black cloud came up, and I telephoned to Chinook and asked him about the load. He said, quote, We are up to the muzzle and everything is running all right, end quote. By and by it became so thick that we could not see across the street. I telephoned again and felt something would happen, but fortunately it did not. I said to Chinook, quote, How is it now? End quote. Quote, everything is red hot, 
and the ampere meter has made 17 revolutions. End quote. In 1883, no such fittings as quote, fixture insulators end quote, were known. It was the common practice to twine the electric wires around the disused gas fixtures, fasten them with tape or string, and connect them to the lamp sockets screwed into attachments under the gas burners, elaborated later into what was known as the, quote, combination fixture, end quote. As a result, it was no uncommon thing to see bright sparks snapping between the chandelier and the lighting wires during a sharp thunderstorm. A startling manifestation of this kind happened at Sunbury when the vivid display drove nervous guests of the hotel out into the street, and the providential storm led Mr. Luther Steerringer to invent the, quote, insulating joint, end quote. This separated two lighting systems thoroughly, went into immediate service, and is universally used today. Returning to the more specific subject of pioneer plants of importance, that at Brockton must be considered for a moment, chiefly for the reason that the city was the first in the world to possess an Edison station distributing current through an underground three-wire network of conductors. The essentially modern, contemporaneous practice, standard 25 years later, it was proposed to employ pole line construction with overhead wires, and a party of Edison engineers drove about the town in an open barouche with a blueprint of the circuits and streets spread out on their knees to determine how much tree trimming would be necessary. When they came to some heavily shaded spots, the fine trees were marked, quote, T, end quote to indicate that the work in getting through them would be tough. Where the trees were sparse and the foliage was thin, the same cheerful band of vandals marked the spots, quote, E, end quote, to indicate that it would be easy to run the wires. In those days, public opinion was not so alive as now to the desirability of preserving shade trees and of enhancing the beauty of a city instead of destroying it. Brockton had a good deal of pride in its fine trees, and a strong sentiment was very soon aroused against the mutilation proposed so thoughtlessly. The investors in the enterprise were ready and anxious to meet the extra cost of putting the wires underground. Edison's own wishes were altogether for the use of the methods he had so carefully devised, and hence that bustling home of shoe manufacture was spared this infliction of more overhead wires. The station equipment at Brockton consisted at first of three dynamos, one of which was so arranged as to supply both sides of the system during light loads by a breakdown switch connection. This arrangement interfered with correct meter registration, as the meters on one side of the system registered backward during the hours in which the combination was employed. Hence, after supplying an all-night customer whose lamps were on one side of the circuit, the company might be found to owe him something substantial in the morning. Soon after the station went into operation, this ingenious plan was changed, and the third dynamo was replaced by two others. The Edison Construction Department took entire charge of the installation of the plant, and the formal opening was attended on October 1, 1883, by Mr. Edison, who then remained a week in ceaseless study and consultation over the conditions developed by this initial three-wire underground plant. Some idea of the confidence inspired by the fame of Edison at this period is shown by the fact that the first theater ever lighted from a central station by incandescent lamps was designed this year, and opened in 1884 at Brockton with an equipment of 300 lamps. The theater was never piped for gas. It was also from the Brockton Central Station that current was first supplied to a fire engine house, 
Another display of remarkably early belief in the trustworthiness of the service, under conditions where continuity of lighting was vital. The building was equipped in such a manner that the striking of the fire alarm would light every lamp in the house automatically and liberate the horses. It was at this central station that Lieutenant Sprague began his historic work on the electric motor, and here that another distinguished engineer and inventor, Mr. H. Ward Leonard, installed the meters and became meter man in order that he might study in every intimate detail the improvements and refinements necessary in that branch of the industry. The authors are indebted for these facts and some other data embodied in this book to Mr. W. J. Jenks, who, as manager of this plant here, made his debut in the Edison ranks. He had been connected with local telephone interests, but resigned to take active charge of this plant imbibing quickly the traditional Edison spirit, working hard all day and sleeping in the station at night on a cot brought there for that purpose. It was a time of uninterrupted watchfulness, the difficulty of obtaining engineers in those days to run the high-speed engines, 350 revolutions per minute, is well illustrated by an amusing incident in the very early history of the station. A locomotive engineer had been engaged, as it was supposed he would not be afraid of anything. One evening there came a sudden flash of fire and a sputtering, sizzling noise. There had been a short circuit on the copper mains in the station. The fireman hid behind the boiler, and the engineer jumped out the window. Mr. Sprague realized the trouble, quickly threw off the current, and stopped the engine. Mr. Jenks relates another humorous incident in connection with this plant. Quote, One night I heard a knock at the office door, and on opening it saw two well-dressed ladies, who asked if they might be shown through. I invited them in, taking them first to the boiler room, where I showed them the coal pile, explaining that this was used to generate steam in the boiler. We then went to the dynamo room where I pointed out the machines converting the steam power into electricity, appearing later in the form of light in the lamps. After that, they were shown the meters, by which the consumption of current was measured. They appeared to be interested, and I proceeded to enter upon a comparison of coal made into gas or burned under a boiler to be converted into electricity. The ladies thanked me effusively and brought their visit to a close. As they were about to go through the door, one of them turned to me and said, quote, We have enjoyed this visit very much, but there is one question we would like to ask. What is it that you make here? End quote. The Brockton station was for a long time a show plant of the Edison Company, and had many distinguished visitors, among them being Professor Elihu Thompson, who was present at the opening and Sir W. H. Priest of London. The engineering methods pursued formed the basis of similar institutions in Lawrence, Massachusetts in November 1883, in Fall River, Massachusetts in December 1883, and in Newburgh, New York the following spring. Another important plant of this period deserves special attention, as it was the pioneer in the lighting of large spaces by incandescent lamps. The installation of 5,000 lamps on the three-wire system was made to illuminate the buildings at the Louisville, Kentucky Exposition in 1883, and owing to the careful surveys, calculations, and preparations of H. M. Byersby and the late Luther Steeringer, was completed and in operation within six weeks after the placing of the order. The jury of awards in presenting four medals to the Edison Company, took occasion to pay a high compliment to the efficiency of the system. It has been thought by many that the magnificent success of this plant did more to stimulate the growth of the incandescent lighting business than any other event in the history of the Edison Company. It was literally the beginning of the electrical illumination of American expositions carried later to such splendid displays 
as those of the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, Buffalo in 1901, and St. Louis in 1904. Thus, the art was set going in the United States under many difficulties, but with every sign of coming triumph. Reference has already been made to the work abroad in Paris and London. The first permanent Edison station in Europe was that at Milan, Italy, for which the order was given as early as May 1882 by an enterprising syndicate. Less than a year later, March 3, 1883, the installation was ready and was put in operation. The theater Santa Radagonda, having been pulled down, and a new central station building erected in its place, probably the first edifice constructed in Europe for the specific purpose of incandescent lighting. Here, quote, jumbos, end quote, were installed from time to time, until at last there were no fewer than ten of them, and current was furnished to customers with a total of nearly 10,000 lamps connected to the mains. This pioneer system was operated continuously until February 9, 1900, or for a period of about 17 years, when the sturdy old machines, still in excellent condition, were put out of service, so that a larger plant could be installed to meet the demand. This new plant takes high-tension polyphase current from a water power 30 or 40 miles away at Paderno, on the River Ada, flowing from the Apennines, but delivers low-tension direct current for distribution to the regular Edison three-wire system throughout Milan. About the same time that Southern Europe was thus opened up to the new system, South America came into line, and the first Edison central station there was installed at Santiago, Chile, in the summer of 1883, under the supervision of Mr. W. N. Stewart. This was the result of the success obtained with small isolated plants, leading to the formation of an Edison company. It can be readily conceived that at such an extreme distance from the source of supply of apparatus, the plant was subject to many peculiar difficulties from the outset, of which Mr. Stewart speaks as follows, quote, I made an exhibition of the jumbo in the theater at Santiago, and on the first evening, when it was filled with the aristocracy of the city, I discovered to my horror that the binding wire around the armature was slowly stripping off and going to pieces. We had no means of boring out the field magnets, and we cut grooves in them. I think the machine is still running. 1907. The station went into operation soon after with an equipment of eight Edison K dynamos with certain conditions inimical to efficiency, but which had not hindered the splendid expansion of the local system. With those eight dynamos, we had four belts between each engine and the dynamo. The steam pressure was limited to 75 pounds per square inch. We had two wire underground feeders sent without any plans or specifications for their installation. The station had neither voltmeter nor ammeter. The current pressure was regulated by a galvanometer. We were using coal costing $12 a ton and were paid for our light in currency worth 50 cents on the dollar. The only thing I can be proud of in connection with the plant is the fact that I did not design it that once in a while we made out to pay its operating expenses, and that occasionally we could run it for three months without a total breakdown. End quote. It was not until 1885 that the first Edison station in Germany was established, but the art was still very young, and the plant represented pioneer lighting practices in the empire. The station at Berlin comprised five boilers, and six vertical steam engines driving by belts 12 Edison dynamos, each of about 55 horsepower capacity. A model of this station is preserved in the Deutsche Museum at Munich. In the Bulletin of the Berlin Electricity Works for May 1908, it is said with regard to the events that led up to the creation of the system 
as noted already at the Rathno celebration. Quote, the year 1881 was a milestone in the history of the Alemannia Elektricitätsgesellschaft. The International Electrical Exposition at Paris was intended to place before the eyes of the civilized world the achievements of the century. Among the exhibits of that exposition was the Edison system of incandescent lighting. It became the basis of modern heavy current techniques. The last phrase is italicized as being a happy and authoritative description as well as a tribute. This chapter would not be complete if it failed to include some reference to a few of the early isolated plants of a historic character. Note has already been made of the first Edison plants afloat on the Jeannette and Columbia, and the first commercial plant in the New York lithographic establishment. The first mill plant was placed in the woolen factory of James Harrison at Newburgh, New York, about September 15, 1881. A year later, Mr. Harrison wrote with some pride, quote, I believe my mill was the first lighted with your electric light, and therefore may be called number one. Besides being job number one, it is a number one job, and a number one light, being better and cheaper than gas and absolutely safe as to fire, end quote. The first steam yacht, lighted by incandescent lamps, was James Gordon Bennett's Nemuna, equipped early in 1882 with a plant for 120 lamps of eight candle power, which remained in use there many years afterward. The first Edison plant in a hotel was started in October 1881 at the Blue Mountain House in the Adirondacks and consisted of two Z dynamos with a complement of eight and sixteen candle lamps. The hotel is situated at an elevation of 3,500 feet above the sea, and was at that time 40 miles from the railroad. The machinery was taken up in pieces on the backs of mules from the foot of the mountain. The boilers were fired by wood, as the economical transportation of coal was a physical impossibility. For a six-hour run of the plant, one quarter of a cord of wood was required, at a cost of 25 cents per cord. The first theater in the United States to be lighted by an Edison isolated plant was the Bijou Theater, Boston. The installation of boilers, engines, dynamos, wiring, switches, fixtures, three stage regulators, and 650 lamps was completed in 11 days after receipt of the order and the plant was successfully operated at the opening of the theater on December 12, 1882. The first plant to be placed on the United States steamship was the one consisting of an Edison Z Dynamo and 128 candle lamps installed on the Fish Commission steamer Albatross in 1883. The most interesting feature of this installation was the employment of special deep-sea lamps supplied with current through a cable 940 feet in length for the purpose of alluring fish. By means of the brilliancy of the lamps, marine animals in the lower depths were attracted and then easily ensnared. End of chapter 17. Recording by Mitch Leppard, Atlanta. HTTP colon Double forward slash Chapter eighteen of Edison His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heidi Preuss. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 18 The Electric Railway. 
Edison had no sooner designed his dynamo in 1879 than he adopted the same form of machine for use as a motor. The two are shown in the Scientific American of October 18, 1879, and are alike, except that the dynamo is vertical and the motor lies in a horizontal position, the article remarking. Its construction differs but slightly from the electric generator. This was but an evidence of his early appreciation of the importance of electricity as a motive power. But it will probably surprise many people to know that he was the inventor of an electric motor before he perfected his incandescent lamp. His interest in the subject went back to his connection with General Lefferts in the first days of the revolution of the stock ticker. While Edison was carrying on his shop at Newark, New Jersey, there was considerable excitement in electrical circles over the pain motor in regard to the alleged performance of which Governor Cornell of New York and other wealthy capitalists were quite enthusiastic. Payne had a shop in Newark, and in one small room was the motor, weighing perhaps six hundred pounds. It was of circular form, encased in iron, with the ends of several small magnets sticking through the floor. A pulley and belt, connected to a circular saw, larger than the motor, permitted large logs of oak timber to be sawed with ease with the use of two small cells of battery. Edison's friend, General Lefferts, had become excited and was determined to invest a large sum of money in the motor company. But knowing Edison's intimate familiarity with all electrical subjects, he was wise enough to ask his young expert to go and see the motor with him. At an appointed hour, Edison went to the office of the motor company and found there the venerable Professor Morse, Governor Cornell, General Lefferts, and many others who had been invited to witness a performance of the motor. They all proceeded to the room where the motor was at work. Payne put a wire in the binding post of the battery. The motor started, and an assistant began sawing a heavy oak log. It worked beautiful, and so great was the power developed, apparently from the small battery, that Morse exclaimed, I am thankful I have lived to see this day. But Edison kept a close watch on the motor. The results were so foreign to his experience that he knew there was a trick in it. He soon discovered it. While holding his hand on the frame of the motor, he noticed a tremble coincident with the exhaust of an engine across the alleyway and he knew then that the power came from the engine by a belt under the floor, shifted on and off by a magnet, the other magnet being a blind. He whispered to the general to put his hand on the frame of the motor, watch the exhaust, and note the coincident tremor. The general did so, and in about fifteen seconds he said, Well, Edison, I must go now. This thing is a fraud. And thus he saved his money although others not so shrewdly advised were easily persuaded to invest by such a demonstration. A few years later, in 1878, Edison went to Wyoming with a group of astronomers to test his tazimeter during an eclipse of the sun, and saw the land white to harvest. He noticed the long hauls to market or elevator that the farmers had to make with their loads of grain at great expense, and conceived the idea that as ordinary steam railroad service was too costly, light electric railways might be constructed that could be operated automatically over simple tracks, the propelling motor being controlled at various points. Cheap to build and cheap to maintain, such roads would be a great boon to the newer farming regions of the West, where the highways were still of the crudest character, and where transportation was the gravest difficulty with which the settlers had to contend. The plan seems to have haunted him, and he no sooner worked out a generator and motor that, owing to their low internal resistance, could be operated efficiently, 
Then he turned his hand to the practical trial of such a railroad, applicable to both the haulage of freight and the transportation of passengers. Early in 1880, when the tremendous rush of work involved in the invention of the incandescent lamp intermitted a little, he began the construction of a stretch of track close to the Menlo Park Laboratory, and at the same time built an electric locomotive to operate over it. This is a fitting stage at which to review briefly what had been done in electric traction up to that date. There was absolutely no art, but there had been a number of sporadic and very interesting experiments made. The honor of the first attempt of any kind appears to rest with this country, and with Thomas Davenport, a self-trained blacksmith of Brandon, Vermont, who made a small model of a circular electric railway and cars in 1834, and exhibited it in the following year in Springfield, Boston, and other cities. Of course, he depended upon battery for current, but the fundamental idea was embodied of using the track for the circuit, one rail being positive and the other negative, and the motor being placed across or between them in multiple arc to receive the current. Such are also practically the methods of today. The little model was in good preservation up to the year 1900, when, being shipped to the Paris Exposition, it was lost, the steamer that carried it floundering in mid-ocean. The very broad patent taken out by this simple mechanic, so far ahead of his times, was the first one issued in America for an electric motor. Davenport was also the first man to apply electric power to the printing press in 1840. In his traction work, he had a close second in Robert Davidson of Aberdeen, Scotland, who in 1839 operated both a lav and a small locomotive with the motor he had invented. His was the credit of first actually carrying passengers, two at a time, over a rough plank road, while it is said that his was the first motor to be tried on real tracks, those of the Edinburgh-Glasgow Road, making a speed of four miles an hour. The curse of this work, and of all that succeeded it for a score of years, was the necessity of depending upon chemical batteries for current, the machine usually being self-contained and hauling the batteries along with itself, as in the case of the famous Page experiments in April 1851, when a speed of 19 miles an hour was attained on the line of the Washington and Baltimore Road. To this unfruitful period belonged, however, the crude idea of taking the current from a stationary source of power by means of an overhead contact, which has found its practical evolution in the modern ubiquitous trolley. Although the patent for this based on his caveat of 1879, was granted several years later than that to Stephen D. Field for the combination of an electric motor operated by means of a current from a stationary dynamo or source of electricity conducted through the rails. As a matter of fact, in 1856 and again in 1875, George F. Green, a jobbing machinist of Kalamazoo, Michigan, built small cars and tracks to which current was fed from a distant battery, enough energy being utilized to haul 100 pounds of freight or one passenger up and down a road 200 feet long. All the work prior to the development of the dynamo as a source of current was sporadic and spasmodic and cannot be said to have left any trace on the art, though it offered many suggestions as to operative methods. The close of the same decade of the 19th century that saw the electric light brought to perfection saw also the realization in practice of all the hopes of fifty years as to electric traction. Both utilizations depended upon the supply of current now cheaply obtainable from the dynamo. These arts were indeed twins, feeding at inexhaustible breasts. 
In 1879, at the Berlin Exhibition, the distinguished firm of Siemens, to whose ingenuity and enterprise electrical development owes so much, installed a road about one-third of a mile in length, over which the locomotive hauled a train of three small cars at a speed of about eighteen miles an hour, carrying some twenty persons every trip. Current was fed from a dynamo to the motor through a central third rail, the two outer rails being joined together as the negative or return circuit. Primitive but essentially successful, this little road made a profound impression on the minds of many inventors and engineers, and marked the real beginning of the great new era, which has already seen electricity applied to the operation of main lines of trunk railways. But it is not to be supposed that on the part of the public there was any great amount of faith then discernible, and for some years the pioneers had great difficulty especially in this country, in raising money for their early modest experiments. Of the general conditions at this moment, Frank J. Sprague says in an article in the Century magazine of July 1905 on the creation of the new art, Edison was perhaps nearer the verge of great electric railway possibilities than any other American. In the face of much adverse criticism, he had developed the essentials of the low internal resistance dynamo with high resistance field, and many of the essential features of multiple arc distribution, and in 1880 he built a small road at his laboratory at Menlo Park. On May 13th of the year named, this interesting road went into operation as the result of hard and hurried work of preparation during the spring months. The first track was about a third of a mile in length, starting from the shops, following a country road, passing around a hill at the rear, and curving home, in the general form of the letter U. The rails were very light. Charles T. Hughes, who went with Edison in 1879, and was in charge of much of the work, states that they were second streetcar rails, insulated with tar, canvas paper, and things of that sort. Asphalt. They were spiked down on ordinary sleepers, laid upon the natural grade, and the gauge was about three feet six inches. At one point the grade dropped some sixty feet in a distance of three hundred, and the curves were of recklessly short radius. The dynamos supplying current to the road were originally two of the standard size Z machines then being made at the laboratory, popularly known throughout the Edison ranks as long-waisted Marianne's and the circuits from these were carried out to the rails by underground conductors. They were not large, but twelve horsepower each, generating seventy-five amperes of current at one hundred and ten volts, so that not quite twenty-five horsepower of electrical energy was available for propulsion. The locomotive built, while the rail bed was getting ready, was a four-wheeled iron truck, an ordinary flat dump car, about six feet long and four feet wide, upon which was mounted a Z-dynamo used as a motor, so that it had a capacity of about twelve horsepower. This machine was laid on its side, with the armature end coming out at the front of the locomotive, and the motive power was applied to the driving axle by a cumbersome series of friction pulleys. Each wheel of the locomotive had a metal rim and a center web of wood or paper mache, and the current picked up by one set of wheels was carried through contact brushes and a brass hub to the motor. The circuit back to the track, or the other rail, being closed through the other wheels in a similar manner. The motor had its field magnet circuit in permanent connection as a shunt across the rails, protected by a crude bare copper wire safety catch. 
A switch in the armature circuit enabled the motorman to reverse the direction of travel by reversing the current flow through the armature coils. Things went fairly well for a time on that memorable Thursday afternoon, when all the laboratory force made high holiday and scrambled for a foothold on the locomotive for a trip. But the friction gearing was not equal to the sudden strain put upon it during one run and went to pieces. Some years later, also, Daft again tried friction gear in his historical experiments on the Manhattan Elevated Road, but the results were attended with no greater success. The next resort of Edison was to belts, the armature shafting belted to a countershaft on the locomotive frame, and the countershaft belted to a pulley on the car axle. The lever which threw the former friction gear into adjustment was made to operate an idler pulley for tightening the axle belt. When the motor was started, the armature was brought up to full revolution, and then the belt was tightened on the car axle, compelling motion of the locomotives. But the belts were liable to slip a great deal in the process, and the chafing of the belts charred them badly. If that did not happen, and if the belt was made taut suddenly, the armature burned out, which it did with disconcerting frequency. The next step was to use a number of resistance boxes in series with the armature, so that the locomotive could start with those in circuit, and then the motorman could bring it up to speed gradually, by cutting one box out after the other. To stop the locomotive, the armature circuit was opened by the main switch, stopping the flow of current, and then brakes were applied by long levers. Matters generally, and the motors in particular, went much better, even if the locomotive was so freely festooned with resistance boxes all of perceptible weight, and occupying much of the limited space. These details show forcibly and typically the painful steps of advance that every inventor in this new field had to make in effort to reach not alone commercial practicability, but mechanical feasibility. It was all empirical enough, but that was the only way open even to the highest talent. Smugglers landing laces and silks have been known to wind them around their bodies as being less ostentatious than carrying them in a trunk. Edison thought his resistance boxes an equally superfluous display, and therefore ingeniously wound some copper resistance wires around one of the legs of the motor field magnet, where it was out of the way served as a useful extra field coil in starting up the motor, and dismissed most of the boxes back to the laboratory, a few being retained under the seat for chance emergencies. Like the boxes, this coil was in series with the armature, and subject to plugging in and out at will by the motorman. Thus equipped, the locomotive was found quite satisfactory, and long did yeoman service. It was given three cars to pull, one an open awning car with two park benches placed back to back, one a flat freight car, and one box car dubbed the Pullman, with which Edison illustrated a system of electric braking. Although work had been begun so early in the year, and the road had been operating since May, it was not until July that Edison executed any application for patents on his electromagnetic railway engine, or his ingenious braking system. Every inventor knows how largely his fate lies in the hands of a competent and alert patent attorney. In both the preparation and the prosecution of his case, Mr. Sprague is justified in observing in his Century article the paucity of controlling claims obtained in these early patents is remarkable. It is notorious that Edison did not then enjoy the skillful aid in safeguarding his ideas that he commended later. 
the daily newspapers and technical journals lost no time in bringing the road to public attention and the new york herald of june twenty fifth was swift to suggest that here was the locomotive that would be most pleasing to the average new yorker whose head has ached with noise whose eyes have been filled with dust or whose clothes have been ruined by oil a couple of days later the daily graphic illustrated and described the road and published a sketch of a one hundred horsepower electric locomotive for the use of the pennsylvania railroad between perth amboy and rahway visitors of course were numerous including many curious skeptical railroad managers few if any of whom except villard could see the slightest use for the new motive power there is perhaps some excuse for such indifference no men in the world have more new inventions brought to them than railroad managers and this was the rankest kind of novelty it was not indeed until a year later in may eighteen eighty one that the first regular road collecting fares was put in operation a little stretch of one and a half miles from berlin to lichterfeld with one miniature motor-car edison was in reality doing some heavy electric railway engineering his apparatus full of ideas suggestions prophecies but to the operators of long trunk lines it must have seemed utterly insignificant and excellent fooling speaking of this situation mr edison says one day frank thompson the president of the pennsylvania railroad came out to see the electric light and the electric railway in operation the latter was then about a mile long he rode on it at that time i was getting out plans to make an electric locomotive of three hundred horsepower with six-foot drivers with the idea of showing people that they could dispense with their steam locomotives but mr thompson made the objection that it was impractical and that it would be impossible to supplant steam his great experience and standing threw a wet blanket on my hopes but i thought he might perhaps be mistaken as there had been many such instances on record i continued to work on the plans and about three years later i started to build the locomotive at the works at gorick street and had it about finished when i was switched off on some other work one of the reasons why i felt the electric railway to be imminently practical was that henry villard the president of the northern pacific said that one of the greatest things that could be done would be to build right-angle feeders to the wheat fields of dakota and bring in the wheat to the main lines as the farmer then had to draw it from forty to eighty miles there was a point where it would not pay to raise it at all and large areas of the country were thus of no value i conceived the idea of building a very light railroad of narrow gauge and had got all the data as to the winds on the plains and found that it would be possible with very large windmills to supply enough power to drive those wheat trains among others who visited the little road at this juncture were persons interested in the manhattan elevated system of new york on which experiments were repeatedly tried later but which was not destined to adopt a method so obviously well suited to all the conditions until after many successful demonstrations had been made on elevated roads elsewhere it must be admitted that mr edison was not very profoundly impressed with the desire entertained in that quarter to utilize any improvement for he remarks when the elevated railroad in new york up sixth avenue was started there was a great clamor about the noise and injunctions were threatened the management engaged me to make a report on the cause of the noise i constructed an instrument that would record the sound and set out to make a preliminary report but i found that they never intended to do anything but let the people complain it was upon the cooperation of villard that edison fell back 
and an agreement was entered into between them on September 14, 1881, which provided that the latter would build two and a half miles of electric railway at Menlo Park, equipped with three cars, two locomotives, one for freight and one for passengers, capacity of latter 60 miles an hour, capacity freight engine 10 tons net freight, cost of handling a ton of freight per mile per horsepower to be less than ordinary locomotive. If experiments were successful, Villard to pay actual outlay in experiments and to treat with the light company for the installation of at least 50 miles of electric railway in the wheat regions. Mr. Edison is authority for the statement that Mr. Villard advanced between 35000 and 40000 and that the work done was satisfactory, but it did not end at that time in any practical results, as the Northern Pacific went into the hands of a receiver and Mr. Villard's ability to help was hopelessly crippled. The directors of the Edison Light Company could not be induced to have anything to do with the electric railway, and Mr. Insull states that the money advanced was treated by Mr. Edison as a personal loan and repaid to Mr. Villard, for whom he had a high admiration and a strong feeling of attachment. Mr. Insull says, among the financial men whose close personal friendship Edison enjoyed, I would mention Henry Villard, who I think had a higher appreciation of the possibilities of the Edison system than probably any other man of his time in Wall Street. He dropped out of the business at the time of the consolidation of the Thompson-Houston Company with the Edison General Electric Company. But from the earliest days of the business, when it was in its experimental period, when the Edison light and power system was but an idea, down to the day of his death, Henry Villard continued a strong supporter, not only with his influence but with his money. He was the first capitalist to back individually Edison's experiments in electric railways. In speaking of his relationship with Mr. Villard at this time, Edison says, When Villard was all broken down and in a stupor caused by his disasters in connection with the Northern Pacific, Mrs. Villard sent for me to come and cheer him up. It was very difficult to rouse him from his despair and apathy, but I talked about the electric light to him and its development and told him that it would help him win it all back and put him in his former position. Villard made his great rally. He made money out of the electric light, and he got back control of the Northern Pacific. Under no circumstances can a hustler be kept down. If he is only square, he is bound to get back on his feet. Villard has often been blamed and severely criticized, but he was not the only one to blame. His engineers had spent twenty million dollars too much in building the road, and it was not his fault if he found himself short of money, and at that time unable to raise any more. Villard maintained his intelligent interest in electric railway development, with regard to which Edison remarks, At one time Mr. Villard got the idea that he would run the mountain division of the Northern Pacific Railroad by electricity. He asked me if it could be done. I said, Certainly. It is too easy for me to undertake. Let someone else do it. He said, I want you to tackle the problem, and he insisted on it. So I got up a scheme of a third rail and shoe, and erected it in my yard here in Orange. When I got it all ready, he had all his division engineers come to New York, and they came over here. I showed them my plans and the unanimous decision of the engineers was that it was absolutely and utterly impracticable. That system is on the New York Central now, and was also used on the New Haven Road in its first work with electricity. At this point it may be well to cite some other statements of Edison as to kindred work, 
with which he has not usually been associated in the public mind. In the same manner, I had worked out for the Manhattan Elevated Railroad a system of electrical trains, and had the control of each car centered at one place, multiple control. This was afterward worked out and made practical by Frank Sprague. I got up a slot contact for street railways and have a patent on it, a sliding contact in a slot. Edward Lauterbach was connected with the Third Avenue Railroad in New York as counsel, and I told him he was making a horrible mistake putting in the cable. I told him to let the cable stand still and send the electricity through it, and he would not have to move hundreds of tons of metal all the time. He would rue the day when he put the cable in. It cannot be denied that the prophecy was fulfilled, for the cable was the beginning of the frightful financial collapse of the system, and was torn out in a few years to make way for the triumphant trolley in the slot. Incidental glimpses of his work are both amusing and interesting. Hughes, who was working on the experimental road with Mr. Edison, tells the following story. Villard sent J. C. Henderson, one of his mechanical engineers, to see the road when it was in operation, and we went down one day, Edison, Henderson, and I, and went on the locomotive. Edison ran it, and just after we started there was a trestle sixty feet long and seven feet deep, and Edison put on all the power. When we went over it we must have been going forty miles an hour, and I could see the perspiration come out on Henderson. After we got over the trestle and started on down the track, Henderson said, When we go back, I will walk. If there is any more of that kind of running, I won't be in it myself. To the correspondence of Grosvenor P. Lowry, we are indebted for a similar reminiscence, under the date of June 5, 1880. Goddard and I have spent a part of the day at Menlo, and all is glorious. I have ridden at forty miles an hour on Mr. Edison's electric railway, and we ran off the track. I protested at the rate of speed over the sharp curves designed to show the power of the engine, but Edison said they had done it often. Finally, when the last trip was to be taken, I said I did not like it, but would go along. The train jumped the track on a short curve, throwing Crucy, who was driving the engine, with his face down in the dirt, and another man in a comical somersault through some underbrush. Edison was off in a minute, jumping and laughing, and declaring it was a most beautiful accident. Crucy got up, his face bleeding, and a good deal shaken, and I shall never forget the expression of voice and face in which he said with some foreign accent, Oh, yes, perfectly safe. Fortunately, no other hurts were suffered, and in a few minutes we had the train on the track and running again. All this rough and ready dealing with grades and curves was not mere horseplay, but had a serious purpose underlying it, every trip having its record as to some feature of defect or improvement. One particular set of experiments relating to such work was made on behalf of visitors from South America, and were doubtless the first tests of the kind made for that continent, where now many fine electric street and interurban railway systems are in operation. Mr. Edison himself supplies the following data. During the electric railway experiments at Menlo Park, we had a short spur of track up one of the steep gullies. The experiment came about in this way. Bogota, the capital of Colombia, is reached on muleback, or was, from Honda, on the headwaters of the Magdalena River. There were parties who wanted to know if transportation over the mule route could not be done by electricity. They said the grades were excessive, and it would cost too much to do it with steam locomotives, even if they could climb the grades. I said, well, it can't be much more than 45 percent. 
We will try that first. If it will do that, it will do anything else. I started at 45%. I got up an electric locomotive with a grip on the rail by which it went up the 45% grade. Then they said the curves were very short. I put the curves in. We started the locomotive with nobody on it, and got up to 20 miles an hour, taking those curves a very short radius. But it was weeks before we could prevent it from running off. We had to bank the tracks up to an angle of 30 degrees before we could turn the curve and stay on. These Spanish parties were perfectly satisfied we could put in an electric railway from Honda to Bogota successfully, and then they disappeared. I have never seen them since. As usual, I paid for the experiment. In the spring of 1883, the Electric Railway Company of America was incorporated in the state of New York with a capital of two million dollars to develop the patents and inventions of Edison and Stephen D. Field, to the latter of whom the practical work of active development was confided, and in June of the same year an exhibit was made at the Chicago Railway Exposition, which attracted attention throughout the country and did much to stimulate the growing interest in electric railway work. With the aid of Messrs. F. B. Ray, C. L. Healy, and C. O. Mayhew, a track and locomotive were constructed for the company by Mr. Field and put in service in the gallery of the main exhibition building. The track curved sharply at either end on a radius of 56 feet, and the length was about one-third of a mile. The locomotive, named The Judge, after Justice Field, an uncle of Stephen D. Field, took current from a central rail between the two outer rails that were the return circuit, the contact being a rubbing wire brush on each side of the third rail, answering the same purpose as the contact shoe of later date. The locomotive weighed three tons, was twelve feet long, five feet wide, and made a speed of nine miles an hour with a trailer car for passengers. Starting on June 5th, when the exhibition closed on June 23rd, this tiny but typical railroad had operated for over 118 hours, had made over 446 miles, and had carried 26,805 passengers. After the exposition closed, the outfit was taken during the same year to the exposition at Louisville, Kentucky, where it was also successful carrying a large number of passengers. It deserves note that at Chicago, regular railway tickets were issued to paying passengers, the first ever employed on American electric railways. With this modest but brilliant demonstration, to which the illustrious name of Edison and Field were attached, began the outburst of excitement over electric railways, much like the eras of speculation and exploitation that attended only a few years earlier the introduction of the telephone and the electric light. But with such significant results that the capitalization of electric roads in America is now over four billion dollars, or twice as much as that of the other two arts combined. There was a tremendous rush into the electric railway field after 1883, and an outburst of inventive activity that has rarely, if ever, been equaled. It is remarkable that, except Siemens, no European achieved fame in this early work, while from America the ideas and appliances of Edison, Van Pohl, Sprague, Field, Daft, and Short have been carried and adopted all over the world. Mr. Edison was consulting electrician for the Electric Railway Company, but neither a director nor an executive officer. Just what the trouble was as to the internal management of the corporation, it is hard to determine a quarter of a century later but it was equipped with all the essential elements to dominate an art in which, after its first efforts, it remained practically supine and useless, while other interests forged ahead, 
and reaped both the profit and the glory. Dissensions arose between the representatives of the field and Edison interests, and in April 1890 the railway company assigned its rights to the Edison patents to the Edison General Electric Company, recently formed by the consolidation of all the branches of the Edison light, power, and manufacturing industry under one management. The only patent rights remaining to the railway company were those under three field patents, one of which, with controlling claims, was put in suit June 1890 against the Jamaica and Brooklyn Road Company, a customer of the Edison General Electric Company. This was, to say the least, a curious and anomalous situation. Voluminous records were made by both parties to the suit, and in the spring of 1894 the case was argued before the late Judge Townsend who wrote a long opinion dismissing the bill of complaint. See footnote 15. Footnote 15. See 61, Federal Republic, 655. The student will find therein a very complete and careful study of the early electric railway art. After this decision was rendered, the Electric Railway Company remained for several years in a moribund condition and on the last day of 1896 its property was placed in the hands of a receiver. In February of 1897 the receiver sold the three field patents to their original owner, and he in turn sold them to the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company. The Electric Railway Company then went into voluntary dissolution a sad example of failure to seize the opportunity at the psychological moment, and on the part of the inventor to secure any adequate return for years of effort and struggle in founding one of the great arts. Neither of these men was squelched by such a calamitous result, but if there were not something of bitterness in their feelings as they survey what has come of their work, they would not be human. As a matter of fact, Edison retained a very lively interest in electric railway progress long after the pregnant days at Menlo Park, one of the best evidences of which is an article in the New York Electrical Engineer of November 18, 1891, which describes some important and original experiments in the direction of adapting electrical conditions to the larger cities. The overhead trolley had by this time begun its victorious career, but there was intense hostility displayed toward it in many places because of the inevitable increase in the number of overhead wires, which carrying, as they did, a current of high voltage and large quantity, were regarded as a menace to life and property. Edison has always manifested a strong objection to overhead wires in cities, and urge placing them underground, and the outcry against the overhead deadly trolley met with his instant sympathy. His study of the problem brought him to the development of modern substation, although the twists that later evolutions have given the idea have left it scarcely recognizable. Mr. Villard, as president of the Edison General Electric Company, requested Mr. Edison, as electrician of the company, to devise a street railway system which should be applicable to the largest cities, where the use of the trolley would not be permitted, where the slot conduit system would not be used, and where, in general, the details of the construction should be reduced to the simplest form. The limits imposed practically were such as to require that the system should not cost more than a cable road to install. Edison reverted to his ingenious lighting plan of years earlier, and thus settled on a method by which current should be conveyed from the power plant at high potential to motor generators placed below the ground in close proximity to the rails. These substations would convert the current received at a pressure of, say, 1,000 volts to one of 20 volts available between rail and rail, with a corresponding increase in the volume of the current. 
with the utilization of heavy currents at low voltage, it became necessary, of course, to devise apparatus which should be able to pick up with absolute certainty 1,000 amperes of current at this pressure through two inches of mud, if necessary. With his wanted activity and fertility, Edison set about devising such a contact and experimented with metal wheels under all conditions of speed and track conditions. It was several months before he could convey 100 amperes by means of such contacts, but he worked out at last a satisfactory device which was equal to the task. The next point was to secure a joint between contiguous rails such as would permit of the passage of several thousand amperes without introducing undue resistance. This was also accomplished. Objections were naturally made to rails out in the open on the street surface, carrying large currents at potential of 20 volts. It was said that vehicles with iron wheels passing over the tracks and spanning the two rails would short-circuit the current, chew themselves up, and destroy the dynamos generating the current by choking all that tremendous amount of energy back into them. Edison tackled this objection squarely and short-circuited his track with such a vehicle, but succeeded in getting only about 200 amperes through the wheels. The low voltage and the insulating properties of the axle grease being sufficient to account for such a result. An iron bar was also used, polished, and with a man standing on it to ensure solid contact, but only 1,000 amperes passed through it, i.e., the amount required by a single car, and of course, much less than the capacity of the generators able to operate a system of several hundred cars. Further interesting experiments showed that the expected large leakage of current from the rails in wet weather did not materialize. Edison found that under the worst conditions, with a wet and salted track, at a potential difference of 20 volts between the two rails, the extreme loss was only two and one-half horsepower. In this respect, the phenomenon followed the same rules as that to which the telegraph wires were subject, namely that the loss of insulation is greater in damp, murky weather when the insulators are covered with wet dust than during heavy rains when the insulators are thoroughly washed by the action of the water. In like manner, a heavy rainstorm cleaned the tracks from the accumulations due chiefly to the droppings of the horses, which otherwise served largely to increase the conductivity. Of course, in dry weather, the loss of current was practically nothing, and under ordinary conditions, Edison held, his system was in respect to leakage and the problems of electrolytic attack of the current on adjacent pipes, etc., as fully insulated as the standard trolley network of the day. The cost of this system Mr. Edison placed at from $30,000 to $100,000 per mile of double track, in accordance with local conditions, and in this respect comparing very favorably with the cable systems, then so much in favor for heavy traffic. All the arguments that could be urged in support of this ingenious system are tenable and logical at the present moment. But the trolley had its way, except on a few lines where the conduit and shoe method was adopted, and in the intervening years the volume of traffic created and handled by electricity in centers of dense population has brought into existence the modern subway. But down to the moment of the preparation of this biography, Edison has retained an active interest in transportation problems, and his largest work has been that of reviving the use of the storage battery for streetcar purposes. At one time there were a number of storage battery lines and cars in operation in such cities as Washington, New York, Chicago, and Boston but the cost of operation and maintenance were found to be inordinately high as compared with those of the direct supply methods, and the battery cars all disappeared. 
the need for them under any conditions remained, as, for example, in places in Greater New York, where overhead trolley wires are forbidden as objectionable, and where the ground is too wet or too often submerged to permit of the conduit with the slot. Some of the roads in Greater New York have been anxious to secure such cars, and, as usual, the most resourceful electrical engineer and inventor of his times has made the effort. A special experimental track has been laid at the Orange Laboratory, and a car equipped with the Edison storage battery and other devices has been put under severe and extended trial there and in New York. Menlo Park, in ruin and decay, affords no traces of the early Edison electric railway work, but the crude little locomotive built by Charles T. Hughes was rescued from destruction and has become the property of the Pratt Institute of Brooklyn, to whose thousands of electrical students it is a constant example and incentive. It was loaned in 1904 to the Association of Edison Illuminating Companies, and by it... Chapter 19 of Edison, His Life and Inventions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Kevin Meneer Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 19, Magnetic or Milling Work during the Hudson Fulton celebration of October 1909, Burgomaster von Leeuwen of Amsterdam, member of the delegation sent officially from Holland to escort the Half Moon and participate in the functions of the anniversary, paid a visit to the Edison Laboratory at Orange to see the inventor, who may be regarded as preeminent among those of Dutch descent in this country, found, as usual, hard at work, this time on his cement house, of which he showed the iron molds, Edison took occasion to remark that if he had achieved anything worth while, it was due to the obstinacy and pertinacity he had inherited from his forefathers. To which it may be added that not less equally have the nature of inheritance and the quality of atavism been exhibited in his extraordinary predilection for the miller's art. While those Batavian ancestors on the low shores of the Zweeder Zee devoted their energies to grinding grain, he has been not less assiduous than they in reducing the rocks of the earth itself to flour. Although this phase of Mr. Edison's diverse activities is not as generally known to the world as many others of a more popular character, the milling of low-grade auriferous ores and the magnetic separation of iron ores have been subjects of engrossing interest and study to him for many years. Indeed, this comparatively unknown enterprise of separating magnetically and putting into commercial form low-grade iron ore, as carried on at Edison, New Jersey, proved to be the most colossal experiment that he has ever made. If a person qualified to judge were asked to answer categorically as to whether or not the enterprise was a failure, he could truthfully answer both yes and no. Yes, in that circumstances over which Mr. Edison had no control compelled the shutting down of the plant at the very moment of success. And no, in that the mechanically successful and commercially practical results obtained after the exercise of stupendous efforts and the expenditure of a fortune are so conclusive that they must inevitably be the reliance of many future iron masters. In other words, Mr. Edison was at least a quarter of a century ahead of the times in the work now to be considered. Before proceeding to the specific description of this remarkable enterprise, however, let us glance at an early experiment in separating magnetic iron sands on the Atlantic seashore. Some years ago, I heard one day that down in Quag Long Island there were immense deposits of black magnetic sand. This would be very valuable if the iron could be separated from the sand, so I went to Quag with one of my assistants and saw there for miles large beds of black sand on the beach in layers from one to six inches thick hundreds of thousands of tons. My first thought was that it would be a very easy matter to concentrate this, and I found I could sell the stuff at a good price. I put up a small plant, but just as I got started, a tremendous storm came up, and every bit of that black sand went out to sea. During the 28 years that have intervened, it has never come back. 
This incident was really the prelude to the development set forth in this chapter. In the early 80s, Edison became familiar with the fact that the eastern steel trade was suffering a disastrous change, and that business was slowly drifting westward, chiefly by reason of the discovery and opening of enormous deposits of high-grade iron ore in the upper peninsula of Michigan. This ore could be excavated very cheaply by means of improved mining facilities and transported at low cost to lake ports. Hence, the iron and steel mills east of the Alleghenies compelled to rely on limited local deposits of Bessemer ore and upon foreign ores which were constantly rising in value began to sustain a serious competition with western mills, even in eastern markets. Long before this situation arose, it had been recognized by eastern iron masters that sooner or later the deposits of high-grade ore would be exhausted, and, in consequence, there would ensue a compelling necessity to fall back on the low-grade magnetic ores. For many years, it had been a much-discussed question how to make these ores available for transportation to distant furnaces, to pay railroad charges on ores carrying perhaps 80 to 90 percent of useless material would be prohibitive. Hence the elimination of the worthless gang, by concentration of the iron particles associated with it, seemed to be the only solution of the problem. Many attempts had been made in bygone days to concentrate the iron in such ores by water processes, but with only a partial degree of success. The impossibility of obtaining a uniform concentrate was a most serious objection, had there not indeed been other difficulties which rendered this method commercially impracticable. It is quite natural, therefore, that the idea of magnetic separation should have occurred to many inventors. Thus we find numerous instances throughout the last century of experiments along this line, and particularly in the last 40 or 50 years, during which various attempts have been made by others than Edison to perfect magnetic separation and bring it up to something like commercial practice. At the time, he took up the matter. However, no one seems to have realized the full meaning of the tremendous problems involved. From 1880 to 1885, while still very busy in the development of his electric light system, Edison found opportunity to plan crushing and separating machinery. His first patent on the subject was applied for and issued early in 1880. He decided, after mature deliberation, that the magnetic separation of low-grade ores on a colossal scale at low cost was the only practical way of supplying the furnace man with high quality of iron ore. It was his opinion that it was cheaper to quarry and concentrate lean ore in a big way than to attempt to mine, under adverse circumstances, limited bodies of high-grade ore. He appreciated fully the serious nature of the gigantic questions involved, and his plans were laid out with a view to exercising the utmost economy in design and operation of the plant, in which he contemplated the automatic handling of many thousands of tons of material daily. It may be stated as broadly true that Edison engineered to handle immense masses of stuff automatically, while his predecessors aimed chiefly at close separation. Reduced to its barest, crudest terms, the proposition of magnetic separation is simplicity itself. A piece of the ore, magnetite, may be reduced to powder and the ore particles separated therefrom by the help of a simple hand magnet. To elucidate the basic principle of Edison's method, let the crushed ore fall in thin stream past such a magnet. The magnetic particles are attracted out of the straight line of the falling stream, and being heavy, gravitate inwardly and fall to one side of a partition placed below. The non-magnetic gang descends in a straight line to the other side of the partition. Thus a complete separation is effected. Simple though the principle appears, it was in its application to vast masses of material and in the solving of great engineering problems connected therewith that Edison's originality made itself manifest in the concentrating works that he established in New Jersey early in the 90s. Not only did he develop thoroughly the refining of the crushed ore so that after it had passed the 480 magnets in the mill, the concentrates came out finally containing 91 to 93 percent of the iron oxide but he also devised collateral machinery, methods and processes all fundamental in their nature. These are too numerous to specify in detail, as they extended throughout the various ramifications of the plant, but the principal ones are worthy of mention, such as the giant rolls for crushing, intermediate rolls, three high rolls, giant cranes, 215 feet long span, vertical dryer, belt conveyors, air separation, mechanical separation of phosphorus, and briquetting. 
that Mr. Edison's work was appreciated at the time is made evident by the following extract from an article describing the Edison plant, published in the Iron Age of October 28, 1897, in which, after mentioning his struggle with adverse conditions, it says, There is very little that is showy from the popular point of view in the gigantic work which Mr. Edison has done during these years, but to those who are capable of grasping the difficulties encountered, Mr. Edison appears in the new light of a brilliant constructing engineer, grappling with technical and commercial problems of the highest order. His genius as an inventor is revealed in many details of the great concentrating plant, but to our mind, originality of the highest type as constructor and designer appears in bold ways in which he sweeps aside accepted practices in this particular field and attains results not hitherto approached. He pursues methods in ore dressing at which those who are trained in the usual practice may well stand aghast. But considering the special features of the problem to be solved, his methods will be accepted as those economically wise and expedient. A cursory glance at these problems will reveal their import. Mountains must be reduced to dust. All this dust must be handled in detail, so to speak, and from it must be separated the fine particles of iron constituting only one-fourth or one-fifth of its mass and then this iron ore must be put into such shape that it could be commercially shipped and used. One of the most interesting and striking investigations made by Edison in this connection is worthy of note, and may be related in his own words. I felt certain that there must be large bodies of magnetite in the east, which, if crushed and concentrated, would satisfy the needs of the eastern furnaces for steel making. Having determined to investigate the mountain regions of New Jersey, I constructed a very sensitive magnetic needle, which would dip toward the earth if brought over any considerable body of magnetic ore. One of my laboratory assistants went out with me and visited many of the mines of New Jersey, but did not find deposits of any magnitude. One day, however, as we drove over a mountain range not known as iron-bearing land, I was astonished to find that the needle was strongly attracted and remained so thus indicating that the whole mountain was underlaid with vast bodies of magnetic ore. I knew it was a commercial problem to produce high-grade Bessemer ore from these deposits, and took steps to acquire a large amount of the property. I also planned a great magnetic survey of the East, and I believe it remains the most comprehensive of its kind yet performed. I had a number of men survey a strip reaching from Lower Canada to North Carolina. The only instrument we used was the special magnetic needle. We started in Lower Canada and traveled across the line of March 25 miles, then advanced south 1,000 feet, then back across the line of March again 25 miles, then south another 1,000 feet, across again, and so on. Thus we advanced all the way to North Carolina, carrying our cross-country march from 2 to 25 miles, according to geological formation. Our magnetic needle indicated the presence and richness of the invisible deposits of magnetic ore, we kept minute records of these indications, and when the survey was finished, we had exact information of the deposits in every part of each state we had passed through. We also knew the width, length, and approximate depth of every one of these deposits, which were enormous. The amount of ore disclosed by this survey was simply fabulous. How much so may be judged from the fact that in 3,000 acres immediately surrounding the mills that I afterward established at Edison were over two billion tons of low-grade ore. I also secured 16,000 acres in which the deposit was proportionately as large. These few acres alone contain sufficient ore to supply the whole United States iron trade, including exports, for 70 years. Given a mountain of rock containing only one-fifth to one-fourth magnetic iron, the broad problem confronting Edison resolved itself into three distinct parts. First, to tear down the mountain bodily and grind it to powder. Second, to extract from this powder the articles of iron mingled in its mass. And third, to accomplish these results at a cost sufficiently low to give the product a commercial value. Edison realized from the start that the true solution of this problem lay in the continuous treatment of the material, with the maximum employment of natural forces and the minimal of manual labor and generated power. Hence, all his conceptions followed this general principle so faithfully and completely that we find in the plant embodying his ideas the forces of momentum and gravity steadily in harness and keeping the traces taut. While there was no touch of the human hand upon the material from the beginning of the treatment to its finish, the staff being employed mainly to keep watch on the correct working of various processes.
it is hardly necessary to devote space to the beginnings of the enterprise, although they are full of interest. They served, however, to convince Edison that if he ever expected to carry out his schemes on the extensive scale planned, he could not depend upon the market to supply suitable machinery for important operations, but would be obliged to devise and build it himself. Thus, outside the steam shovel and such staple items as engines, boilers, dynamos, and motors, all of the diverse and complex machinery of the entire concentrating plant, as subsequently completed, was devised by him especially for this purpose. The necessity for this was due to the mainly radical variations made from accepted methods. No such departure was as radical as that of the method of crushing the ore. Existing machinery for this purpose had been designed on the basis of mining methods then in vogue, by which the rock was thoroughly shattered by means of high explosives and reduced to pieces of 100 pounds or less. These pieces were then crushed by power directly applied. If a concentrating mill planned to treat five or 6,000 tons per day were to be operated on the basis, the investment in crushers and the supply of power would be enormous, to say nothing of the risk of frequent breakdowns by reason of multiplicity of machinery and parts. From a consideration of these facts, and with his usual tendency to upset traditional observances, Edison conceived the bold idea of constructing gigantic rolls which, by the force of momentum, would be capable of crushing individual rocks a vastly greater size than ever before attempted. He reasoned that the advantages thus obtained would be fourfold, a minimum of machinery and parts, greater compactness, a saving of power, and greater economy in mining. As this last-named operation precedes the crushing, let us first consider it as it was projected and carried on by him. Perhaps quarrying would have been a better term than mining in this case, as Edison's plan was to approach the rock and tear it down bodily. The faith that moves mountains had a new opportunity. In work of this nature, it had been customary, as above stated, to depend upon a high explosive such as dynamite to shatter and break the ore into lumps of 100 pounds or less. This, however, he deemed to be a most uneconomical process. For energy stored as heat units in dynamite at $260 per ton was more expensive than that of calories in a ton of coal at $3 per ton. Hence, he believed that only the minimum of work should be done with a costly explosive, and therefore planned to use dynamite merely to dislodge great masses of rock, and depended upon the steam shovel operated by coal under the boiler to displace, handle, and remove the rock in detail. This was the plan that was subsequently put into practice in the great works at Edison, New Jersey. A series of three-inch holes 20 feet deep were drilled 8 feet apart about 12 feet back of the ore bank, and into these were inserted dynamite cartridges. The blast would dislodge 30 to 35,000 tons of rock, which was scooped up by great steam shovels and loaded onto skips carried by a line of cars on a narrow gauge railroad running to and from the crushing mill. Here the material was automatically delivered to giant rolls. The problem included handling and crushing the run of the mine without selection. The steam shovel did not discriminate, but picked up handily single pieces weighing five or six tons and loaded them on the skips with quantities of smaller lumps. When the skips arrived at the giant rolls, their contents were dumped automatically into a superimposed hopper. The rolls were well named, for with ear-splitting noise they broke up in a few seconds the great pieces of rock tossed in from the skips. It is not easy to appreciate to the full the daring exemplified in these great crushing rolls, or rather rock crackers, without having watched them in operation delivering their solar plexus blows. It was only as one might stand in their vicinity and hear the thunderous roar accompanying the smashing and rending of the rocks as they disappeared from the view that the mind was overwhelmed with a sense of the magnificent proportions of this operation. The enormous force exerted during this process may be illustrated from the fact that during its development and running one of the early forms of rolls, pieces of rock weighing more than a half ton would be shot up in the air to a height of 20 or 25 feet. The giant rolls were two solid cylinders, six feet in diameter and five feet long, made out of cast iron. To the faces of these rolls were bolted a series of heavy, chilled iron plates containing a number of projecting knobs two inches high. Each row had also two rows of four-inch knobs intended to strike a series of hammer-like blows. The rolls were set face to face 14 inches apart in a heavy frame, and the total weight was 130 tons, of which 70 tons were in moving parts. The space between these two rolls allowed pieces of rock measuring less than 14 inches to descend to other smaller rolls placed below. 
the giant rolls were belt-driven in opposite directions through friction clutches, although the belt was not depended upon for the actual crushing. Previous to the dumping of a skip, the rolls were speeded up to a circumferential velocity of nearly a mile a minute, thus imparting to them the terrific momentum that would break up easily in a few seconds boulders weighing five or six tons each. It was as though a rock of this size had got in the way of two express trains traveling in opposite directions at nearly 60 miles an hour. In other words, it was the kinetic energy of the rolls that crumbled up the rocks with pile driver effect. This sudden strain might have tended to stop the engine driving the rolls, but by ingenious clutch arrangement, the belt was released at the moment of resistance in the rolls by reason of the rocks falling between them. The act of breaking and crushing would naturally decrease the tremendous momentum, but after the rock was reduced and the pieces had passed through, the belt would again come into play and once more speed up the rolls for a repetition of their regular prize fighter duty. On leaving the giant rolls, the rocks, having been reduced to pieces not larger than 14 inches, passed into the series of intermediate rolls of similar construction and operation, by which they were still further reduced, and again passed on to three other sets of rolls of smaller dimensions. These latter rolls were also face-lined with chilled iron plates, but unlike the larger ones were positively driven, reducing the rock to pieces of about one-half inch size or smaller. The whole crushing operation of reduction from massive boulders to small pebbly pieces having been done in less time than the telling has occupied. The product was conveyed to the dryer, a tower nine feet square and fifty feet high, heated from below by great open furnace fires. All down the inside walls of this tower were placed cast iron plates, nine feet long and seven inches wide, arranged alternately in fish ladder fashion. The crushed rock being delivered at the top would fall down from plate to plate, constantly exposing different surfaces to the heat, until it landed completely dried in the lower portion of the tower, where it fell into conveyors which took it up to the stockhouse. This method of drying was original with Edison. At the time, this adjunct to the plant was required. The best dryer on the market was of a rotary type, which had a capacity of only 20 tons per hour, with the expenditure of considerable power. As Edison had determined upon treating 250 tons or more per hour, he decided to devise an entirely new type of great capacity, requiring a minimum of power for elevating the material, and depending upon the force of gravity for handling it during the drying process. A long series of experiments resulted in the invention of the tower dryer with capacity of 300 tons per hour. The rock, broken up into pieces about the size of marbles, having been dried and conveyed to the stockhouse, the surplusage was automatically carried out from the other end of the stockhouse by conveyors to pass through the next process, by which it was reduced to a powder. The machinery for accomplishing this result represented another interesting and radical departure of Edison from accepted usage. He had investigated all the crushing machines in the market and tried all he could get. He found them all greatly lacking in economy of operation. Indeed, the highest results obtainable from the best were 18% of actual work involving a loss of 82% by friction. His nature revolted at such an immense loss of power, especially as he proposed the crushing of vast quantities of ore. Thus, he was obliged to begin again at the foundation and he devised a crushing machine which has subsequently been named the Three High Rolls, and which practically reversed the above figures as it developed 84% of work done with only 16% loss in friction. A brief description of this remarkable machine will probably interest the reader. In the two end pieces of a heavy iron frame were set three rolls or cylinders, one in the center, another below, and the other above, all three being in a vertical line. These rolls were of a cast iron three feet in diameter, having chilled iron smooth face plates of considerable thickness. The lowest roll was set in a fixed bearing at the bottom of the frame, and therefore could only turn around on its axis. The middle and top rolls were free to move up or down from and toward the lower roll, and the shafts of the middle and upper rolls were set in a loose bearing which could slip up and down in the iron frame. It will be apparent, therefore, that any material which passed in between the top and the middle rolls and the middle and the bottom rolls would be ground as fine as might be desired, depending entirely upon the amount of pressure applied to the loose rolls. In operation, the material passed first through the upper and middle rolls, and then between the middle and lowest rolls. This pressure was applied in a most ingenious manner. On the ends of the shafts of the bottom and top rolls were syngilical sleeves or bearings having seven sheaves, in which was run a half-inch endless wire rope. 
This rope was wound seven times over the sheaves as above, and led upward over a single groove sheave, which operated by the piston of an air cylinder, and in this manner the pressure was applied to the rolls. It will be seen, therefore, that the system consisted in a single rope passed over sheaves and so arranged that it could be varied in length, thus providing for elasticity in exerting pressures and regulating it as desired. The efficiency of this system was incomparably greater than that of any other known crusher or grinder. For a while, a pressure of 125,000 pounds could be exerted by these rolls. Friction was almost entirely eliminated because of the upper and lower roll bearings turned with the rolls and revolved in the wire rope, which constituted the bearing proper. The same cautious foresight exercised by Edison in providing a safety device, the fuse, to prevent fires in his electric light system was again displayed in this concentrating plant, where, to save possible injury to its expensive operating parts, he devised an analogous factor, providing all the crushing machinery with closely calculated safety pins, which on being overloaded would shear off and thus stop the machinery at once. The rocks, having thus been reduced to fine powder, the mass was ready for screening on its way to the magnetic separators. Here again, Edison reversed prior practice by discarding rotary screens and devising a form of tower screen, which besides having a very large working capacity by gravity, eliminated all power except that required to elevate the material. The screening process allowed the finest part of the crushed rock to pass on, by conveyor belts, to the magnetic separators, while the coarser particles were in like manner automatically returned to the rolls for further reduction. In a narrative not intended to be strictly technical, it would probably tire the reader to follow this material in detail through the numerous steps attending the magnetic separation. These may be seen in a diagram reproduced from the above-named article in the Iron Age and supplemented by the following extract from the Electrical Engineer, New York, October 28, 1897. At the start of the weakest magnet at the top frees the purest particles and the second takes care of the others but the third catches those to which rock adheres and will extract particles of which only one-eighth is iron. This batch of material goes back for another crushing, so that everything is subjected to an equality of refining. We are now in sight of the real concentrates, which are conveyed to dryer number two for drying again, and are then delivered to the 50 mesh screens. Whatever is fine enough goes through to the eighth-inch magnets, and the remainder goes back for re-crushing. Below the eighth-inch magnets, the dust is blown out of the particles mechanically, and they go to the 4-inch magnets for final cleansing and separation. Obviously, at each step, the percentage of felspar and phosphorus is less and less until in the final concentrates the percentage of iron oxide is 91 to 93 percent. As intimated at the outset, the tailings will be 75 percent of the rock taken from the veins of ore so that every 4 tons of crude, raw, low-grade ore will have yielded roughly 1 ton of high-grade concentrate and 3 tons of sand the latter also having its value in various ways. This sand was transported automatically by belt conveyors to the rear of the works to be stored and sold. Being sharp, crystalline, and even in quality, it was a valuable byproduct. Finding a ready sale for building purposes, railway sandboxes, and various industrial uses. The concentrate in fine powdery form was delivered in similar manner to a stockhouse. As to the next step in the process, we may now quote again from the article in the Iron Age. While Mr. Edison and his associates were working on the problem of cheap concentration of iron ore, an added difficulty faced them in the preparation of the concentrates for the market. Furnace men object to more than a very small proportion of fine ore in their mixtures, particularly when the ore is magnetic, not easily reduced. The problem to be solved was to market an agglomerated material so as to avoid the drawbacks of fine ore. The agglomerated product must be so porous as to afford access of the furnace reducing gases to the ore. It must be hard enough to bear transportation and to carry the furnace burden without crumbling to pieces. It must be waterproof to a certain extent because considerations connected with securing low rates of freight make it necessary to be able to shift the concentrates and market in open coal cars exposed to snow and rain. In many respects, the attainment of these somewhat conflicting ends was the most perplexing of the problems which confronted Mr. Edison, the agglomeration of the concentrates having been decided upon. Two other considerations not mentioned above were of primary importance. First, to find a suitable cheap binding material, and second, its nature must be such that very little would be necessary per ton of concentrates. These severe requirements were staggering, but Mr. Edison's courage did not falter. Although it seemed a well-nigh hopeless task, 
he entered upon the investigation with his usual optimism and vim. After many months of unremitting toil and research and the trial of thousands of experiments, the goal was reached in the completion of a successful formula for agglomerating the fine ore and pressing it into briquettes by special machinery. This was the final process requisite for the making of a completed commercial product. Its practice, of course, necessitated the addition of an entirely new department of the works, which was carried into effect by the construction and the installation of the novel mixing and briquetting machinery, together with extensions of the conveyors with which the plant had already been liberally provided. Briefly described, the process consisted in mixing the concentrates with a special binding material in machines of an entirely new type, and in passing the resultant pasty mass into briquetting machines, where it was pressed into cylindrical cakes three inches in diameter and one and a half inches thick, under successive pressures of 78,000, 14,000, and 60,000 pounds. Each machine made these briquettes at the rate of 60 per minute and dropped them into bucket conveyors by which they were carried into drying furnaces, through which they made five loops and were delivered to cross conveyors which carried them into the stockhouse. At the end of this process, the briquettes were so hard that they would not break or crumble in loading on the cars or in transportation by rail while they were so porous as to be capable of absorbing 26% of their own volume in alcohol, but repelling water absolutely perfect, old soaks. Thus, with never-failing persistence and patience, coupled with intense thought and hard work, Edison met and conquered one by one the complex difficulties that confronted him. He succeeded in what he set out to do and it is now to be noted that the product he had striven so sedulously to obtain was a highly commercial one, for not only did the briquettes of concentrated ore fulfill the purpose of their creation, but in use actually tended to increase the working capacity of the furnace. As the following test, quoted from the Iron Age, October 28, 1897, will attest, the only trial of any magnitude of the briquettes in the blast furnace was carried through earlier this year in the Crane Iron Works, Catasauqua, Pennsylvania, by Leonard Peckett. The furnace at which the test was made produces from 100 to 110 tons per day when running on the ordinary mixture. The charging of briquettes was begun with a percentage of 25% and was carried up to 100%. The following is the record of the results. January 5th, working percent 25, quantity of briquette tons 104, silica 2.770, phosphorus 0 0.830, sulfur 0 0.018, Manganese, 0 0.500. January 6th, working percent, 37 and one half. Quantity of briquette tons, 4 and one half. Silica, 2.620. Phosphorus, 0 0.740. Sulfur, 0 0.018. Manganese, 0 0.350. January 7th, working percent, 50. Quantity of briquette tons, 138 and one half. Tons silica, 2.572. Phosphorus, 0 0.580. Sulfur, 0 0.015. Manganese, 0 0.200. January 8th, working percent 75. Quantity of briquette tons, 119. Silica, 1.844. Phosphorus, 0 0.264. Sulfur, 0 0.022, manganese, 0 0.200. January 9th, working percent 100. Quantity of briquette tons, 138 one half. Silica, 1.712. Phosphorus, 0 0.147. Sulfur, 0 0.038. Manganese, 0 0.185. On the 9th, at 5 p.m., the briquettes having been nearly exhausted, the percentage was dropped to 25%, and on the 10th, the output dropped to 120 tons, and on the 11th, the furnace had resumed the usual work on the regular standard ores. These figures prove that the yield of the furnace is considerably increased. The crane trial was too short to settle the question to what extent the increase in product may be carried. This increase in output, of course, means a reduction in the cost of labor and of general expenses. The richness of the ore and its purity, of course, affect the limestone consumption. In the case of the crane trial, there was a reduction from 30% to 12% of the ore charge. Finally, the fuel consumption is reduced, which in the case of the eastern plants with their relatively costly coke, 
is a very important consideration. It is regarded as possible that eastern furnaces will be able to use a smaller proportion of the costlier coke and correspondingly increase in anthracite coal, which is a cheaper fuel in that section. So far as foundry iron is concerned, the experience at Catasauqua, Pennsylvania, brief as it has been, shows that a stronger and tougher metal is made. Edison himself tells an interesting little story in this connection when he enjoyed the active help of that noble character, John Fritz, the distinguished inventor and pioneer of the modern steel industry in America. He says, When I was struggling along with the iron ore concentration, I went to see several blast furnace men to sell the ore at the marketplace. They saw I was very anxious to sell it, and they would take advantage of my necessity. But I happened to go to Mr. John Fritz of Bethlehem Steel Company and told him what I was doing. Well, he said to me, Edison, you are doing a good thing for the eastern furnaces. They ought to help you, for it will help us out. I am willing to help you. I mix a little sentiment with business, and I will give you an order for 100,000 tons. And he sat right down and gave me the order. The Edison concentrating plant has been sketched in the briefest outline with the view of affording merely a bare idea of the great work of its projector. To tell the whole story in detail and show its logical sequence step by step would take a little less than a volume in itself. For Edison's method, always iconoclastic when progress is in sight, were particularly so at the period in question. It has been said that Edison's scrap heap contains the elements of a liberal education, and this was essentially true for the discard during the ore milling experience. Interesting as it might be to follow at length the numerous phases of ingenious and resourceful development that took place during those busy years, the limit of present space forbids their relation. It would, however, be denying the justice that is Edison's due to omit all mention of two hitherto unnamed items, in particular, that have added to the world's store of useful devices. We refer first to the great traveling hoisting crane having a span of 250 feet and used for hoisting loads equal to 10 tons, this being the largest of the kind made up to that time, and afterward used as a model by many others. The second item was the ingenious and varied forms of conveyor belt, devised and used by Edison at the concentrating works, and subsequently developed into a separate and extensive business by an engineer to whom he gave permission to use his plans and patterns. Edison's native shrewdness and knowledge of human nature was put to practical use in the busy days of plant construction. It was found impossible to keep mechanics on account of indifferent residential accommodations afforded by the tiny village, remote from civilization, among the central mountains of New Jersey. This puzzling question, much discussed between him and his associate, Mr. W. S. Mallory, until finally he said to the latter, If we want to keep the men here, we must make it attractive for the women, so let us build some houses that will have running water and electric lights, and rent at low rate. He set to work, and in a day finished a design for a type of house. Fifty were quickly built and fully described in advertising for mechanics. Three days' advertisements brought in over 650 applications, and afterward Edison had no trouble in obtaining all the first-class men he required, as settlers in the artificial Yosemite he was creating. We owe to Mr. Mallory a characteristic story of this period as to an incidental unbending from toil, which in itself illustrates the ever-present determination to conquer what is undertaken. Along in the latter part of the 90s, when the work on the problem of concentrating iron ore was in progress, it became necessary when leaving the plant at Edison to wait over at Lake Hopatcong one hour for a connecting train. During some of these waits, Mr. Edison had seen me play billiards. At the particular time this incident happened, Mrs. Edison and her family were away for the summer, and I was staying at the Glenmont home on the Orange Mountains. One hot Saturday night, after Mr. Edison had looked over the evening papers, he said to me, Do you want to play a game of billiards? Naturally, this astonished me very much, as he is a man who cares little or nothing for the ordinary games, with the single exception of Parcheesi, of which he is very fond. I said I would like to play, so we went up to the billiard room of the house. I took off the cloth, got out the balls, picked out a cue for Mr. Edison, and when we banked for the first shot, I won and started the game. After making two or three shots, I missed, and a long karam shot was left for Mr. Edison, the cue ball and object ball being within about twelve inches of each other and the other ball a distance of nearly the length of the table. Mr. Edison attempted to make the shot, but missed it, and said, put the balls back. So I put them back in the same position, and he missed it a second time. I continued at his request to put the balls back in the same position for the next fifteen minutes, until he could make the shot every time. Then he said, I don't want to play any more. 
Having taken a somewhat superficial survey of the great enterprise under consideration, having had a cursory glance at the technical development of the plant up to the point of its successful culmination in the making of a marketable commercial product as exemplified in the test at the crane furnace, let us revert to the demonstration and note the events that followed. The facts of this actual test are far more eloquent than the volumes of argument would be as justification of Edison's assiduous labors over eight years, and of the expenditure of a fortune in bringing his broad conception to a concrete possibility. In the patient solving of tremendous problems, he had toiled up the mountainside of success, scaling its topmost peak and obtaining a view of the boundless prospect. But alas, the best laid plans of mice and men gang aft agly. The discovery of great deposits of rich Bessemer ore in the Mesaba range of mountains in Minnesota a year or two previous to completion of his work had been followed by the opening up of those deposits and marketing of the ore. It was of such rich character that being cheaply mined by greatly improved and inexpensive methods, the market price of crude ore of like iron units fell from about $6.50 to $3.50 per ton at the time when Mr. Edison was ready to supply his concentrated product. At the former price, he could have supplied the market and earned a liberal profit on his investment, but at $3.50 per ton, he was left without a reasonable chance of competition. Thus was swept away the possibility of reaping the rewards so richly earned by years of incessant thought, labor, and care. This great and notable plant, representing a very large outlay of money, brought to completion, ready for business, and embracing some of the most brilliant and remarkable of Edison's inventions and methods, must be abandoned by force of circumstances over which he had no control, and with it must die the high hopes that his progressive, conquering march to success had legitimately engendered. The financial aspect of these enterprises is often overlooked and forgotten. In this instance, it was of more than usual import and seriousness, as Edison was virtually his own backer, putting into the company almost the whole of all the fortune his inventions had brought him. There is a tendency to deny the capital that thus takes desperate chances its full reward if things go right, and to insist that it shall have barely the legal rate of interest and far less than the return of over-the-counter retail trade. It is an absolute fact that the great electrical inventors and the men who stood behind them have had little return for their foresight and courage. In this instance, when the inventor was largely his own financier, the difficulties and perils were redoubled. Let Mr. Mallory give an instance. During the latter part of the Panic of 1893, there came a period when we were very hard up for ready cash, due largely to the panicky conditions and a large payroll had been raised with considerable difficulty. A short time before payday, our treasurer called me up by telephone and said, I have just received the paid checks from the bank, and I am fearful that my assistant, who has forged my name to some of the checks, has absconded with about $3,000. I went immediately to Mr. Edison and told him of the forgery and the amount of money taken, and in what an embarrassing position we were for the next payroll. When I had finished, he said, It is too bad the money is gone, but I will tell you what to do. Go and see the president of the bank which paid the forged checks. Get him to admit the bank's liability, and then say to him that Mr. Edison does not think the bank should suffer because he happened to have a dishonest clerk in his employ. Also say to him that I shall not ask them to make the amount good. This was done, the bank admitting its liability and being much pleased with this action. When I reported to Mr. Edison, he said, That's all right. We have made a friend of the bank, and we may need friends later on. And so it happened that some time afterward, when we greatly needed help in the way of loans, the bank willingly gave us the accommodations we required to tide us over for a critical period. This iron ore concentrating project had lain close to Edison's heart and ambition. Indeed, it had permeated his whole being to the exclusion of almost all other investigations or inventions for a while. For five years he had lived and worked steadily at Edison, leaving there only on Saturday night to spend Sunday at his home in Orange, and returning to the plant by an early train on Monday morning. Life at Edison was of the simple kind, work, meals, and a few hours sleep day by day. The little village, called into existence by the concentrating works, was of the most primitive nature, and offered nothing in the way of frivolity or amusement. Even the scenery is austere. Hence Edison was enabled to follow his natural bent in being surrounded day and night by his responsible chosen associates, with whom he worked uninterrupted by outsiders from early morning away into the late hours of the evening. 
those who were laboring with him, inspired by his unflagging enthusiasm, followed his example and devoted all their waking hours to the furtherance of his plans with a zeal that ultimately bore fruit in the practical success he had recorded. In view of its present status, this colossal enterprise at Edison may well be likened to the prologue of a play that is subsequently to be enacted for the benefit of future generations. But before ringing down the curtain, it is desirable to preserve the unities by quoting the words of one of the principal actors, Mr. Mallory, who says, The concentrating works had been in operation, and we had produced a considerable quantity of the briquettes, and had been able to sell only a portion of them the iron market being in such condition that the blast furnaces were not making any new purchases of iron ore, and were having difficulty to receive and consume the ores which had been previously contracted for. So what sales we were able to make were at extremely low prices, my recollection being that they were between $3.50 and $3.80 per ton. Whereas when the works had started, we had hoped to obtain $6 to $6.50 per ton for the briquettes. We had also thoroughly investigated the wonderful deposit at Misaba, and it was with the greatest possible reluctance that Mr. Edison was able to come finally to the conclusion that, under existing conditions, the concentrating plant could not be made into a commercial success. This decision was reached only after the most careful investigations and calculations, as Mr. Edison was just as full of fight and ambition to make it a success as when he had first started. When this decision was reached, Mr. Edison and I took the Jersey Central train from Edison bound for Orange, and I did not look forward to the immediate future with any degree of confidence, as the concentrating plant was heavily in debt without any early prospect of being able to pay off its indebtedness. On the train, the matter of the future was discussed, and Mr. Edison said that inasmuch as we had the knowledge gained from our experience in the concentrating problem, we must, if possible, apply it to some practical use, and at the same time we must work out some other plans by which we could make enough money to pay off the concentrating company's indebtedness. Mr. Edison stating most positively that no company with which he had personally been actively connected had ever failed to pay its debts, and he did not propose to have the concentrating company any exception. In the discussion that followed, he suggested several kinds of work which he had in his mind, and which might prove profitable. We figured carefully over the probabilities of financial returns from the phonograph works and other enterprises, and after discussing many plans, it was finally decided that he would apply the knowledge we had gained in the concentrating plants by building a plant for manufacturing Portland cement, and that Mr. Edison would devote his attention to the developing of a storage battery which did not use lead and sulfuric acids. So these two lines of work were taken up by Mr. Edison with just as much enthusiasm and energy as is usual with him the commercial failure of the concentrating plant seeming not to affect his spirits in any way. In fact, I have often been impressed strongly with the fact that, during the dark days of the concentrating problem, Mr. Edison's desire was very strong that the creditors of the concentrating work should be paid in full, and only once did I hear him make any reference to the financial loss which he himself made. And he then said, As far as I am concerned, I can any time get a job at $75 per month as a telegrapher and that will amply take care of all my personal requirements. As he already stated, however, he started in with the maximum amount of enthusiasm and ambition, and in the course of about three years we succeeded in paying off all the indebtedness of the concentrating works, which amounted to several hundred thousand dollars. As to the state of Mr. Edison's mind when the final decision was reached to close down, if he was specially disappointed there was nothing in his manner to indicate it, his every thought being for the future and as to what could be done to pull us out of the financial situation in which we found ourselves, and to take advantage of the knowledge which we had acquired at so great a cost. It will have been gathered that the funds for this great experiment were furnished largely by Edison. In fact, over two million dollars were spent in the attempt. Edison's philosophic view of affairs is given in the following anecdote from Mr. Mallory. During the boom times of 1902, when the old General Electric stock sold at its high water mark of about $330, Mr. Edison and I were on our way from the cement plant at New Village, New Jersey, to his home at Orange. When we arrived at Dover, New Jersey, we got a New York newspaper, and I called his attention to the quotation of that day on General Electric. Mr. Edison then asked, If I hadn't sold any of mine, what would it be worth today? And after some figuring, I replied, over four million dollars. When Mr. Edison is thinking seriously over a problem, he is in the habit of pulling his right eyebrow, 
which he did now for fifteen or twenty seconds. Then his face lighted up, and he said, Well, it's all gone, but we had a hell of a good time spending it. With which revelation of an attitude worthy of Mark Tapley himself, this chapter may well conclude. End of chapter 19. Recording by William Kevin. Chapter 20 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 20 edison portland cement few developments in recent years have been more striking than the general adoption of cement for structural purposes of all kinds in the united states or than the increase in its manufacture here as a material for the construction of office buildings factories and dwellings it has lately enjoyed an extraordinary vogue yet every indication is confirmatory of the belief that such use has barely begun. Various reasons may be cited, such as the growing scarcity of wood, once the favorite building material in many parts of the country, and the increasing dearness of brick and stone. The fact remains indisputable and demonstrated flatly by the statistics of production. In 1902, the American output of cement was placed at about 21 million barrels, valued at over seventeen million dollars in nineteen o seven the production is given as nearly forty nine million barrels here then is an industry that doubled in five years the average rate of industrial growth in the united states is ten per cent a year or doubling every ten years it is a singular fact that electricity also so far exceeds the normal rate as to double in value and quantity of output and investment every five years. There is perhaps more than ordinary coincidence in the association of Edison with two such active departments of progress. As a purely manufacturing business, the general cement industry is one of even remote antiquity. And if Edison had entered into it merely as a commercial enterprise, by following paths already so well trodden, the fact would hardly have been worthy of even passing notice. It is not in his nature, however, to follow a beaten track except in regard to the recognition of basic principles, so that, while the manufacture of Edison Portland cement embraces the main essentials and familiar processes of cement making, such as crushing, drying, mixing, roasting, and grinding, his versatility and originality as exemplified in the conception and introduction of some bold and revolutionary methods and devices, have resulted in raising his plant from the position of an outsider to the rank of the fifth largest producer in the United States in the short space of five years after starting to manufacture. Long before his advent in cement production, Edison had held very pronounced views on the value of that material, as the one which would obtain largely for future building purposes on account of its stability. More than twenty-five years ago, one of the writers of this narrative heard him remark during a discussion on ancient buildings, Wood will rot, stone will chip and crumble, bricks disintegrate, but a cement and iron structure is apparently indestructible. Look at some of the old Roman baths. They are as solid as when they were built." With such convictions and the vast fund of practical knowledge and experience he had gained at Edison in the crushing and manipulation of large masses of magnetic iron ore during the preceding nine years, it is not surprising that on the homeward railway journey, mentioned at the close of the preceding chapter, he should have decided to go into the manufacture of cement, especially in view of the enormous growth of its use for structural purposes during recent times. The field being a new one, 
Edison followed his usual course of reading up every page of authoritative literature on the subject, and seeking information from all quarters. In the meantime, while he was busy also with his new storage battery, Mr. Mallory, who had been hard at work on the cement plan, announced that he had completed arrangements for organizing a company with sufficient financial backing to carry on the business, concluding with the remark that it was now time to engage engineers to lay out the plant. Edison replied that he intended to do that himself, and invited Mr. Mallory to go with him to one of the drafting rooms on an upper floor of the laboratory. Here he placed a large sheet of paper on a drafting table, and immediately began to draw out a plan of the proposed works, continuing all day and away into the evening, when he finished, thus completing within the twenty-four hours the full layout of the entire plant as it was subsequently installed, and as it has substantially remained in practical use to this time. It will be granted that this was a remarkable engineering feat, especially in view of the fact that Edison was then a newcomer in the cement business, and also that if the plant were to be rebuilt today, no vital change would be desirable or necessary. In that one day's planning, every part was considered and provided for, from the crusher to the packing house. From one end to the other, the distance over which the plant stretches in length is about half a mile and through the various buildings spread over the space there passes, automatically, in course of treatment, a vast quantity of material resulting in the production of upward of two and a quarter million pounds of finished cement every twenty-four hours, seven days in the week. In that one day's designing, provision was made not only for all important parts, but minor details, such, for instance, as the carrying of all steam, water, and air pipes, and electrical conductors in a large subway running from one end of the plant to the other, and an oiling system for the entire works. This latter deserves special mention, not only because of its arrangement for thorough lubrication, but also on account of the resultant economy affecting the cost of manufacture. Edison has strong convictions on the liberal use of lubricants, but argued that in the ordinary oiling of machinery there is great waste, while much dirt is conveyed into the bearings. He therefore planned a system by which the ten thousand bearings in the plant are oiled automatically, requiring the services of only two men for the entire work. This is accomplished by a central pumping and filtering plant, and the return of the oil from all parts of the works by gravity. Every bearing is made rust-proof and is provided with two interior pipes. One is above and the other below the bearing. The oil flows in through the upper pipe and, after lubricating the shaft, flows out through the lower pipe back to the pumping station, where any dirt is filtered out and the oil returned to circulation. While this system of oiling is not unique, it was the first instance of its adaptation on so large and complete a scale, and illustrates the far-sightedness of his plans. In connection with the adoption of this lubricating system, there occurred another instance of his knowledge of materials and intuitive insight into the nature of things. He thought that too frequent circulation of a comparatively small quantity of oil would, to some extent, impair its lubricating qualities, and requested his assistance to verify this opinion by consultation with competent authorities. On making inquiry of the engineers of the Standard Oil Company, his theory was fully sustained. Hence, provision was made for carrying a large stock of oil, and for giving a certain period of rest to that already used. A keen appreciation of ultimate success in the production of a fine quality of cement led Edison to provide very carefully in his original scheme for those details that he foresaw would become requisite, such, for instance, as ample stock capacity for raw materials and their automatic delivery in the various stages of manufacture, as well as mixing, weighing, and frequent sampling and analyzing during the progress through the mills. This provision even included the details of the packing house, and his perspicacity in this case is well sustained, 
from the fact that nine years afterward, in anticipation of building an additional packing house, the company sent a representative to various parts of the country to examine the systems used by manufacturers in the packing of large quantities of various staple commodities involving somewhat similar problems, and found that there was none better than that devised before the cement plant was started. Hence the order was given to build the new packing house on lines similar to those of the old one. Among the many innovations appearing in this plant are two that stand out in bold relief, as indicating the large scale by which Edison measures his ideas. One of these consists of the crushing and grinding machinery, and the other of the long kilns. In the preceding chapter there has been given a description of the giant rolls, by means of which great masses of rock, of which individual pieces may weigh eight or more tons, are broken and reduced to about a fourteen-inch size. The economy of this is apparent when it is considered that in other cement plants the limit of crushing ability is one man's size, that is, pieces not too large for one man to lift. The story of the kiln, as told by Mr. Mallory, is illustrative of Edison's tendency to upset tradition and make a radical departure from generally accepted ideas. When Edison first decided to go into the cement business, it was on the basis of his crushing rolls and air separation, and he had every expectation of installing duplicates of the kilns which were then in common use for burning cement. These kilns were usually made of boiler iron, riveted, and were about sixty feet long and six feet in diameter, and had a capacity of about two hundred barrels of cement clinker in twenty-four hours. When the detail plans for our plant were being drawn, Mr. Edison and I figured over the coal capacity and coal economy of the sixty-foot kiln, and each time thought that both could be materially bettered. After having gone over this matter several times, he said, I believe I can make a kiln which will give an output of 100 barrels in 24 hours. Although I had then been closely associated with him for 10 years, and was accustomed to see him accomplish great things, I could not help feeling the improbability of his being able to jump into an old established industry as a novice, and start by improving the heart of the production so as to increase its capacity 400%. When I pressed him for an explanation, he was unable to give any definite reasons, except that he felt positive it could be done. In this connection, let me say that very many times I have heard Mr. Edison make predictions as to what a certain mechanical device ought to do in the way of output and costs, when his statements did not seem to be even among the possibilities. Subsequently, after more or less experience, these predictions have been verified, and I cannot help coming to the conclusion that he has a faculty, not possessed by the average mortal, of intuitively and correctly sizing up mechanical and commercial possibilities. But, returning to the kiln, Mr. Edison went to work immediately, and very soon completed the design of a new type, which was to be a 150 feet long and 9 feet in diameter, made up in ten-foot sections of cast iron bolted together and arranged to be revolved on fifteen bearings. He had a wooden model made and studied it very carefully through a series of experiments. These resulted so satisfactorily that this form was finally decided upon and ultimately installed as part of the plant. Well, for a year or so the kiln problem was a nightmare to me. When we started up the plant experimentally, and the long kiln was first put into operation, an output of about 400 barrels in 24 hours was obtained. Mr. Edison was more than disappointed at this result. His terse comment on my report was, Rotten, try it again. When we became a little more familiar with the operation of the kiln, we were able to get the output up to about 550 barrels, and a little later to 650 barrels per day. I would go down to Orange and report with a great deal of satisfaction the increase in output, but Mr. Edison would apparently be very much disappointed 
and often said to me that the trouble was not with the kiln, but with our method of operating it, and he would reiterate his first statement that it would make one thousand barrels in twenty-four hours. Each time I would return to the plant with a determination to increase the output if possible, and we did increase it to seven hundred and fifty, then to eight hundred and fifty barrels. Each time I reported these increases, Mr. Edison would still be disappointed. I said to him several times that if he was so sure the kiln would turn out one thousand barrels in twenty-four hours, we would be very glad to have him tell us how to do it, and that we would run it in any way he directed. He replied that he did not know what it was that kept the output down, but he was just as confident as ever that the kiln would make one thousand barrels per day, and that if he had time to work with and watch the kiln, it would not take him long to find out the reasons why. He had made a number of suggestions throughout these various trials, however, and as we continued to operate, we learned additional points in handling, and were able to get the output up to 900 barrels, then 1,000, and finally to over 1,100 barrels per day, thus more than realizing the prediction made by Mr. Edison before even the plans were drawn. It is only fair to say, however, that prolonged experience has led us to the conclusion that the maximum economy and continuous operation of these kilns is obtained by working them at a little less than their maximum capacity. It is interesting to note, in connection with the Edison type of kiln, that when the older cement manufacturers first learned of it, they ridiculed the idea universally, and were not slow to predict our early finish as cement manufacturers. The ultimate success of the kiln, however, proved their criticisms to be unwarranted. Once aware of its possibility, some of the cement manufacturers proceeded to avail themselves of the innovation, at first without Mr. Edison's consent. And today, more than one half of the Portland cement produced in this country is made in kilns of the Edison type. Old plants are lengthening their kilns wherever practicable, and no wide-awake manufacturer building a modern plant could afford to install other than these long kilns. This invention of Mr. Edison has been recognized by the larger cement manufacturers, and there is every prospect now that the entire trade will take licenses under his kiln patents. When he decided to go into the cement business, Edison was thoroughly awake to the fact that he was proposing to butt into an old established industry in which the principal manufacturers were concerns of long standing. He appreciated fully its inherent difficulties, not only in manufacture, but also in the marketing of the product. These considerations, together with his long-settled principle of striving always to make the best, induced him at the outset to study methods of producing the highest quality of product. Thus he was led to originate innovations and processes, some of which had been preserved as trade secrets but of the others there are two deserving special notice, namely the accuracy of mixing and the fineness of grinding. In cement making, generally speaking, cement rock and limestone in the rough are mixed together in such relative quantities as may be determined upon in advance by chemical analysis. In many plants this mixture is made by barrow or load units and may be more or less accurate. Rule of thumb methods are never acceptable to Edison, and he devised, therefore, a system of weighing each part of the mixture so that it would be correct to a pound, and even at that made the device foolproof, for as he observed to one of his associates, the man at the scales might get to thinking of the other fellow's best girl, so fifty or a hundred pounds of rock, more or less, wouldn't make much difference to him. The Edison checking plan embraces two hoppers suspended above two platform scales, whose beams are electrically connected with a hopper closing device by means of needles dipping into mercury cups. The scales are set according to the chemist's weighing orders, and the material is fed into the scales from the hoppers. The instant the beam tips, the connection is broken, and the feed stops instantly, thus rendering it impossible to introduce any more material until the charge has been unloaded. 
The fine grinding of cement clinker is distinctly Edisonian in both origin and application. As has already been intimated, its author followed a thorough course of reading on the subject long before reaching the actual projection or installation of a plant, and he had found all authorities to agree on one important point, namely that the value of cement depends upon the fineness to which it is ground. He also ascertained that in the trade the standard of fineness was that of 75% of the whole mass would pass through a 200 mesh screen. Having made some improvements in his grinding and screening apparatus, and believing that in the future engineers, builders, and contractors would eventually require a higher degree of fineness, he determined in advance of manufacturing to raise the standard 10 points so that at least 75% of his product should pass through a 200 mesh screen. This was a bold step to be taken by a newcomer, but his judgment, backed by a full confidence and ability to live up to the standard, has been fully justified in its continued maintenance, despite the early incredulity of older manufacturers as to the possibility of attaining such a high degree of fineness. Begin footnote. For a proper understanding and full appreciation of the importance of fine grinding, it may be explained that Portland cement, as manufactured in the Lehigh Valley, is made from what is commonly spoken of as cement rock, with the addition of sufficient limestone to give the necessary amount of lime. The rock is broken down and then ground to a fineness of 80 to 90 percent through a 200 mesh screen. This ground material passes through kilns and comes out in clinker. This is ground, and that part of that finely ground clinker that will pass a 200 mesh screen is cement. The residue is still clinker. These coarse particles, or clinkers, absorb water very slowly, are practically inert, and have very feeble cementing properties. The residue on a 200 mesh screen is useless. End footnote. If Edison measured his happiness, as men often do, by merely commercial or pecuniary rewards of success, it would seem almost redundant to state that he has continued to manifest an intense interest in the cement plant. Ordinarily, his interest as an inventor wanes in proportion to the approach to mere commercialism. In other words, the keenness of his pleasure is in overcoming difficulties, rather than the mere piling up of a bank account. He is entirely sensible of the advantages arising from a good balance at the bankers, but that has not been the goal of his ambition. Hence, although his cement enterprise reached the commercial stage a long time ago, he has been firmly convinced of his own ability to devise still further improvements and economical processes of greater or less fundamental importance, and has, therefore, made a constant study of the problem as a whole and in all its parts. By means of frequent reports, aided by his remarkable memory, he keeps in as close touch with the plant as if he were there in person every day, and is thus enabled to suggest improvement in any particular detail. The engineering force has a great respect for the accuracy of his knowledge of every part of the plant, for he remembers the dimensions of details of every item of machinery, sometimes to the discomfiture of those who are around it every day. A noteworthy instance of Edison's memory occurred in connection with this cement plant. Some years ago, as its installation was nearing completion, he went up to look it over and satisfy himself as to what needed to be done. On the arrival of the train at 10.40 in the morning, he went to the mill, and with Mr. Mason, the general superintendent, started the crusher at one end and examined every detail all the way through to the packing house at the other end. He made neither notes nor memoranda, but the examination required all the day, which happened to be a Saturday. He took a train for home at 5.30 in the afternoon, and on arriving at his residence at Orange, got out some notebooks and began to write entirely from memory each item consecutively. He continued at this task all through Saturday night, and worked steadily on until Saturday afternoon, when he completed a list of nearly 600 items. 
The nature of this feat is more appreciable from the fact that a large number of changes included all the figures of new dimensions he had decided upon for some of the machinery throughout the plant. As the reader may have a natural curiosity to learn whether or not the list so made was practical, it may be stated that it was copied and sent up to the general superintendent with instructions to make the modifications suggested and report by numbers as they were attended to. This was faithfully done, all the changes being made before the plant was put into operation. Subsequent experience has amply proven the value of Edison's prescience at this time. Although Edison's achievements in the way of improved processes and machinery have already made a deep impression in the cement industry, it is probable that this impression will become still more profoundly stamped upon it in the near future with the exploitation of his poured cement house. The broad problem which he sets himself was to provide handsome and practically indestructible detached houses, which could be taken by wage earners at very moderate monthly rentals. He turned this question over his mind for several years, and arrived at the conclusion that a house cast in one piece would be the answer. To produce such a house involved the overcoming of many engineering and other technical difficulties. These he attacked vigorously and disposed of patiently one by one. In this connection, a short anecdote may be quoted from Edison as indicative of one of the influences turning his thoughts in this direction. In the story of the ore milling work, it has been noted that the plant was shut down owing to the competition of the cheap ore from the Masaba range. Edison says, When I shut down, the insurance companies canceled my insurance. I asked the reason why. Oh, they said, This thing is a failure. The moral risk is too high. All right, I am glad to hear it. I will now construct buildings that won't have any moral risk. I determined to go into the Portland cement business. I organized a company and started cement works, which have now been running successfully for several years. I had so perfected the machinery in trying to get my ore costs down that the making of cheap cement was an easy matter to me. I built these works entirely of concrete and steel, so that there is not a wagon load of lumber in them, and so that the insurance companies would not have any possibility of having any moral risk. Since that time, I have put up numerous factory buildings, all of steel and concrete, without any combustible whatever about them, to avoid this moral risk. I am carrying further the application of this idea in building private houses for poor people, in which there will be no moral risk at all, nothing whatever to burn, not even by lightning. As a casting necessitates a mold, together with a mixture sufficiently fluid in its nature to fill all of the interstices completely, Edison devoted much attention to an extensive series of experiments for producing a free-flowing combination of necessary materials. His proposition was against all precedent. All expert testimony pointed to the fact that a mixture of concrete, cement, sand, crushed stone, and water, could not be made to flow freely to the smallest parts of an intricate set of molds, that the heavy parts of the mixture could not be held in suspension, but would separate out by gravity and make an unevenly balanced structure, that the surface would be full of imperfections, etc. Undeterred by the unanimity of adverse opinions, however, he pursued his investigations with the thorough minuteness that characterizes all his laboratory work and in due time produced a mixture which on elaborate test overcame all objections and answered the complex requirements perfectly, including the making of a surface smooth, even, and entirely waterproof. All the other engineering problems have received study in like manner and have been overcome, until at the present writing the whole question is practically solved and has been reduced to actual practice. The Edison poured or cast cement house may be reckoned as a reality. The general scheme, briefly outlined, is to prepare a model and plans of the house to be cast, 
and then to design a set of molds in sections of convenient size. When all is ready, these molds, which are of cast iron with smooth interior surfaces, are taken to the place where the house is to be erected. Here there has been provided a solid concrete cellar floor, technically called footing. The molds are then locked together so that they rest on this footing. Hundreds of pieces are necessary for the complete set. When they have been completely assembled, there will be a hollow space in the interior, representing the shape of the house. Reinforcing rods are also placed in the molds, to be left behind in the finished house. Next comes the pouring of the concrete mixture into this form. Large mechanical mixers are used, and as it is made, the mixture is dumped into tanks, from which it is conveyed to a distributing tank on the top, or roof of the form. From this tank, a large number of open troughs or pipes lead the mixture to various openings in the roof, whence it flows down and fills all parts of the mold from the footing in the basement until it overflows at the tip of the roof. The pouring of the entire house is accomplished in about six hours, and then the molds are left undisturbed for six days, in order that the concrete may set and harden. After that time, the work of taking away the molds is begun. This requires three or four days. When the molds are taken away, an entire house is disclosed, cast in one piece, from cellar to tip of roof, complete with floors, interior walls, stairways, bath and laundry tubs, electric wire conduits, gas, water, and heating pipes. No plaster is used anywhere, but the exterior and interior walls are smooth and may be painted or tinted if desired. All that is now necessary is to put in the windows, doors, heater, and lighting fixtures, and to connect up the plumbing and heating arrangements, thus making the house ready for occupancy. As these wooden molds are not ephemeral, like the wooden framing now used in cement construction, but of practically illimitable life, it is obvious that they can be used a great number of times. A complete set of molds will cost approximately $25,000, while the necessary plant will cost about 15000 more. It is proposed to work as a unit plant for successful operation, at least six sets of molds, to keep the men busy and the machinery going. Anyone with a sheet of paper can ascertain the yearly interest on the investment as a fixed charge to be assessed against each house, on the basis that 144 houses can be built in a year with the battery of six sets of molds. Putting the sum at $175,000 and the interest at 6% on the cost of the molds, and 4% for breakage, together with 6% interest and 15% depreciation on machinery, the plant charge is approximately $140 per house. It does not require a particularly acute prophetic vision to see flower towns of poor houses going up in whole suburbs outside all our chief centers of population. Edison's conception of the working man's ideal house has been a broad one from the very start. He was not content merely to provide a roomy, moderately priced house that should be fireproof, waterproof, and verminproof, and practically indestructible, but has been solicitous to get away from the idea of a plain packing-box type. He has also provided for ornamentation of a high class in designing the details of the structure. As he expressed it, we will give the working man and his family ornamentation in their house. They deserve it, and besides, it costs no more after the pattern is made to give decorative effects than it would be to make everything plain. The plans have provided for a type of house that would cost not far from $30,000 if built from cut stone. He gave to Messrs. Mann and McNeely, architects, New York, his idea of the type of house he wanted. On receiving these plans, he changed them considerably and built a model. After making many more changes in this while in the pattern shop, he produced a house satisfactory to himself. 
This one family house has a floor plan twenty five by thirty feet and is three stories high. The first floor is divided off into two large rooms, parlor and living room, and the upper floors contain four large bedrooms, a roomy bathroom, and wide halls. The front porch extends eight feet and the back porch three feet. A cellar seven and a half feet high extends under the whole house and will contain the boiler, wash tubs, and coal bunker. It is intended that the house shall be built on lots forty by sixty feet, giving a lawn and a small garden. It is contemplated that these houses shall be built in industrial communities, where they can be put up in groups of several hundred. If erected in this manner, and by an operator buying his materials in large quantities, Edison believes that these houses can be erected complete, including heating apparatus and plumbing, for twelve hundred dollars each. This figure would also rest on the basis of using in the mixture the gravel excavated on the site. Comment has been made by persons of artistic taste on the monotony of a cluster of houses exactly alike in appearance, but this criticism has been anticipated, and the molds are so made as to be capable of permutations of arrangement. Thus, it will be possible to introduce almost endless changes in the style of house by variation of the same set of molds. For more than forty years, Edison was avowedly an inventor for purely commercial purposes. But within the last two years, he decided to retire from that field so far as new inventions were concerned, and to devote himself to scientific research and experiment in the leisure hours that might remain after continuing to improve his existing devices. But although the poured cement house was planned during the commercial period, the spirit in which it was conceived arose out of an earnest desire to place within the reach of the wage earner an opportunity to better his physical, pecuniary, and mental conditions, in so far as that could be done through the medium of hygienic and beautiful homes at moderate rentals. From the first, Edison had declared that it was not his intention to benefit pecuniarily through the exploitation of this project. Having actually demonstrated the practicability and feasibility of his plans, he will allow reasonable concerns to carry themselves into practice under such limitations as may be necessary to sustain the basic object, but without any payment to him except for the actual expense incurred. The hypercritical make a vil and say that, as a manufacturer of cement, Edison will be benefited. True, but as any good Portland cement can be used, and no restrictions as to source of supply are enforced, he, or rather his company, will be merely one of the possible purveyors. This invention is practically a gift to the working men of the world and their families. The net result will be that those who care to avail themselves of the privilege may, sooner or later, forsake the crowded apartment or tenement and be comfortably housed in sanitary, substantial, and roomy homes fitted with modern conveniences and beautified by artistic decorations, with no outlay for insurance or repairs, no dread of fire, and all at a rental which Edison believes will be not more, but probably less than, ten dollars per month in any city of the United States. While his achievement in its present status will bring about substantial and immediate benefits to wage earners, his thoughts have already traveled some years ahead in the formation of a still further beneficial project, looking toward the individual ownership of these houses on a basis startling in its practical possibilities. Chapter 21 of Edison, His Life and Inventions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California Edison 
His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 21 Motion Pictures The preceding chapters have treated of Edison in various aspects as an inventor, some of which are familiar to the public, others of which are believed to be in the nature of a novel revelation, simply because no one had taken the trouble before to put the facts together. To those who have perhaps grown weary of seeing Edison's name in articles of a sensational character, it may sound strange to say that, after all, justice has not been done to his versatile and many-sided nature, and that the mere prosaic facts of his actual achievement outrun the wildest flights of irrelevant journalistic imagination. Edison hates nothing more than to be dubbed a genius or played up as a wizard. But this fate has dogged him, until he has come at last to resign himself to it with a resentful indignation only to be appreciated when watching him read the latest full-page Sunday spread that develops a casual conversation into oracular verbosity, and gives to his shrewd surmise the cast of inspired prophecy. In other words, Edison's real work has seldom been seriously discussed. Rather has it been taken as a point of departure into a realm of fancy and romance, where, as a relief from drudgery, he is sometimes quite willing to play the pipe, if someone will dance to it. Indeed, the stories woven around his casual suggestions are tame and vapid alongside his own essays in fiction, probably never to be published, but which show what a real inventor can do when he cuts loose to create a new heaven and a new earth, unrestrained by any formal respect for existing conditions of servitude to three dimensions and the standard elements. The present chapter, essentially technical in its subject matter, is perhaps as significant as any in this biography, because it presents Edison as the master impresario of his age, and maybe of many following ages also. His phonographs and his motion pictures have more audiences in a week than all the theaters in America in a year. The Nickelodeon is the central fact in modern amusement, and Edison founded it. All that millions know of music and drama he furnishes, and the whole study of the theatrical managers thus reaching the masses is not to ascertain the limitations of the new art, but to discover its boundless possibilities. None of the exuberant versions of things Edison has not done could endure for a moment with the simple narrative of what he has really done as the world's new purveyor of pleasure. And yet it all depends on the toilful conquest of a subtle and intricate art. The story of the invention of the phonograph has been told. That of the evolution of motion pictures follows. It is all one piece of sober, careful analysis and stubborn, successful attack on the problem. The possibility of making a record of animate movement, and subsequently reproducing it, was predicted long before the actual accomplishment. 
This, as we have seen, was also the case with the phonograph, the telephone, and the electric light. As to the phonograph, the prediction went only so far as the result. The apparent intricacy of the problem being so great that the means for accomplishing the desired end were seemingly beyond the grasp of the imagination or the mastery of invention. With the electric light and the telephone, the prediction included not only the result to be accomplished, but, in a rough and general way, the mechanism itself. That is to say, long before a single sound was intelligibly transmitted, it was recognized that such a thing might be done, by causing a diaphragm, vibrated by original sounds, to communicate its movements to a distant diaphragm by a suitably controlled electric current. In the case of the electric light, the heating of a conductor to incandescence in a highly rarefied atmosphere was suggested as a scheme of illumination long before its actual accomplishment, and in fact, before the production of a suitable generator for delivering electric current in a satisfactory and economical manner. It is a curious fact that, while the modern art of motion pictures depends essentially on the development of instantaneous photography, the suggestion of the possibility of securing a reproduction of animate motion as well as, in a general way, of the mechanism for accomplishing the result, was made many years before the instantaneous photograph became possible. While the first motion picture was not actually produced until the summer of 1889, its real birth was almost a century later, when Plateau, in France, constructed an optical toy, to which the impressive name of Fina Kistoscope was applied, for producing an illusion of motion. This toy, in turn, was the forerunner of the zoetrope, or so-called Wheel of Life, which was introduced into this country about the year 1845. These devices were essentially toys, depending for their successful operation, as is the case with motion pictures, upon a physiological phenomenon known as persistence of vision. If, for instance, a bright light is moved rapidly in front of the eye in a dark room, it appears not as an illuminated spark, but as a line of fire a so-called shooting star, or a flash of lightning, produces the same effect. This result is purely physiological, and is due to the fact that the retina of the eye may be considered as, practically, a sensitized plate of relatively slow speed, and an image impressed upon it remains, before being effaced, for a period of from one-tenth to one-seventh of a second, varying according to the idiosyncrasies of the individual and the intensity of the light. When, therefore, it is said that we should only believe things we actually see, we ought to remember that in almost every instance we never see things as they are. Bearing in mind the fact that when an image is impressed on the human retina, it persists for an appreciable period, varying, as stated, with the individual, and depending also upon the intensity of the illumination, it will be seen that, if a number of pictures or photographs are successively presented to the eye, they will appear as a single, continuous photograph, provided the periods between them are short enough to prevent one of the photographs from being effaced before its successor is presented. 
If, for instance, a series of identical portraits were rapidly presented to the eye, a single picture would apparently be viewed. Or, if we presented to the eye the series of photographs of a moving object, each one representing a minute successive phase of the movement, the movements themselves would apparently again take place. With the zoetrope and similar toys, rough drawings were used for depicting a few broadly outlined successive phases of movement, because in their day instantaneous photography was unknown, and, in addition, there were certain crudities of construction that seriously interfered with the illumination of the pictures, rendering it necessary to make them, practically, as silhouettes on a very conspicuous background. Hence, it will be obvious that these toys produced merely an illusion of theoretical motion. But with the knowledge of even an illusion of motion, and with the philosophy of persistence of vision fully understood, it would seem that, upon the development of instantaneous photography, the reproduction of actual motion by means of pictures would have followed, almost as a necessary consequence. Yet such was not the case, and success was ultimately accomplished by Edison only after persistent experimenting along lines that could not have been predicted, including the construction of apparatus for the purpose, which, if it had not been made, would undoubtedly be considered impossible. In fact, if it were not for Edison's peculiar mentality that refuses to recognize anything as impossible until indubitably demonstrated to be so, the production of motion pictures would certainly have been delayed for years, if not for all time. One of the earliest suggestions of the possibility of utilizing photography for exhibiting the illusion of actual movement was made by Ducos, who, as early as 1864, obtained a patent in France, in which he said, quote, My invention consists in substituting rapidly and without confusion to the eye, not only of an individual, but, when so desired, of a whole assemblage, the enlarged images of a great number of pictures, when taken instantaneously and successively at very short intervals. The observer will believe that he sees only one image, which changes gradually by reason of the successive changes of form and position of the objects which occur from one picture to the other. Even supposing that there be a slight interval of time during which the same object was not shown, the persistence of the luminous impression upon the eye will fill the scap. There will be, as it were, a living representation of nature and the same scene will be reproduced upon the screen with the same degree of animation. By means of my apparatus, I am enabled especially to reproduce the passing of a procession, a review of military maneuvers, the movements of a battle, a public fete, a theatrical scene, the evolution of the dances of one or of several persons, the changing expression of countenance, or, if one desires, the grimaces of a human face, a marine view, the motion of waves, the passage of clouds in a stormy sky, particularly in a mountainous country, the eruption of a volcano, End of quote, etc. 
Other dreamers, contemporaries of Ducos, made similar suggestions. They recognized the scientific possibility of the problem, but they were irretrievably handicapped by the shortcomings of photography. Even when substantially instantaneous photographs were evolved at a somewhat later date, they were limited to the use of wet plates, which have to be prepared by the photographer and used immediately, and were therefore quite out of the question for any practical commercial scheme. Besides this, the use of plates would have been impracticable, because the limitations of their weight and size would have prevented the taking of a large number of pictures at a high rate of speed, even if the sensitized surface had been sufficiently rapid. Nothing ever came of Ducos's suggestions, and those of the early dreamers in this essentially practical and commercial art, and their ideas have made no greater impress upon the final result than Jules Verne's Nautilus of our boyhood days has developed the modern submarine. From time to time further suggestions were made, some in patents and others in photographic and scientific publications, all dealing with the fascinating thought of preserving and representing actual scenes and events. The first serious attempt to secure an illusion of motion by photography was made in 1878 by Edward Mewbridge as a result of a wager with the late Senator Leland Stanford, the California pioneer and horse lover, who had asserted, contrary to the usual belief, that a trotting horse at one point in its gait left the ground entirely. At this time wet plates of very great rapidity were known, and, by arranging a series of cameras along the line of a track, in causing the horse, in trotting past them, by striking wires or strings attached to the shutters, to activate the cameras at the right instant. A series of very clear instantaneous photographs were obtained, from these negatives, when developed, positive prints were made, which were later mounted on a modified form of zoetrope and projected upon a screen. One of these early exhibitions is described in the Scientific American of June 5, 1880. Quote, While the separate photographs had shown the successive positions of a trotting or running horse, in making a single stride, the zoogyroscope threw upon the screen, apparently, the living animal. Nothing was wanting but the clatter of hooves upon the turf, and an occasional breath of steam from the nostrils, to make the spectator believe that he had before him genuine flesh and blood steeds. In the views of hurdle leaping, the simulation was still more admirable, even to the motion of the tail, as the animal gathered for the jump, the raising of his head, all were there. Views of an ox trotting, a wild bull on the charge, greyhounds and deer running, and birds flying in mid-air were shown. Also, athletes in various positions. Close quote. It must not be assumed from this statement that, even as late as the work of Mewbridge, anything like a true illusion of movement had been obtained, because such was not the case. Mewbridge secured only one cycle of movement, because a separate camera had to be used for each photograph, and consequently each cycle was reproduced over and over again. To have made photographs of a trotting horse for one minute at the moderate rate of twelve per second would have required, under the Mewbridge scheme, 
seven hundred and twenty separate cameras, whereas with the modern art only a single camera is used. A further defect with the Mewbridge pictures was that since each photograph was secured when the moving object was in the center of the plate, the reproduction showed the object always centrally on the screen, with its arms or legs in violent movement, but not making any progress, and with the scenery rushing wildly across the field of view. In the early eighties the dry plate was first introduced into general use, and from that time onward its rapidity and quality were gradually improved, so much so that, after 1882, Professor E. J. Mary of the French Academy, who, in 1874, had published a well-known treatise on animal movement, was able by the use of dry plates to carry forward the experiments of Muybridge on a greatly refined scale. Mary was, however, handicapped by reason of the fact that glass plates were still used, although he was able, with a single camera, to obtain twelve photographs on successive plates in the space of one second. Mary, like Mewbridge, photographed only one cycle of the movements of a single object, which was subsequently reproduced over and over again, and the camera was in the form of a gun which could follow the object, so that the successive pictures would be always located in the center of the plates. The review above given, as briefly as possible, comprises substantially the sum of the world's knowledge at the time the problem of recording and reproducing animate movement was first undertaken by Edison. The most that could be said of the condition of the art when Edison entered the field was that it had been recognized that if a series of instantaneous photographs of a moving object could be secured at an enormously high rate, many times per second, they might be passed before the eye, either directly or by projection upon a screen, and thereby result in a reproduction of the movements. Two very serious difficulties lay in the way of actual accomplishment, however. First, the production of a sensitive surface in such form and weight as to be capable of being successively brought into position and exposed at the necessarily high rate. And second, the production of a camera capable of so taking the pictures. There were numerous other workers in the field, but they added nothing to what had already been proposed. Edison himself knew nothing of Ducot, or that the suggestions had advanced beyond the single centrally located photographs of Muybridge and Mary. As a matter of public policy, the law presumes that an inventor must be familiar with all that has gone before in the field within which he is working. And, if a suggestion is limited to a patent granted in New South Wales, or is described in a single publication in Brazil, an inventor in America, engaged in the same field of thought, is by legal fiction, presumed to have knowledge not only of the existence of that patent or publication, but of its contents. We say this not in the way of an apology for the extent of Edison's contribution to the motion picture art, because there can be no question that he was as much the creator of that art as he was of the phonographic art, but to show that in a practical sense, the suggestion of the art itself was original with him. He himself says, quote, In the year 1887, the idea occurred to me that it was possible to devise an instrument which 
should do for the eye what the phonograph does for the ear, and that by a combination of the two, all motion and sound could be recorded and reproduced simultaneously. This idea, the germ of which came from the little toy called the zoetrope, and the work of Mewbridge, Mary, and others, has now been accomplished, so that every change of facial expression can be recorded and reproduced life-size. The kinetoscope is only a small model illustrating the present stage of the progress, but with each succeeding month new possibilities are brought into view. I believe that in coming years, by my own work and that of Dixon, Mewbridge, Mary, and others, who will doubtless enter the field, grand opera can be given at the Metropolitan Opera House at New York, without any material change from the original, and with artists and musicians long since dead. End of quote. In the earliest experiments, attempts were made to secure the photographs, reduced microscopically, arranged spirally on a cylinder about the size of a phonograph record, and coated with a highly sensitive surface, the cylinder being given an intermittent movement, so as to be at rest during each exposure. Reproductions were obtained in the same way, positive prints being observed through a magnifying glass. Various forms of apparatus following this general type were made, but they were all open to the serious objection that the very rapid emulsions employed were relatively coarse-grained, and prevented the securing of sharp pictures of microscopic size. On the other hand, the enlarging of the apparatus to permit larger pictures to be obtained would present too much weight to be stopped and started with the requisite rapidity. In these early experiments, however, it was recognized that to secure proper results a single camera should be used, so that the objects might move across its field just as they move across the field of the human eye. And the important fact was also observed that the rate at which persistence of vision took place represented the minimum speed at which the pictures should be obtained. If, for instance, five pictures per second were taken, half of the time being occupied in exposure and the other half in moving the exposed portion of the film out of the field of the lens and bringing a new portion into its place, and the same ratio is observed in exhibiting the pictures, the interval of time between successive pictures would be one-tenth of a second, and for a normal eye such an exhibition would present a substantially continuous photograph. If the angular movement of the object across the field is very slow, as for instance a distant vessel, the successive positions of the object are so nearly coincident that when reproduced before the eye, an impression of smooth, continuous movement is secured. If, however, the object is moving rapidly across the field of view, one picture will be separated from its successor to a marked extent, and the resulting impression will be jerky and unnatural. Recognizing this fact, Edison always sought for a very high speed, so as to give smooth and natural reproductions, and even with his experimental apparatus, obtained upward of forty-eight pictures per second, whereas in practice, at the present time, the accepted rate varies between twenty and thirty per second. In the efforts of the present day to economize space by using a minimum length of film, Pictures are frequently taken at too slow a rate, and the reproductions are therefore often objectionable, by
by reason of more or less jerkiness. During the experimental period, and up to the early part of 1889, the Kodak film was being slowly developed by the Eastman Kodak Company. Edison perceived in this product the solution of the problem on which he had been working, because the film presented a very light body of tough material on which relatively large photographs could be taken at rapid intervals. The surface, however, was not at first sufficiently sensitive to admit of sharply defined pictures being secured at the necessarily high rates. It seemed apparent, therefore, that in order to obtain the desired speed, there would have to be sacrificed that fineness of emulsion necessary for the securing of sharp pictures. But, as was subsequently seen, this sacrifice was in time rendered unnecessary. Much credit is due the Eastman experts. Stimulated and encouraged by Edison, but independently of him, for the production at last of a highly sensitive, fine-grained emulsion presenting the highly sensitized surface that Edison sought. Having at last obtained, apparently, the proper material upon which to secure the photographs, the problem then remained to devise an apparatus by means of which from twenty to forty pictures per second could be taken, the film being stationary during the exposure, and, upon the closing of the shutter, being moved to present a fresh surface. In connection with this problem, it is interesting to note that this question of high speed was apparently regarded by all Edison's predecessors as the crucial point. Ducos, for example, expended a great deal of useless ingenuity in devising a camera by means of which a tape-line film could receive the photographs, while being in continuous movement, necessitating the use of a series of moving lenses. Another experimenter, Dumont, made use of a single large plate and a great number of lenses, which were successively exposed. Mewbridge, as we have seen, used a series of cameras, one for each plate. Mary was limited to very few photographs, because the entire surface had to be stopped and started in connection with each exposure. After the accomplishment of the fact, it would seem to be the obvious thing to use a single lens and move the sensitized film with respect to it, intermittently bringing the surface to rest, then exposing it, then cutting off the light and moving the surface to a fresh position. But who, other than Edison, would assume that such a device could be made to repeat these movements over and over again at the rate of twenty to forty per second. Users of Kodaks and other forms of film cameras will appreciate, perhaps better than others, the difficulties of the problem, because in their work, after an exposure, they have to advance the film forward painfully to the extent of the next picture before another exposure can take place, these operations permitting of speeds of but a few pictures per minute at best. Edison's solution of the problem involved the production of a Kodak in which from twenty to forty pictures should be taken in each second, and with such fineness of adjustment that each should exactly coincide with its predecessors, even when subjected to the test of enlargement by projection. This, however, was finally accomplished, and in the summer of 1889 the first modern motion-picture camera was made. 
More than this, the mechanism for operating the film was so constructed that the movement of the film took place in one-tenth of the time required for the exposure, giving the film an opportunity to come to rest prior to the opening of the shutter. From that day to this, the Edison camera has been the accepted standard for securing pictures of objects in motion, and such changes as have been made in it have been purely in the nature of detailed mechanical refinements. The earliest form of exhibiting apparatus, known as the kinetoscope, was a machine in which a positive print from the negative obtained in the camera was exhibited directly to the eye through a peephole. But in 1895 the films were applied to modified forms of magic lanterns, by which the images are projected upon a screen. Since that date the industry has developed very rapidly, and at the present time, 1910, all of the principal American manufacturers of motion pictures are paying a royalty to Edison under his basic patents. From the early days of pictures representing simple movements, such as a man sneezing or a skirt dance, there has been a gradual evolution until now the pictures represent not only actual events in all their palpitating instantaneity, but highly developed dramas and scenarios enacted in large, well-equipped glass studios, and the result of infinite pains and expense of production. These pictures are exhibited in upward of 8,000 places of amusement in the United States, and are witnessed by millions of people each year. They constitute a cheap, clean form of amusement for many persons who cannot spare the money to go to the ordinary theaters, or they may be exhibited in towns that are too small to support a theater. More than this, they offer to the poor man an effective substitute for the saloon. Probably no invention ever made has afforded more pleasure and entertainment than the motion picture. Aside from the development of the motion picture as a spectacle, there has gone on an evolution in its use for educational purposes of wide range, which must not be overlooked. In fact, this form of utilization has been carried further in Europe than in this country as a means of demonstration in the arts and sciences. One may study animal life, watch a surgical operation, follow the movement of machinery, take lessons in facial expression or in calisthenics. It seems a pity that in motion pictures should at last have been found the only competition that the ancient marionettes cannot withstand. But aside from the disappearance of those entertaining puppets, all else is gain in the creation of this new art. The work at the Edison Laboratory in the development of the motion picture was, as usual, intense and concentrated, and, as might be expected, many of the early experiments were quite primitive in their character, until command had been secured of relatively perfect apparatus. The subjects, registered jerkily by the films, were crude and amusing, such as of Fred Ott's sneeze, Carmencita dancing, Italians and their performing bears, fencing, trapeze stunts, horsemanship, blacksmithing, just simple movements without any attempt to portray the silent drama. One curious incident of this early study occurred when Jim Corbett was asked to box a few rounds in front of the camera, with a darken to be selected locally. 
This was agreed to, and a celebrated bruiser was brought over from Newark. When this sparring partner came to face Corbett in the imitation ring, he was so paralyzed with terror he could hardly move. It was just after Corbett had won one of his biggest battles as a prize-fighter, and the dismay of his opponent was excusable. The boys at the laboratory still laugh consumedly when they tell about it. The first motion-picture studio was dubbed by the staff the Black Maria. It was an unpretentious oblong wooden structure erected in the laboratory yard, and had a movable roof in the central part. This roof could be raised or lowered at will. The building was covered with black roofing paper, and was also painted black inside. There was no scenery to render gay this lugubrious environment, but the black interior served as the common background for the performers, throwing all their actions into high relief. The whole structure was set on a pivot so that it could be swung around the sun, and the movable roof was opened so that the accentuating sunlight could stream in upon the actor whose gesticulations were being caught by the camera. These beginnings and crudities are very remote from the elaborate and expensive paraphernalia and machinery with which the art is furnished today. At the present time, the studios in which motion pictures are taken are expensive and pretentious affairs. An immense building of glass, with all the properties and stage settings of a regular theater, is required. The Bronx Park studio of the Edison Company cost at least one hundred thousand dollars, while the well-known house of Pate Frere in France, one of Edison's licensees, makes use of no fewer than seven of these glass theaters. All of the larger producers of pictures in this country and abroad employ regular stock companies of actors, men and women selected specially for their skill in pantomime, although, as most observers have perhaps suspected, in the actual taking of the pictures, the performers are required to carry on an animated and prepared dialogue with the same spirit and animation as on the regular stage. Before setting out on the preparation of a picture, the book is first written, known in the business as a scenario, giving a complete statement as to the scenery, drops, and background, and the sequence of events, divided into scenes as in an ordinary play. These are placed in the hands of a producer, corresponding to a stage director, generally an actor or theatrical man of experience, with a highly developed dramatic instinct. The various actors are selected, parts are assigned, and the scene painters are set to work on the production of the desired scenery. Before the photographing of a scene, a long series of rehearsals takes place, the incidents being gone over and over again until the actors are letter-perfect. So persistent are the producers in the matter of rehearsals, and the refining and elaboration of details, that frequently a picture that may be actually photographed and reproduced in fifteen minutes may require two or three weeks for its production. After the rehearsal of a scene has advanced sufficiently, to suit the critical requirements of the producer, the cameraman is in requisition, and he is consulted as to the lighting so as to produce the required photographic effect. Preferably, of course, sunlight is used whenever possible, hence the glass studios. But on dark days, and when night work is necessary, artificial light of 
enormous candle power is used, either mercury arcs or ordinary arc lights of great size and number. Under all conditions, the light is properly screened and diffused to suit the critical eye of the cameraman. All being in readiness, the actual picture is taken, the actors going through their rehearsed parts, the producer standing out of the range of the camera, and with a megaphone to his lips, yelling out his instructions, imprecations, and approval, and the cameraman grinding at the crank of the camera, and securing the pictures at the rate of twenty or more per second making a faithful and permanent record of every movement and every change of facial expression. At the end of the scene, the negative is developed in the ordinary way, and is then ready for use in the printing of the positives for sale. When a further scene in the play takes place in the same setting, and without regard to its position in the plot, it is taken up, rehearsed and photographed in the same way, and afterward all the scenes are cemented together in the proper sequence, and form the complete negative. Frequently, therefore, in the production of a motion picture play, the first and the last scene may be taken successively, the only thing necessary being, of course, that after all is done, the various scenes should be arranged in their proper order. The frames, having served their purpose, now go back to the scene-painter for further use. All pictures are not taken in studios, because when light and weather permit, and proper surroundings can be secured outside, scenes can best be obtained with natural scenery, city streets, woods, and fields. The great drawback to the taking of pictures out of doors however, is the inevitable crowd, attracted by the novelty of the proceedings, which make the cameraman's life a torment by getting into the field of his instrument. The crowds are patient, however, and in one Edison picture, involving the blowing up of a bridge by the villain of the piece, and the substitution of a pontoon bridge by a company of engineers just in time to allow the heroine to pass over in her automobile, more than a thousand people stood around for almost an entire day, waiting for the tedious rehearsals to end and the actual performance to begin. Frequently large bodies of men are used in pictures, such as troops of soldiers, and it is an open secret that for weeks the Boer War regularly equipped British and Boer armies confronted each other on the peaceful hills of Orange, New Jersey, ready to enact before the camera the stirring events told by the cable from the seat of hostilities. These conflicts were essentially harmless, except in one case during the Battle of Spion Kopje, when General Kronje, in his efforts to fire a wooden cannon, inadvertently dropped his fuse into a large glass bottle containing gunpowder. The effect was certainly most dramatic, and created great enthusiasm among the many audiences which viewed the completed production but the unfortunate general, who is still an employee, was taken to the hospital, and even now, twelve years afterward, he says, with a grin, that whenever he has a moment of leisure, he takes the time to pick a few pieces of glass from his person. Edison's great contribution to the regular stage was the incandescent electric lamp, which enabled the production of scenic effects never before even dreamed of, but which we accept now with so much complacency. Yet, with the motion picture, effects are secured that 
could not be reproduced to the slightest extent on the real stage. The villain, overcome by a remorseful conscience, sees on the wall of the room the very crime which he committed, with himself as the principal actor, one of the easy effects of double exposure. The substantial and oft-times corpulent ghost or spirit of the real stage has been succeeded by an intangible wraith, as transparent and unsubstantial as may be demanded in the best book of fairy tales, more double exposure. A man emerges from the water with a splash, ascends feet foremost ten yards or more, makes a graceful curve, and lands on a springboard, runs down it to the bank, and his clothes fly gently up from the ground and enclose his person. All unthinkable in real life, but readily possible by running the motion picture film backward. The fairy prince commands the princess to appear, consigns the bad brothers to instant annihilation, turns the witch into a cat, confers life on inanimate things, and many more startling and apparently incomprehensible effects are carried out with actual reality by stop-work photography. In one case, when the command for the heroine to come forth is given, the camera is stopped, the young woman walks to the desired spot, and the camera is again started. The effect to the eye, not knowing of this little by-play, is as if she had instantly appeared from space. The other effects are perhaps obvious, and the field and opportunities are absolutely unlimited. Other curious effects are secured by taking the pictures at a different speed from that at which they are exhibited. If, for example, a scene occupying thirty seconds is reproduced in ten seconds, the movements will be three times as fast, and vice versa. Many scenes familiar to the reader, showing automobiles tearing along the road and rounding corners at an apparently reckless speed, are really pictures of slow and dignified movements reproduced at a high speed. Brief reference has been made to motion pictures of educational subjects, and in this field there are very great opportunities for development. The study of geography, scenes, and incidents in foreign countries, showing the lives and customs and surroundings of other peoples, is obviously more entertaining to the child when actively depicted on the screen than when merely described in words. The lives of great men, the enacting of important historical events, the reproduction of great works of literature, if visually presented to the child, must necessarily impress his mind with greater force than if shown by mere words. We predict that the time is not far distant when, in many of our public schools, two or three hours a week will be devoted to this rational and effective form of education. By applying microphotography to motion pictures, an additional field is opened up, one phase of which may be the study of germ life and bacteria, so that our future medical students may become as familiar with the habits and customs of the anthrax bacillus, for example, as of the domestic cat. From whatever point of view the subject is approached, the fact remains that in the motion picture, perhaps more than with any other invention, Edison has created an art that must always make a special appeal to the mind and emotions of men, and, although so far it has not advanced 
much beyond the field of amusement, it contains enormous possibilities for serious development in the future. Let us not think too lightly of the humble five-cent theatre with its gaping crowd, following with breathless interest the vicissitudes of the beautiful heroine. Before us lies an undeveloped land of opportunity, which is destined to play an important part in the growth and welfare of the human race. End of chapter 21 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California For LibriVox June 2008Chapter 22 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heidi Preuss. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 22 the development of the Edison storage battery. It is more than a hundred years since the elementary principle of the storage battery, or the accumulator, was detected by a Frenchman named Gautreau. It is just fifty years since another Frenchman named Plant discovered that on taking two thin plates of sheet lead, immersing them in dilute sulfuric acid, and passing an electric current through the cell, the combination exhibited the ability to give back part of the original charging current, owing to the chemical changes and reactions set up. Plant coiled up his sheets into a very handy cell, like a little roll of carpet or pastry, but the trouble was that the battery took a long time to form, one sheet becoming coated with lead peroxide, and the other with finely divided or spongy metallic lead. They would receive current, then, even after a long period of inaction, furnish or return an electromotive force from 1.85 to 2.2 volts. This ability to store up electrical energy produced by dynamos in hours otherwise idle, whether driven by steam, wind, or water, was a distinct advance in the art. But the sensational step was taken about 1880, when Faure in France and Brush in America broke away from the slow and weary process of forming the plates, and hit on clever methods of furnishing them ready-made, so to speak, by dabbing red lead into lead-grid plates, just as butter is spread on a slice of homemade bread. This brought the storage battery at once into use as a practical, manufactured piece of apparatus, and the world was captivated with the idea. The great English scientist, Sir William Thompson, went wild with enthusiasm when a Faure box of electricity was brought over from Paris to him in 1881, containing a million foot-pounds of stored energy. His biographer, Dr. Sylvanus P. Thompson, describes him as lying ill in bed with a wounded leg and watching results with an incandescent lamp fastened to his bed curtain by a safety pin and lit up by current from the little Faura cell. Said Sir William, It is going to be a most valuable, practical affair, as valuable as water cisterns to people whether they had or had not systems of water pipes and water supply. Indeed, in one outburst of panegyric, the shrewd physicist remarked that he saw in it a realization of the most ardently and increasingly felt scientific aspiration of his life, an aspiration 
which he hardly dared to expect or see realized. A little later, however, Sir William, always cautious and canny, began to discover the inherent defects of the primitive battery as to disintegration, inefficiency, costliness, etc., and though offered tempting inducements, declined to lend his name to its financial introduction. Nevertheless, he accepted the principle as valuable and put the battery to actual use. For many years after this episode, the modern lead-lead type of battery, thus brought forward with so great a flourish of trumpets, had a hard time of it. Edison's attitude toward it, even as a useful supplement to his lighting system, was always one of skepticism, and he remarked contemptuously that the best storage battery he knew was a ton of coal. The financial fortunes of the battery, on both sides of the Atlantic, was as varied and as disastrous as its industrial, but it did at last emerge, and made good. By 1905, the production of lead-lead storage batteries in the United States alone had reached a value for the year of nearly three million dollars, and it has increased greatly since that time. The storage battery is now regarded as an important and indispensable adjunct in nearly all modern electric lighting and electric railway systems of any magnitude, and in 1909, in spite of its weight, it had found adoption in over 10,000 automobiles of the truck, delivery wagon, pleasure carriage, and runabout types in America. Edison watched closely in this earlier development for about 15 years, not changing his mind as to what he regarded as the incurable defects of the lead-lead type, but coming gradually to the conclusion that if a storage battery of some other and better type could be brought forward, it would fulfill all the early hopes, however extravagant, of such men as Kelvin, Sir William Thompson, and would become as necessary and as universal as the incandescent lamp or the electric motor. The beginning of the present century found him at this point of new departure. Generally speaking, non-technical and uninitiated persons have a tendency to regard an invention as being more or less the ultimate result of some happy inspiration, and indeed, there is no doubt that such may be the fact in some instances. But in most cases, the inventor has intentionally set out to accomplish a definite and desired result, mostly through the application of the known laws of the art in which he happens to be working. It is rarely, however, that a man will start out deliberately, as Edison did, to evolve a radically new type of such intricate device as the storage battery, with only a meager clue and a vague starting point. In view of the successful outcome of the problem, which, in 1900, he undertook to solve, it will be interesting to review his mental attitude at that period. It has already been noted at the end of a previous chapter that on closing the magnetic iron ore concentrating plant at Edison, New Jersey, he resolved to work on a new type of storage battery. It was about this time that, in the course of a conversation with Mr. R. H. Beach, then of the Street Railway Department of the General Electric Company, he said, Beach, I don't think nature would be so unkind as to withhold the secret of a good storage battery if a real earnest hunt for it is made. I'm going to hunt. Frequently, Edison has been asked what he considers the secret of achievement. To this query, he has invariably replied, hard work, based on hard thinking. The laboratory records bear the fullest witness that he has consistently followed out this prescription to the utmost. The perfection of all his great inventions has been signalized by patient, persistent, and incessant effort, which, recognizing nothing short of success, has resulted in the ultimate accomplishment of his ideas. Optimistic and hopeful to a high degree, 
Edison has the happy faculty of beginning the day as open-minded as a child. Yesterday's disappointments and failures discarded and discounted by the alluring possibilities of tomorrow. Of all of his inventions, it is doubtful whether any one of them has called forth more original thought, work, perseverance, ingenuity, and monumental patience than the one we are now dealing with. One of his associates, who has been through the many years of the storage battery drudgery with him, said, If Edison's experiments, investigations, and work on this storage battery were all that he had ever done, I should say that he was not only a notable inventor, but also a great man. It's almost impossible to appreciate the enormous difficulties that have been overcome. From a beginning, which was practically made in the dark, it was not until he had completed more than 10,000 experiments that he obtained any positive preliminary results whatever. Through all this vast amount of research, there had been no previous signs of the electrical action he was looking for. These experiments had extended over many months of constant work by day and night. But there was no breakdown of Edison's faith in ultimate success, no diminution of his sanguine and confident expectations. The failure of an experiment simply meant to him that he had found something else that would not work, thus bringing the impossible goal a little nearer by a process of painstaking elimination. Now, however, after these many months of arduous toil, in which he had examined and tested practically all the known elements in numerous chemical combinations, the electric action he sought for had been obtained, thus affording him the first inkling of the secret that he had industriously tried to wrest from nature. It should be borne in mind that from the very outset Edison had disdained any intention of following in the only tracks then known by employing lead and sulfuric acid as the components of a successful storage battery. Impressed with what he considered the serious inherent defects of batteries made of these materials, and the tremendously complex nature of the chemical reactions taking place in all types of such cells, he determined boldly at the start that he would devise a battery without lead, and one in which an alkaline solution could be used, a form which would, he firmly believed, be inherently less subject to decay and dissolution than the standard type, which, after many setbacks, had finally won its way to an annual production of many thousands of cells worth millions of dollars. Two or three thousand of the first experiments followed the lines of his well-known primary battery in the attempted employment of copper oxide as an element in a new type of storage cell. But its use offered no advantages, and the hunt was continued in other directions and pursued until Edison satisfied himself by a vast number of experiments that nickel and iron possessed the desirable qualifications he was in search of. This immense amount of investigation, which had consumed so many months of time, and which had culminated in the discovery of a series of reactions between nickel and iron that bore great promise, brought Edison merely within sight of a strange and hitherto unexplored country, Slowly but surely, the results of the last few thousands of his preliminary experiments had pointed inevitably to a new and fruitful region ahead. He had discovered the hidden passage and held the clue which he had so industriously sought. And now, having outlined a definite path, Edison was all afire to push ahead vigorously in order that he might enter in and possess the land. It is a trite saying that history repeats itself, and certainly no axiom carries more truth than this when applied to the history of each of Edison's important inventions. The development of the storage battery has been no exception, indeed, far from otherwise, for in the ten years that have elapsed since the time he set himself and his mechanics, chemists, machinists, and experimenters at work to develop a practical commercial cell, 
the old story of incessant and persistent efforts so manifest in the working out of other inventions was fully repeated. Very soon after he had decided upon the use of nickel and iron as the elemental metals for his storage battery, Edison established a chemical plant at Silver Lake, New Jersey, a few miles from the Orange Laboratory, on land purchased some time previously. This place was the scene of further experiments to develop the various chemical forms of nickel and iron, and to determine by tests what would be best adapted for use in cells manufactured on a commercial scale. With a little handful of selected experimenters gathered about him, Edison settled down to one of his characteristic struggles for supremacy. To some extent it was a revival of the old Menlo Park days, or rather, nights. Some of these who had worked on the preliminary experiments, with the addition of a few newcomers, toiled together, regardless of passing time, and often under most discouraging circumstances. But with that remarkable esprit de corps that has ever marked Edison's relations with his co-workers, and that has contributed so largely to the successful carrying out of his ideas. The group that took part in these early years of Edison's arduous labors included his old-time assistant, Fred Ott, together with his chemist, J. W. Alsworth, as well as E. J. Ross, Jr., W. E. Holland, and Ralph Abergast, and a little later, W. G. B., all of whom have grown up with the battery and still devote their energies to its commercial development. One of these workers, relating the strenuous experiences of these few years, says, It was hard work and long hours, but still there were some things that made life pleasant. One of them was the supper hour we enjoyed when we worked nights. Mr. Edison would have supper sent in about midnight, and we all sat down together, including himself. Work was forgotten for the time, and all hands were ready for fun. I have very pleasant recollections of Mr. Edison at these times. He would always relax and help to make a good time, and then on some occasions I have seen him fairly overflow with animal spirits, just like a boy let out from school. After the supper hour was over, however, he again became a serious energetic inventor, deeply immersed in the work at hand. He was very fond of telling and hearing stories, and always appreciated a joke. I remember one that he liked to get off on us once in a while. Our lighting plant was in duplicate, and about twelve-thirty or one o'clock in the morning, at the close of the supper hour, a change would be made from one plant to the other, involving the gradual extinction of the electric lights and their slowly coming up to candle power again, the whole change requiring probably about thirty seconds. Sometimes, as this was taking place, Edison would fold his hands, compose himself as if he were in sound sleep, and when the lights were full again would apparently wake up with the remark, "'Well, boys, we've had a fine rest. Now let's pitch into work again.'" Another interesting and amusing reminiscence of this period of activity has been gathered from another of the family of experimenters. Sometimes, when Mr. Edison had been working long hours, he would want to have a short sleep. It was one of the funniest things I ever witnessed to see him crawl into an ordinary roll-top desk, curl up, and take a nap. If there was a sight that was still more funny, it was to see him turn over on his other side, all the time remaining in the desk. He would use several volumes of Watt's Dictionary of Chemistry for a pillow, and we fellows used to say that he absorbed the contents during his sleep, judging from the flow of new ideas he had on waking. Such incidents as these serve merely to illustrate the lighter moments that stand out in relief against the more somber background of the strenuous years, for of all the absorbingly busy periods of Edison's inventive life, the first five years of the storage battery era was one of the busiest of them all. 
It was not that there remained any basic principle to be discovered or simplified, for that had already been done, but it was in the effort to carry these principles into practice that there arose the numerous difficulties that at times seemed insurmountable. But according to another co-worker, Edison seemed pleased when he used to run up against a serious difficulty. It would seem to stiffen his backbone and make him more prolific of new ideas. For a time I thought I was foolish to imagine such a thing, but I could never get away from the impression that he really appeared happy when he ran up against a serious snag. That was in my green days, and I soon learned that the failure of an experiment never discourages him unless it is by reason of the carelessness of the man making it. Then Edison gets disgusted. If it fails on its merits, he doesn't worry or fret about it, but on the contrary regards it as a useful fact learned, remains cheerful, and tries something else. I have known him to reverse an unsuccessful experiment and come out all right. To follow Edison's trail in detail through the innumerable twists and turns of his experimentation and research on the storage battery during the past ten years, it would not be in keeping with the scope of this narrative, nor would it serve any useful purpose. Besides, such details would fill a big volume. The narrative, however, would not be complete without some mention of the general outline of his work, and reference may be made briefly to a few of the chief items. And lest the reader think that the word innumerable may have been carelessly or hastily used above, we would quote the reply of one of the laboratory assistants when asked how many experiments had been made on the Edison storage battery since the year 1900. Goodness only knows. We used to number our experiments consecutively from one to ten thousand, and when we got up to ten thousand, we turned back to one, and ran up to ten thousand again, and so on. We ran through several series. I don't know how many, and have lost track of them now, but it was not far from fifty thousand. From the very first, Edison's broad idea of his storage battery was to make perforated metallic containers having the active materials packed therein, nickel hydrate for the positive and iron oxide for the negative plate. This plan has been adhered to throughout and has found its consumption in the present form of the completed commercial cell, but in the middle ground which stands between the early crude beginnings and the perfected type of today, there lies a world of original thought, patient plotting, and achievement. The first necessity was naturally to obtain the best and purest compounds for active materials. Edison found that comparatively little was known by manufacturing chemists about nickel and iron oxides of the high grade and purity he required. Hence it became necessary for him to establish his own chemical works and put them in charge of men specifically trained by himself with whom he worked. This was the plant at Silver Lake, above referred to. Here, for several years, there was ceaseless activity in the preparation of these chemical compounds by every imaginable process and subsequent testing. Edison's chief chemist says, we left no stone unturned to find a way of making those chemicals so that they would give the highest results. We carried on the experiments with the two chemicals together. Sometimes the nickel would be ahead in the tests, and then again it would fall behind. To stimulate us to greater improvement, Edison hung up a card which showed the results of tests in milliampere hours given by the experimental elements as we tried them with the various grades of nickel and iron we had made. This stirred up a great deal of ambition among the boys to push the figures up. Some of our earliest tests showed around 300, but as we improved the material, they gradually crept up to over 500. Just about that time, Edison had made a trip to Canada, and when he came back, we had made such good progress that the figures had crept up to about 1,000. I well remember how greatly he was pleased. 
In speaking of the development of the negative element of the battery, Mr. Allsworth says, In a like manner, the iron element had to be developed and improved, and finally the iron, which had generally enjoyed superiority in capacity over its companion, the nickel element, had to go in training in order to retain its lead, which was imperative in order to produce a uniform and consistent voltage curve. In talking with me one day about the difficulties under which we were working, and contrasting them with the phonograph experimentation, Edison said, In phonographic work we can use our ears and our eyes, aided with powerful microscopes, but in the battery our difficulties cannot be seen or heard, but must be observed by our mind's eye. And by reason of the employment of such vision in the past, Edison is now able to see quite clearly through the forest of difficulties, after eliminating them one by one. The size and shape of the containing pockets in the battery plates or elements, and the degree of their preparation, were matters that received many years of close study and experiment. Indeed, there is still today constant work expended on their perfection, although their present general form was decided upon several years ago. The mechanical construction of the battery as a whole, in its present form, compels instant admiration on account of its beauty and completeness. Mr. Edison has spared neither thought, ingenuity, labor, nor money in the effort to make it the most complete and efficient storage cell obtainable, and the results show that his skill, judgment, and foresight have lost nothing of the power that laid the foundation of and built up other great arts at each earlier stage of his career. Among the complex and numerous problems that presented themselves in the evolution of the battery was the concerning and internal conductivity of the positive unit. The nickel hydrate was a poor electrical conductor, and although a metallic nickel pocket might be filled with it, there would not be the desired electrical action unless a conducting substance were mixed with it, and so incorporated, packed that there would be a good electrical contact throughout. This proved to be a most knotty and intricate puzzle, tricky and evasive, always leading on and promising something, and at the last slipping away, leaving the work undone. Edison's remarkable patience and persistence in dealing with this trying problem, and in finally solving it successfully, won for him more than ordinary admiration from his associates. One of them, in speaking of the seemingly interminable experiments to overcome this trouble, said, I guess that questions of conductivity of the positive pocket brought lots of gray hairs to his head. I never dreamed a man could have such patience and perseverance. Any other man than Edison would have given the whole thing up a thousand times, but not he. Things looked awfully blue to the whole bunch of us many a time, but he was always hopeful. I remember one time things looked so dark to me that I had just about made up my mind to throw up my job. But some good turn came just then, and I didn't. Now I'm glad I held on, for we've got a great future. The difficulty of obtaining good electrical contact in the positive element was indeed Edison's chief trouble for many years. After a great amount of work and experimentation, he decided upon a certain form of graphite, which seemed to be suitable for the purpose, and then proceeded to the commercial manufacture of the battery at a special factory in Glenridge, New Jersey, installed for the purpose. There was no lack of buyers, but on the contrary, the factory was unable to turn out batteries enough. The newspapers had previously published articles showing the unusual capacity and performance of the battery, and public interest had thus been greatly awakened. Notwithstanding, the establishment of a regular routine of manufacture and sale, Edison did not cease to experiment for improvement. 
Although the graphite apparently did the work desired of it, he was not altogether satisfied with its performance, and made extended trials of other substances, but at that time found nothing that on the whole served the purpose better. Continuous tests of the commercial cells were carried out at the laboratory, as well as more practical and heavy tests in automobiles, which were constantly kept running around the adjoining country over all kinds of roads. All these tests were very closely watched by Edison, who demanded rigorously that the various trials of the battery should be carried on with all strenuousness, so as to get the utmost results and develop any possible weakness. So insistent was he on this, that if any automobile should run several days without bursting a tire or breaking some parts of the machine, he would accuse the chauffeur of picking out easy roads. After these tests had been going on for some time, and some thousands of cells had been sold and were giving satisfactory results to the purchasers, the test sheets and experience gathered from various sources pointed to the fact that occasionally a cell here and there would show up as being short in capacity. Inasmuch as the factory processes were very exact and carefully guarded, and every cell was made as uniform as human skill and care could provide, there thus arose a serious problem. Edison concentrated his powers on the investigation of this trouble, and found that the chief cause lay in the graphite. Some other minor matters also attracted his attention. What to do was the important question that confronted him. To shut down the factory meant great loss and apparent failure. He realized this fully, but he also knew that to go on would simply be to increase the number of defective batteries in circulation, which would ultimately result in a permanent closure and real failure. Hence he took the course which one would expect of Edison's common sense and directness of action. He was not satisfied that the battery was a complete success, so he shut down and went to experimenting once more. And then, says one of the laboratory men, we started on another series of record-breaking experiments that lasted over five years. I might almost say heartbreaking, too, for all of the elusive disappointing things one ever hunted for, that was the worst. But secrets have to be long-winded and roost high if they want to get away when the old man goes hunting for them. He doesn't get mad when he misses them, but just keeps on smiling and firing, and usually brings them into camp. That's what he did on the battery, for after a whole lot of work, he perfected the nickel flake idea and process, besides making the great improvement of using tubes instead of flat pockets for the positive. He also added a minor improvement here and there, and now we have a finer battery than we ever expected. In the interim, while the experimentation of these last five years was in progress, many customers who purchased batteries of the original type came knocking at the door with orders in their hands for additional outfits wherewith to equip more wagons and trucks. Edison expressed his regrets, but said he was not satisfied with the old cells and was engaged in improving them to which the customers replied that they were entirely satisfied and ready and willing to pay for more batteries of the same kind. But Edison could not be moved from his determination, although considerable pressure was at time brought to bear to sway his decision. Experiment was continued beyond the point of peradventure, and after some new machinery had been built, the manufacture of the new type of cell was begun in the early summer of 1909, and at the present writing is being extended as fast as the necessary additional machinery can be made. The product is shipped out as soon as it is completed. The nickel flake, which is Edison's ingenious solution to the conductivity problem, is of itself a most interesting product, intensely practical in its application, and fascinating in its manufacture. The flake of nickel is obtained by electroplating upon a metallic cylinder alternate layers of copper and nickel, one hundred of each, after which the combined sheet is stripped from the cylinder. 
So thin are the layers that this sheet is only about the thickness of a visiting card, and yet it is composed of two hundred layers of metal. The sheet is cut into tiny squares, each about one-sixteenth of an inch, and these squares are put into a bath where the copper is dissolved out. This releases the layers of nickel, so that each of these small squares becomes one hundred tiny sheets, or flakes, of pure metallic nickel, so thin that when they are dried, they will float in the air like thistledown. In their application to the manufacture of batteries, the flakes are used through the medium of a special machine, so arranged that small charges of nickel hydrate and nickel flakes are alternately fed into the pockets intended for positives, and tamped down with a pressure equal to about four tons per square inch. This ensures complete and perfect contact and subsequent electrical conductivity throughout the entire unit. The development of the nickel flake contains in itself a history of patient investigation, labor, and achievement but we have not space for it, nor for tracing the great work that has been done in developing and perfecting the numerous other parts and adjuncts of this remarkable battery. Suffice it to say that when Edison went boldly out into new territory, after something entirely unknown, he was quite prepared for hard work and exploration. He encountered both in unstinted measure, but kept going forward until after long travel he had found all that he had expected, and accomplished something more besides. Nature did respond to his whole-hearted appeal, and, by the time the hunt was ended, revealed a good storage battery of entirely new type. Edison not only recognized and took advantage of the principles he had discovered, but in adapting them for commercial use, developed most ingenious processes and mechanical appliances for carrying his discoveries into practical effect. Indeed, it may be said that the invention of an enormous variety of new machines and mechanical appliances rendered necessary by each change during the various stages of development of the battery, from first to last, stands as the lasting tribute to the range and versatility of his powers. It is not within the scope of this narrative to enter into any description of the relative merits of the Edison storage battery, that being the province of a commercial catalogue. It does, however, seem entirely allowable to say that while at the present writing the tests that have been made extend over a few years only, their results and the intrinsic value of this characteristic Edison invention are of such a substantial nature as to point to the inevitable growth of another great industry arising from its manufacturer and to its widespread application to many uses. The principal use that Edison has had in mind for his battery is transportation of freight and passengers by truck, automobile, and streetcar. The greatly increased capacity in proportion to weight of the Edison cell makes it particularly adaptable for this class of work on account of the much greater radius of travel that is possible by its use. The latter point of advantage is the one that appeals most to the automobilist as he is thus enabled to travel, it is asserted, more than three times further than ever before on a single charge of the battery. Edison believes that there are more important advantages possible in the employment of his storage battery for streetcar propulsion. Under the present system of operation, a plant furnishing the electric power for street railways must be large enough to supply current for the maximum load during rush hours, although much of the machinery may be lying idle and unproductive in the hours of minimum load. By the use of storage battery cars, this immense and uneconomical maximum investment in plant can be cut down to proportions of true commercial economy, as the charging of the batteries can be conducted at a uniform rate with a reasonable expenditure for generating machinery. Not only this, but each car becomes an independently moving unit, not subject to delay by reason of a general breakdown of the power plant or of the line. 
In addition to these advantages, the streets would be freed from their burden of trolley wires or conduits. To put his ideas into practice, Addison built a short railway line at the Orange Works in the winter of 1909-1910, and in cooperation with Mr. R. H. Beach, constructed a special type of street car and equipped it with motor, storage battery, and other necessary operating devices. This car was subsequently put upon the street car lines in New York City, and demonstrated its efficiency so completely that it was purchased by one of the street car companies, which has since ordered additional cars for its lines. The demonstration of this initial car has been watched with interest by many railroad officials, and its performance has been of so successful a nature that at the present writing, the summer of 1910, it has been necessary to organize and equip a preliminary factory in which to construct many other cars of a similar type that have been ordered by other street railway companies. This enterprise will be conducted by a corporation which has been specially organized for the purpose. Thus, there has been initiated the development of a new and important industry whose possible ultimate proportions are beyond the range of present calculation. Extensive as this industry may become, however, Edison is firmly convinced that the greatest field for his storage battery lies in its adaptation to commercial trucking and hauling and to pleasure vehicles, in comparison with which the streetcar business even with its great possibilities, will not amount to more than one per cent. Edison has pithily summed up his work and his views in an article on The Tomorrows of Electricity and Invention in Popular Electricity for June 1910, in which he says, For years past I have been trying to perfect a storage battery and have now rendered it entirely suitable to automobile and other work. There is absolutely no reason why horses should be allowed within city limits, for between the gasoline and the electric car no room is left for them. They are not needed. The cow and the pig have gone. The horse is still more undesirable. A higher public ideal of health and cleanliness is working towards such banishment very swiftly. And then we shall have decent streets, instead of stables made out of strips of cobblestone bordered by sidewalks. The worst use of money is to make a fine thoroughfare and then turn it over to horses. Besides that, the change will put the humane societies out of business. Many people now charge their own batteries because of lack of facilities, but I believe central stations will find in this work very soon the largest part of their load." the New York Edison Company or the Chicago Edison Company should have as much current going out Chapter 23 of Edison, His Life and Inventions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda Edison, His Life and Inventions By Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 23 Miscellaneous Inventions It has been the endeavor in this narrative to group Edison's inventions and patents, so that his work in the different fields can be studied independently and separately. The history of his career has therefore fallen naturally into a series of chapters, each aiming to describe some particular development or art. And, in a way, the plan has been helpful to the writers while probably useful to the readers. It happens, however, that the process has left a vast mass of discovery and invention wholly untouched, and relegates to a concluding brief chapter some of the most interesting episodes of a fruitful life. Any one who will turn to the list of Edison patents at the end of the book will find a large number of things of which not even casual mention has been made, but which at the time occupied no small amount of the inventor's time and attention 
and many of which are now part and parcel of modern civilization. Edison has indeed touched nothing that he did not in some way improve. As Thoreau said, The laws of the universe are not indifferent, but are forever on the side of the most sensitive. And there never was any one more sensitive to the defects of every art and appliance, nor any one more active in applying the law of evolution. It is perhaps this many-sidedness of Edison that has impressed the multitude, and that in the popular vote, taken a couple of years ago by the New York Herald, placed his name at the head of the list of ten greatest living Americans. It is curious and pertinent to note that a similar plebiscite taken by a technical journal among its expert readers had exactly the same result. Evidently the public does not agree with the opinion expressed by the eccentric artist Blake in his Marriage of Heaven and Hell, when he said, "'Improvement makes strange roads, but the crooked roads without improvements are roads of genius.'" The product of Edison's brain may be divided into three classes. The first embraces such arts and industries or such apparatus as have already been treated. The second includes devices like the tessimeter, phonometer, odoroscope, etc., and others now to be noted. The third embraces a number of projected inventions, partially completed investigations, inventions in use but not patented, and a great many caveats filed in the patent office at various times during the last forty years, of, for the purpose of protecting his ideas pending their contemplated realization in practice. These caveats serve their purpose thoroughly in many instances, but there have remained a great variety of projects upon which no definite action was ever taken. One ought to add the contents of an unfinished piece of extraordinary fiction based wholly on new inventions and devices, utterly unknown to mankind. Some day the novel may be finished, but Edison has no inclination to go back to it, and says he cannot understand how any man is able to make a speech or write a book, for he simply can't do it. After what has been said in previous chapters, it will not seem so strange that Edison should have hundreds of dormant inventions on his hands. There are human limitations even for such a tireless worker as he is. While the preparation of data for this chapter was going on, one of the writers, in discussing with him the vast array of unexploited things, said, "'Don't you feel a sense of regret in being obliged to leave so many things uncompleted?' To which he replied, "'What's the use? One lifetime is too short, and I am busy every day improving essential parts of my established industries. It must suffice to speak briefly of a few leading inventions that have been worked out, and to dismiss with scant mention all the rest.' taking just a few items as typical and suggestive, especially when Edison can himself be quoted as to them. Incidentally, it may be noted that things, not words, are referred to, for Edison, in addition to inventing the apparatus, has often had to coin the word to describe it. A large number of the words and phrases in modern electrical parlance owe their origin to him. Even the call word of the telephone, hello, sent tingling over the wire a few million times daily, was taken from Menlo Park by men installing telephones in different parts of the world, men who had just learned it at the laboratory, and thus made it a universal sesame for telephonic conversation. It is hard to determine where to begin with Edison's miscellaneous inventions, but perhaps telegraphy has the right of line, and Edison's work in that field puts him abreast of the latest wireless developments that fill the world with wonder. I perfected a system of train telegraphy between stations and trains in motion, whereby messages could be sent from the moving train to the central office, and this was the forerunner of wireless telegraphy. This system was used for a number of years on the Lehigh Valley Railroad, on their construction trains. The electric wave passed from a piece of metal on top of the car across the air to the telegraph wires, and then proceeded to the dispatcher's office. In my first experiments with this system I tried it on the Staten Island Railroad, and employed an operator named King to do the experimenting. He reported results every day, and received instructions by mail, but for some reason he could send messages all right when the train went in one direction, but could not make it go in the contrary direction. 
I made suggestions of every kind to get around this phenomenon. Finally, I telegraphed King to find out if he had any suggestions himself, and I received a reply that the only way he could propose to get around the difficulty was to put the island on a pivot so it could be turned around. I found the trouble finally, and the practical introduction on the Lehigh Valley Road was the result. The system was sold to a very wealthy man, and he would never sell any rights or answer letters. He became a spiritualist subsequently, which probably explains it. It is interesting to note that Edison became greatly interested in the later developments by Marconi, and is an admiring friend and adviser of that well-known inventor. The earlier experiments with wireless telegraphy at Menlo Park were made at a time when Edison was greatly occupied with his electric light interests, and it was not until the beginning of 1886 that he was able to spare the time to make a public demonstration of the system as applied to moving trains. Ezra T. Gilliland, of Boston, had become associated with him in his experiments, and they took out several joint patents subsequently. The first practical use of the system took place on a thirteen-mile stretch of the Staten Island Railroad, with the results mentioned by Edison above. A little later, Edison and Gilliland joined forces with Lucius J. Phelps, another investigator, who had been experimenting along the same lines, and had taken out several patents. The various interests were combined in a corporation under whose auspices the system was installed on the Lehigh Valley Railroad, where it was used for several years. The official demonstration trip on this road took place on October 6, 1887, on a six-car train running to Easton, Pennsylvania, a distance of fifty-four miles. A great many telegrams were sent and received while the train was at full speed, including a dispatch to the Cable King, John Pender, London, England, and a reply from him. Footnote 17 Broadly described in outline, the system consisted of an induction circuit obtained by laying strips of tin along the top or roof of a railway car, and the installation of a special telegraph line running parallel with the track, and strung on poles of only medium height. The train, and also each signaling station, were equipped with regulation telegraphic apparatus, such as battery, key, relay, and sounder, together with induction coil and condenser. In addition, there was a transmitting device in the shape of a musical reed, or buzzer. In practice, this buzzer was continuously operated at high speed by a battery. Its vibrations were broken by means of a key into long and short periods, representing Morse characters, which were transmitted inductively from the train circuit to the pole line, or vice versa, and received by the operator at the other end through a high-resistance telephone receiver inserted in the secondary circuit of the induction coil. Although the space between the cars and the pole line was probably not more than about fifty feet, it is interesting to note that in Edison's early experiments at Menlo Park he succeeded in transmitting messages through the air at a distance of 580 feet. Speaking of this and of his other experiments with induction telegraphy by means of kites, communicating from one to the other and thus from the kites to instruments on the earth, Edison said recently, We only transmitted about two and one-half miles through the kites. What has always puzzled me since is that I did not think of using the results of my experiments on etheric force that I made in 1875. I have never been able to understand how I came to overlook them. If I had made use of my own work, I should have had long-distance wireless telegraphy. In one of the appendices to this book is given a brief technical account of Edison's investigations of the phenomena which lie at the root of modern wireless or space telegraphy and the attention of the reader is directed particularly to the description and quotations there from the famous notebooks of Edison's experiments in regard to what he called etheric force. It will be seen that as early as 1875 Edison detected and studied certain phenomena, i.e. the production of electrical effects in non-closed circuits, which for a time made him think he was on the trail of a new force. As there was no plausible explanation for them, by the then-known laws of electricity and magnetism. Later came the magnificent work of Hertz identifying the phenomena as electromagnetic waves in the ether, and developing a new world of theory and science based upon them and their production by disruptive discharges. 
Edison's assertions were treated with skepticism by the scientific world, which was not then ready for the discovery, and not sufficiently furnished with corroborative data. It is singular, to say the least, to note how Edison's experiments paralleled and proved in advance those that came later. And even his apparatus such as the dark box for making the tiny sparks visible, as the waves impinged on the receiver, bears close analogy with similar apparatus employed by Hertz. Indeed, as Edison sent the dark box apparatus to the Paris Exposition in 1881, and let Batchelor repeat there the puzzling experiments, it seems by no means unlikely that, either directly or on the report of some friend, Hertz may thus have received from Edison a most valuable suggestion, the inventor aiding the physicist in opening up a wonderful new realm. In this connection, indeed, it is very interesting to quote two great authorities. In May 1889, at a meeting of the Institution of Electrical Engineers in London, Dr., now Sir, Oliver Lodge, remarked in a discussion on a paper of his own on lightning conductors, embracing the Hertzian waves in his treatment. Many of the effects I have shown, sparks in unsuspected places and other things, have been observed before. Henry observed things of the kind, and Edison noticed some curious phenomena, and said it was not electricity but etheric force that caused these sparks, and the matter was rather pooh-poohed. It was a small part of this very thing— only the time was not ripe. Theoretical knowledge was not ready for it. Again, in his signaling without wires, in giving the history of the coherer principle, Lodge remarks, Sparks identical in all respects with those discovered by Hertz had been seen in recent times both by Edison and by Sylvanus Thompson, being styled etheric force by the former, but their theoretic significance had not been perceived, and they were somewhat skeptically regarded. During the same discussion in London in 1889, Sir William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, after citing some experiments by Faraday with his insulated cage at the Royal Institution, said, His, Faraday's, attention was not directed to look for Hertz sparks, or probably he might have found them in the interior. Edison seems to have noticed something of the kind in what he called etheric force. His name, Etheric, may thirteen years ago have seemed to many people absurd, but now we are all beginning to call these inductive phenomena etheric. With which testimony from the great Kelvin as to his priority in determining the vital fact, and with the evidence that as early as 1875 he built apparatus that demonstrated the fact, Edison is probably quite content. It should perhaps be noted at this point that a curious effect observed at the laboratory was shown in connection with Edison lamps at the Philadelphia Exhibition of 1884. It became known in scientific parlance as the Edison effect, showing a curious current condition or discharge in the vacuum of the bulb. It has since been employed by Fleming in England and De Forest in this country, and others as the basis for wireless telegraph apparatus. It is, in reality, a minute rectifier of alternating current, and analogous to those which have been since been made on a large scale. When Röntgen came forward with his discovery of the new X-ray in 1895, Edison was ready for it, and took up experimentation with it on a large scale, some of his work being recorded in an article in the Century magazine of May 1896, where a great deal of data may be found. Edison says with regard to this work, when the X-ray came up, I made the first fluoroscope, using tungstate of calcium. I also found that this tungstate could be put into a vacuum chamber of glass and fused to the inner walls of the chamber, and if the X-ray electrodes were let into the glass chamber and a proper vacuum was attained, you could get a fluorescent lamp of several candle power. I started in to make a number of these lamps, but I soon found that the X-ray had affected poisonously my assistant, Mr. Daly, so that his hair came out and his flesh commenced to ulcerate. I then concluded it would not do, and that it would not be a very popular kind of light, so I dropped it. At the time I selected tungstate of calcium because it was so fluorescent. I set four men to making all kinds of chemical combinations, and thus collected upward of eight thousand different crystals of various chemical combinations, discovering several hundred different substances which would fluoresce to the X-ray. So far, little had come of X-ray work, 
but it added another letter to the scientific alphabet. I don't know anything about radium, and I have lots of company. The electrical engineer of June 3, 1896, contains a photograph of Mr. Edison taken by the light of one of his fluorescent lamps. The same journal, in its issue of April 1, 1896, shows an Edison fluoroscope in use by an observer, in the now familiar and universal form somewhat like a stereoscope. This apparatus, as invented by Edison, consists of a flaring box, curved at one end to fit closely over the forehead and eyes, while the other end of the box is closed by a pasteboard cover. On the inside of this is spread a layer of tungstate of calcium. By placing the object to be observed, such as the hand, between the vacuum tube and the fluorescent screen, the shadow is formed on the screen and can be observed at leisure. The apparatus has proved invaluable in surgery and has become an accepted part of the equipment of modern surgery. In 1896, at the electrical exhibition in the Grand Central Palace, New York City, given under the auspices of the National Electric Light Association, thousands and thousands of persons with the use of this apparatus in Edison's personal exhibit were enabled to see their own bones, and the resultant public sensation was great. Mr. Mallory tells a characteristic story of Edison's own share in the memorable exhibit. The exhibit was announced for opening on Monday. On the preceding Friday all the apparatus, which included a large induction coil, was shipped from Orange to New York, and on Saturday afternoon Edison, accompanied by Fred Ott, one of his assistants, and myself, went over to install it so as to have it ready for Monday morning. Had everything been normal, a few hours would have sufficed for completion of the work. But on coming to test the big coil, it was found to be absolutely out of commission, having been so seriously injured as to necessitate its entire rewinding. It being summertime, all the machine shops were closed until Monday morning, and there were several miles of wire to be wound on the coil. Edison would not consider a postponement of the exhibition, so there was nothing to do but go to work and wind it by hand. We managed to find a lathe, but there was no power, so each of us, including Edison, took turns revolving the lathe by pulling on the belt, while the other two attended to the winding of the wire. We worked continuously all through that Saturday night and all day Sunday until evening, when we finished the job. I don't remember ever being conscious of more muscles in my life. I guess Edison was tired also, but he took it very philosophically. This was apparently the first public demonstration of the X-ray to the American people. Edison's ore separation work has been already fully described, but the story would hardly be complete without a reference to a similar work in gold extraction dating back to the Menlo Park days. I got up a method, says Edison, of separating placer gold by a dry process, in which I could work economically or as lean as five cents of gold to the cubic yard. I had several carloads of different placer sand sent to me, and proved I could do it. Some parties, hearing I had succeeded in doing such a thing, went to work and got hold of what was known as the Ortiz Mine Grant, twelve miles from Santa Fe, New Mexico. This mine, according to the reports of several mining engineers made in the last forty years, was considered one of the richest placer deposits in the United States, and various schemes had been put forward to bring water from the mountains forty miles away to work those immense beds. The reports stated that the Mexicans had been panning gold for a hundred years out of these deposits. These parties now made arrangements with the stockholders, or owners of the grant, and with me, to work the deposits by my process. As I had had some previous experience with the statements of mining men, I concluded I would just send down a small plant, and prospect the field before putting up a large one. This I did, and I sent two of my assistants, whom I could trust, down to this place to erect the plant, and started to sink shafts fifty feet deep all over the area. We soon learned that the rich gravel, instead of being spread over an area of three by seven miles, and rich from the grass roots down, was spread over a space of about twenty-five acres, and that even this did not average more than ten cents to the cubic yard. The whole placer would not give more than one and one-quarter cents per cubic yard. As my business arrangements had not been very perfectly made, I lost the usual amount. Going to another extreme, we find Edison grappling with one of the biggest problems known to the authorities of New York. 
the disposal of its heavy snows. It is needless to say that witnessing the ordinary slow and costly procedure would put Edison on his mettle. One time, when they had a snow blockade in New York, I started to build a machine with Bachelor, a big truck with a steam engine and compressor on it. We would run along the street, gather all the snow up in front of us, pass it into the compressor, and deliver little blocks of ice behind us in the gutter, taking one-tenth the room of the snow, and not inconveniencing anybody. We could thus take care of a snowstorm by diminishing the bulk of material to be handled. The preliminary experiment we made was dropped because we went into other things. The machine would go as fast as a horse could walk. Edison has always taken a keen interest in aerial flight, and has also experimented with aeroplanes, his preference inclining to the helicopter type, as noted in the newspapers and periodicals from time to time. The following statement from him refers to a type of aeroplane of great novelty and ingenuity. James Gordon Bennett came to me and asked that I try some primary experiments to see if aerial navigation was feasible with heavier-than-air machines. I got up a motor and put it on the scales and tried a large number of different things and contrivances connected to the motor to see how it would lighten itself on the scales. I got some data and made up my mind that what was needed was a very powerful engine for its weight in small compass. So I conceived of an engine employing gun cotton. I took a lot of ticker paper tape, turned it into gun cotton, and got up an engine with an arrangement whereby I could feed this gun cotton strip into the cylinder and explode it inside electrically. The feed took place between two copper rolls. The copper kept the temperature down so that it could only explode up to the point where it was in contact with the feed rolls. It worked pretty well, but once the feed roll didn't save it, and the flame went through and exploded the whole roll, and kicked up such a bad explosion I abandoned it. But the idea might be made to work. Turning from the air to the earth, it is interesting to note that the introduction of the underground Edison system in New York made an appeal to inventive ingenuity, and that one of the difficulties was met as follows. When we first put the Pearl Street station in operation in New York, we had cast-iron junction boxes at the intersections of all the streets. One night, or about two o'clock in the morning, a policeman came in and said that something had exploded at the corner of William and Nassau Streets. I happened to be in the station, and went out to see what it was. I found that the cover of the manhole, weighing about two hundred pounds, had entirely disappeared, but everything inside was intact. It had even stripped some of the threads of the bolts, and we could never find that cover. I concluded it was either a leakage of gas into the manhole, or else the acid used in pickling the casting had given off hydrogen and the air had leaked in, making an explosive mixture. As this was a pretty serious problem, and as we had a good many of the manholes, it worried me very much for fear that it would be repeated and the company might have to pay a lot of damages, especially in districts like that around William and Nassau, where there are a good many people about. If an explosion took place in the daytime, it might lift a few of them up. However, I got around the difficulty by putting a little bottle of chloroform in each box, corked up, with a slight hole in the cork. The chloroform being volatile, and very heavy, settled in the box and displaced all the air. I have never heard of an explosion in a manhole where this chloroform had been used. Carbon tetrachloride, now made electrically at Niagara Falls, is very cheap and would be ideal for the purpose. Edison has never paid much attention to warfare, and has in general disdained to develop inventions for the destruction of life and property. Some years ago, however, he became the joint inventor of the Edison Sims torpedo, with Mr. W. Scott Sims, who sought his cooperation. This is a dirigible submarine torpedo, operated by electricity. In the torpedo proper, which is suspended from a long float, so as to be submerged a few feet under water, are placed the small electrical motor for propulsion and steering, and the explosive charge. The torpedo is controlled from the shore or ship through an electric cable, which it pays out as it goes along, and all operations of varying the speed, reversing, and steering are performed at the will of the distant operator by means of current sent through the cable. During the Spanish-American War of 1898, Edison suggested to the Navy Department the adoption of a compound of calcium carbide and calcium phosphite, which, when placed in a shell and fired from a gun, would explode as soon as it struck water and ignite, 
producing a blaze that would continue several minutes and make the ships of the enemy visible for four or five miles at sea. Moreover, the blaze could not be extinguished. Edison has always been deeply interested in conversation, and much of his work has been directed toward the economy of fuel in obtaining electrical energy directly from the consumption of coal. Indeed, it will be noted that the example of his handwriting shown in these volumes deals with the importance of obtaining available energy direct from the combustible without the enormous loss in the intervening stages that makes our best modern methods of steam, generation, and utilization so barbarously extravagant and wasteful. Several years ago, experimenting in this field, Edison devised and operated some ingenious pyromagnetic motors and generators, based, as the name implies, on the direct application of heat to the machines. The motor is founded upon the principle discovered by the famous Dr. William Gilbert, court physician to Queen Elizabeth, and the father of modern electricity, that the magnetic properties of iron diminish with heat. At a light red heat, iron becomes non-magnetic, so that a strong magnet exerts no influence over it. Edison employed this peculiar property by constructing a small machine in which a pivoted bar is alternately heated and cooled. It is thus attracted toward an adjacent electromagnet when cold, and is uninfluenced when hot, and as the result motion is produced. The pyromagnetic generator is based on the same phenomenon, its aim being, of course, to generate electrical energy directly from the heat of the combustible. The armature, or moving part of the machine, consists in reality of eight separate armatures, all constructed of corrugated sheet iron, covered with asbestos, and wound with wire. These armatures are held in place by two circular iron plates, through the center of which runs a shaft, carrying at its lower extremity a semicircular shield of fire clay, which covers the ends of four of the armatures. The heat, of whatever origin, is applied from below, and the shaft being revolved, four of the armatures lose their magnetism constantly, while the other four gain it, so to speak. As the moving part revolves, therefore, currents of electricity are sent up in the wires of the armatures, and are collected by a commutator, as in an ordinary dynamo, placed on the upper end of the central shaft. A great variety of electrical instruments are included in Edison's inventions, many of these in fundamental or earlier forms being devised for his systems of light and power, as noted already. There are numerous others, and it might be said with truth that Edison is hardly ever without some new device of this kind in hand, as he is by no means satisfied with the present status of electrical measurements. He holds in general that the meters of to-day, whether for heavy or for feeble currents, are too expensive, and that cheaper instruments are a necessity of the times. These remarks apply more particularly to what may be termed, in general, circuit meters. In other classes, Edison has devised an excellent form of magnetic bridge, being an ingenious application of the principles of the familiar Wheatstone bridge, used so extensively for measuring the electrical resistance of wires. The testing of iron for magnetic qualities being determined by it in the same way. Another special instrument is a dead-beat galvanometer, which differs from the ordinary form of galvanometer in having no coils or magnetic needle. It depends for its action upon the heating effect of the current, which causes a fine platinum-iridium wire, enclosed in a glass tube, to expand, thus allowing a coiled spring to act on a pivoted shaft carrying a tiny mirror. The mirror, as it moves, throws a beam of light upon a scale, and the indications are read by the spot of the light. Most novel of all the apparatus of this measuring kind is the odoroscope, which is like the tassimeter described in an earlier chapter, except that a strip of gelatin takes the place of hard rubber as the sensitive member. Besides being affected by heat, this device is exceedingly sensitive to moisture. A few drops of water or perfume thrown on the floor of a room are sufficient to give a very decided indication on the galvanometer in circuit with the instrument. Barometers, hygrometers, and similar instruments of great delicacy can be constructed on the principle of the odoroscope, and it may also be used in determining the character or pressure of gases and vapors in which it has been placed. In the list of Edison's patents at the end of this work may be noted many other of his miscellaneous inventions, covering items such as preserving fruit in vacuo, 
making plate glass, drawing wire, and metallurgical processes for treatment of nickel, gold, and copper ores. But to mention these inventions separately would trespass too much on our limited space here. Hence we shall leave the interested reader to examine that list for himself. From first to last Edison has filed in the United States Patent Office, in addition to more than 1,400 applications for patents, some 120 caveats embracing not less than 1,500 inventions. A caveat is essentially a notice filed by an inventor entitling him to receive warning from the office of any application for a patent for an invention that would interfere with his own during the year while he is supposed to be perfecting his device. The old caveat system has now been abolished, but it served to elicit from Edison a most astounding record of ideas and possible inventions upon which he was working, and many of which he of course reduced to practice. As an example of Edison's fertility and the endless variety of subjects engaging his thoughts, the following list of matters covered by one caveat is given. It is needless to say that all the caveats are not quite so full of plums, but this is certainly a wonder. Forty-one distinct inventions relating to the phonograph, covering various forms of recorders, arrangement of parts, making of records, shaving tool, adjustments, etc., eight forms of electric lamps using infusible earthy oxides and brought to a high incandescence in vacuo by high potential current of several thousand volts, same character as impingement of x-rays on object in bulb, a loud-speaking telephone with quartz cylinder and beam of ultraviolet light, four forms of arc light with special carbons, a thermostatic motor, a device for sealing together the inside part and bulb of an incandescent lamp mechanically regulators for dynamos and motors three devices for utilizing vibrations beyond the ultraviolet a great variety of methods for coating incandescent lamp filaments with silicon titanium chromium osmium boron etc several methods of making porous filaments several methods of making squirted filaments of a variety of materials, of which about thirty are specified, seventeen different methods and devices for separating magnetic ores, a continuously operative primary battery, a musical instrument operating one of Hemholtz's artificial larynxes, a siren worked by explosion of small quantities of oxygen and hydrogen mixed, three other sirens made to give vocal sounds or articulate speech, a device for projecting sound waves to a distance without spreading and in a straight line on the principle of smoke rings, a device for continuously indicating on a galvanometer the depths of the ocean, a method of preventing, in a great measure, friction of water against the hull of a ship and incidentally preventing fouling by barnacles, a telephone receiver whereby the vibrations of the diaphragm are considerably amplified, two methods of space telegraphy at sea, an improved and extended string telephone, devices and method of talking through water for considerable distances, an audiphone for deaf people, sound bridge for measuring resistance of tubes and other materials for conveying sound, a method of testing a magnet to ascertain the existence of flaws in the iron or steel composing the same, method of distilling liquids by incandescent conductor immersed in the liquid, method of obtaining electricity directly from coal, an engine operated by steam produced by the hydration and dehydration of metallic salts, device and method for telegraphing photographically, carbon crucible kept brilliantly incandescent by current in vacuo, for obtaining reaction with refractory metals, device for examining combinations of odors and their changes by rotation at different speeds. From one of the preceding items it will be noted that even in the eighties Edison perceived much advantage to be gained in the line of economy by the use of lamp filaments employing refractory metals in their construction. From another caveat, filed in 1889, we extract the following, which shows that he realized the value of tungsten also for this purpose. Filaments of carbon placed in a combustion tube with a little chloride ammonium. Chloride tungsten or titanium passed through hot tube, 
depositing a film of metal on the carbon, or filaments of zirconia oxide, or alumina, or magnesia, thoria, or other infusible oxides mixed or separate, and obtained by moistening and squirting through a dye, are thus coated with above metals and used for incandescent lamps. Osmium for a volatile compound of same, thus deposited, makes a filament as good as carbon when in vacuo. In 1888, long before there arose the actual necessity of duplicating phonograph records so as to produce the replicas in great numbers, Edison described in one of his caveats a method and process much similar to the one which was put into practice by him in later years. In the same caveat he describes an invention whereby the power to indent on a phonograph cylinder, instead of coming directly from the voice, is caused by power derived from the rotation or movement of the phonogram surface itself. He did not, however, follow up this invention and put it into practice. Some twenty years later it was independently invented and patented by another inventor. A further instance of this kind is a method of telegraphy at sea by means of a diaphragm in a closed porthole flush with the side of the vessel, and actuated by a steam whistle which is controlled by a lever, similar to a morse key. A receiving diaphragm is placed in another and nearby chamber, which is provided with very sensitive stethoscopic earpieces, by which the Morse character sent from another vessel may be received. This was also invented later by another inventor, and is in use today, but will naturally be rivaled by wireless telegraphy. Still another instance is seen in one of Edison's caveats, where he describes a method of distilling liquids by means of internally applied heat through electric conductors. Although Edison did not follow up the idea and take out a patent, this system of distillation was later hit upon by others, and is in use at the present time. In the foregoing pages of this chapter, the authors have endeavored to present very briefly a sketchy notion of the astounding range of Edison's practical ideas, but they feel a sense of impotence in being unable to deal adequately with the subject in the space that can be devoted to it. To those who, like the authors, have had the privilege of examining the voluminous records which show the flights of his imagination, there comes a feeling of utter inadequacy to convey to others the full extent of the story they reveal. The few specific instances above related, although not representing a tithe of Edison's work, will probably be sufficient to enable the reader to appreciate to some extent his great wealth of ideas and fertility of imagination and also to realize that this imagination is not only intensely practical, but that it works prophetically along lines of natural progress. End of chapter 23 Recording by Chapter 24 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 24 Edison's Method in Inventing. While the world's progress depends largely upon their ingenuity, inventors are not usually persons who have adopted invention as a distinct profession, but generally speaking are otherwise engaged in various walks of life. By reason of more or less inherent native genius, they either make improvements along lines of present occupation, or else evolve new methods and means of accomplishing results in fields for which they may have personal predilections. Now and then, however, there arises a man so greatly endowed with natural powers and originality that the creative faculty within him is too strong to endure the humdrum routine of affairs, and manifests itself in a life devoted entirely to the evolution of methods and devices calculated to further the world's welfare. In other words, he becomes an inventor by profession. Such a man is Edison. Notwithstanding the fact that nearly forty years ago, not a great while after he had emerged from the ranks of peripatetic telegraph operators. He was the owner of a large and profitable business as a manufacturer of the telegraphic apparatus invented by him. The call of his nature was too strong to allow of profits being laid away in the bank to accumulate. As he himself has said, he has too sanguine a temperament to allow money to stay in solitary confinement. Hence, 
all superfluous cash was devoted to experimentation. In the course of years he grew more and more impatient of the shackles that bound him to business routine, and realizing the powers within him, he drew away gradually from purely manufacturing occupations, determining deliberately to devote his life to inventive work, and to depend upon its results as a means of subsistence. All persons who make inventions will necessarily be more or less original in character, but to the man who chooses to become an inventor by profession must be conceded a mind more than ordinarily replete with virility and originality. That these qualities in Edison are superabundant is well known to all who have worked with him, and indeed are apparent to every one from his multiplied achievements within the period of one generation. If one were allowed only two words with which to describe Edison, it is doubtful whether a close examination of the entire dictionary would disclose any others more suitable than experimenter, inventor. These would express the overruling characteristics of his eventful career. It is as an inventor that he sets himself down in the membership list of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. To attempt the strict placing of these words in relation to each other, except alphabetically, would be equal to an endeavor to solve the old problem as to which came first, the egg or the chicken. For although all his inventions have been evolved through experiment, many of his notable experiments have called forth the exercise of highly inventive faculties in their very inception. Investigation and experiment have been a consuming passion and impelling force from within, as it were, from his petticoat days, when he collected goose-eggs and tried to hatch them out by sitting over them himself. One might be inclined to dismiss this trivial incident smilingly as a mere childish thoughtless prank, had not subsequent development as a child, boy, and man revealed a born investigator with original reasoning powers that, disdaining crooks and bends, always aimed at the centre, and, like the flight of a bee, were accurate and direct. It is not surprising, therefore, that a man of this kind should exhibit a ceaseless, absorbing desire for knowledge, and an apparently uncontrollable tendency to experiment on every possible occasion, even though his last cent were spent in thus satisfying the insatiate cravings of an inquiring mind. During Edison's immature years, when he was flitting about from place to place as a telegraph operator, his experimentation was of a desultory, hand-to-mouth character, although it was always notable for originality, as expressed in a number of minor useful devices produced during this period. Small wonder, then, that at the end of these wanderings, when he had found a place to rest the sole of his foot, he established a laboratory in which to carry on his researches in a more methodical and practical manner. In this was the beginning of the work which has since made such a profound impression on contemporary life. There is nothing of the helter-skelter slapdash style in Edison's experiments. Although all the laboratory experimenters agree in the opinion that he tries everything, it is not merely the mixing of a little of this, some of that, a few drops of the other, in the hope that something will come of it. Nor is the spirit of the laboratory work represented in the following dialogue overheard between two alleged carpenters picking up at random to help on a hurry job. "'How near does she fit, Mike? About an inch. Nail her.' A most casual examination of any of the laboratory records— will reveal evidence of the minutest exactitude insisted on in the conduct of experiments, irrespective of the length of time they occupied. Edison's instructions, always clear-cut and direct, followed by his keen oversight, admit of nothing less than implicit observance in all details, no matter where they may lead, and impel to the utmost minuteness and accuracy. To some extent there has been a popular notion that many of Edison's successes have been due to mere dumb fool luck, to blind fortuitous happenings. Nothing could be further from the truth, for on the contrary it is owing almost entirely to the comprehensive scope of his knowledge, the breadth of his conception, the daring originality of his methods, and minuteness and extent of experiment, combined with unwavering pertinacity, that new arts have been created and additions made to others already in existence. Indeed, without this tireless minutia and methodical searching spirit, it would have been practically impossible to have produced many of the most important of these inventions. Needless to say, mastery of its literature is regarded by him as a most important preliminary in taking up any line of investigation. What others may have done, bearing directly or collaterally on the subject in print, is carefully considered and sifted to the point of exhaustion. Not that he takes it for granted that the conclusions are correct, for he frequently obtains vastly different results by repeating in his own way experiments made by others as detailed in books. 
Edison can travel along a well-used road and still find virgin soil, remarked recently one of his most practical experimenters, who had been working along a certain line without attaining the desired result. He wanted to get a particular compound having definite qualities, and I had tried in all sorts of ways to produce it, but with only partial success. He was confident that it could be done, and said he would try it himself. In doing so he followed the same path in which I had travelled, but by making an undreamed-of change in one of the operations, succeeded in producing a compound that virtually came up to his specifications. It is not the only time I have known this sort of thing to happen. In speaking of Edison's method of experimenting, another of his laboratory staff says, He is never hindered by theory, but resorts to actual experiment for proof. For instance, when he conceived the idea of pouring a complete concrete house, it was universally held that it would be impossible, because the pieces of stone in the mixture would not rise to the level of the pouring point, but would gravitate to a lower plane in the soft cement. This, however, did not hinder him from making a series of experiments, which resulted in an invention that proved conclusively the contrary. Having conceived some new idea, and read everything obtainable relating to the subject in general, Edison's fertility of resource and originality come into play. Taking one of the laboratory notebooks, he will write in it a memorandum of the experiments to be tried, illustrated, if necessary, by sketches. This book is then passed on to that member of the experimental staff whose special training and experience are best adapted to the work. Here strenuousness is expected, and an immediate commencement of investigation and prompt report are required. Sometimes the subject may be such as to call for a long line of frequent tests which necessitate patient and accurate attention to minute details. Results must be reported often, daily or possibly with still greater frequency. Edison does not forget what is going on, but in his daily tours through the laboratory keeps in touch with all the work that is under the hands of his various assistants showing by an instant grasp of the present conditions of any experiment that he has a full consciousness of its meaning and its reference to his original conception. The year 1869 saw the beginning of Edison's career as an acknowledged inventor of commercial devices. From the outset, an innate recognition of system dictated the desirability and wisdom of preserving records of his experiments and inventions. The primitive records, covering the earliest years, were mainly jotted down on loose sheets of paper covered with sketches, notes, and data, pasted into large scrapbooks, or preserved in packages. But with the passing of years and enlargement of his interests, it became the practice to make all original laboratory notes in large uniform books. This course was pursued until the Menlo Park period, when he instituted a new regime that has been continued down to the present day. A standard form of notebook, about eight and a half by six inches, containing about two hundred pages, was adopted. A number of these books were, and are now, always to be found scattered around in the different sections of the laboratory, and in them have been noted by Edison all his ideas, sketches, and memoranda. Details of the various experiments concerning them have been set down by his assistants from time to time. These later laboratory notebooks, of which there are now over one thousand in the series, are eloquent in the history they reveal of the strenuous labors of Edison and his assistants and the vast fields of research he has covered during the last thirty years. They are overwhelmingly rich in biographic material, but analysis would be a prohibitive task for one person, and perhaps interesting only to technical readers. Their pages cover practically every department of science. The countless thousands of separate experiments recorded exhibit the operations of a mastermind seeking to surprise nature into a betrayal of her secrets by asking her the same question in a hundred different ways. For instance, when Edison was investigating a certain problem of importance many years ago, the notebooks show that on this point alone about 15,000 experiments and tests were made by one of his assistants. A most casual glance over these notebooks will illustrate the following remark which was made to one of the writers not long ago by a member of the laboratory staff who has been experimenting there for twenty years. Edison can think of more ways of doing a thing than any man I ever saw or heard of. He tries everything and never lets up, even though failure is apparently staring him in the face. He only stops when he simply can't go any further on that particular line. When he decides on any mode of procedure, he gives his notes to the experimenter and lets him alone only stepping in from time to time to look at the operations and receive reports of progress. The history of the development of the telephone transmitter, phonograph, incandescent lamp, dynamo, electrical distributing systems from central stations, electric railway, ore milling, cement, 
motion pictures, and a host of minor inventions may be found embedded in the laboratory notebooks. A passing glance at a few pages of these written records will serve to illustrate, though only to a limited extent, the thoroughness of Edison's method. It is to be observed that these references can be but of the most meagre kind, and must be regarded as merely throwing a side-light on the subject itself. For instance, the complex problem of a practical telephone transmitter gave rise to a series of most exhaustive experiments. Combinations in almost infinite variety, including gums, chemical compounds, oils, minerals, and metals, were suggested by Edison, and his assistants were given long lists of materials to try with reference to predetermined standards of articulation, degrees of loudness, and perfection of hissing sounds. The notebooks contained hundreds of pages showing that a great many thousands of experiments were tried and passed upon. Such remarks as NG, pretty good, whistling good but no articulation, rattly, articulation, whispering and whistling good, best tonight so far, and others, are noted opposite the various combinations as they were tried. Thus one may follow the investigation through a maze of experiments which led up to the successful invention of the carbon button transmitter, the vital device to give the telephone its needed articulation and perfection. The two hundred and odd notebooks, covering the strenuous period during which Edison was carrying on his electric light experiments, tell on their forty thousand pages or more a fascinating story of the evolution of a new art in its entirety. From the crude beginnings, through all the varied phases of this evolution, the operations of a mastermind are apparent from the contents of these pages, in which are recorded the innumerable experiments, calculations, and tests that ultimately brought light out of the darkness. The early work on a metallic conductor for lamps gave rise to some very thorough research on melting and alloying metals, the preparation of metallic oxides, the coating of fine wires by immersing them in a great variety of chemical solutions. Following his usual custom, Edison would indicate the lines of experiment to be followed, which were carried out and recorded in the notebooks. He himself, in January 1879, made personally a most minute and searching investigation into the properties and behavior of plating iridium, boron, rutile, zircon, chromium, molybdenum, and nickel, under varying degrees of current strength, on which there may be found in the notes about forty pages of detailed experiments and deductions in his own handwriting, concluding with the remark about nickel. This is a great discovery for electric light in the way of economy. The period of research on nickel, etc., was evidently a trying one, for after a nearly a month's close application, he writes, on January twenty seventh, 1879, owing to the enormous power of the light, my eyes commenced to pain after seven hours' work, and I had to quit. On the next day appears the following entry. Suffered the pains of hell with my eyes last night from 10 p.m. till 4 a.m., when got to sleep with a big dose of morphine. Eyes getting better, and do not pain much at 4 p.m., but I lose today. The try-everything spirit of Edison's method is well illustrated in this early period by a series of about 1,600 resistance tests of various ores, minerals, earths, etc., occupying over fifty pages of one of the notebooks relating to the metallic filament for his lamps. But, as the reader has already learned, the metallic filament was soon laid aside in favor of carbon, and we find in the laboratory notes an amazing record of research and experiment conducted in the minute and searching manner peculiar to Edison's method. His inquiries were directed along all the various roads leading to the desired goal, for long before he had completed the invention of a practical lamp, he realized broadly the fundamental requirements of a successful system of electrical distribution, and had given instructions for the making of a great variety of calculations which, although far in advance of the time, were clearly foreseen by him to be vitally important in the ultimate solution of the complicated problem. Thus we find many hundreds of pages of the notebooks covered with computations and calculations by Mr. Upton, not only on the numerous ramifications of the projected system and comparisons with gas, but also on proposed forms of dynamos and the proposed station in New York. A mere recital by titles of the vast number of experiments and tests on carbons, lamps, dynamos, armatures, commutators, windings, systems, regulators, sockets, vacuum pumps, and the thousand and one details relating to the subject in general, originated by Edison and methodically and systematically carried on under his general direction, would fill a great many pages here, and even then would serve only to convey a confused impression of ceaseless probing. It is possible only to a broad, comprehensive mind well stored with knowledge, 
and backed with resistless boundless energy, that such a diversified series of experiments and investigations could be carried on simultaneously, and assimilated, even though they should relate to a class of phenomena already understood and well defined. But if we pause to consider that the commercial subdivision of the electric current, which was virtually an invention made to order, involved the solution of problems so unprecedented that even they themselves had to be created, we cannot but conclude that the afflatus of innate genius played an important part in the unique methods of investigation instituted by Edison at that and other times. The idea of attributing great successes to genius has always been repudiated by Edison, as evidenced by his historic remark that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Again, in a conversation many years ago at the laboratory between Edison Batchelor and E. H. Johnson, the latter made allusion to Edison's genius as evidenced by some of his achievements, when Edison replied, Stuff! I tell you genius is hard work, stick to and common sense. Yes, said Johnson, I admit there is all that to it, but there's still more. Batch and I have those qualifications, but although we know quite a lot about telephones and worked hard, we couldn't invent a brand new non-infringing telephone receiver as you did when Goreau cabled for one. Then, how about the subdivision of the electric light? Electric current, corrected Edison. True, continued Johnson. You were the one to make that very distinction. The scientific world had been working hard on subdivision for years, using what appeared to be common sense. Results worse than nil. Then you come along, and about the first thing you do after looking the ground over is to start off in the opposite direction, which subsequently proves to be the only possible way to reach the goal. It seems to me that this is pretty close to the dictionary definition of genius. It is said that Edison replied rather incoherently and changed the topic of conversation. This innate modesty, however, does not prevent Edison from recognizing and classifying his own methods of investigation. In a conversation with two old associates recently, April 1909, he remarked, It has been said of me that my methods are empirical. That is true only so far as chemistry is concerned. Did you ever realize that practically all industrial chemistry is colloidal in nature? Hard rubber, celluloid, glass, soap, paper, and lots of others all have to deal with amorphous substances, as to which comparatively little has been really settled. My methods are similar to those followed by Luther Burbank. He plants an acre, and when this is in bloom he inspects it. He has a sharp eye, and he can pick out of thousands a single plant that has promise of what he wants. From this he gets the seed, and uses his skill and knowledge in producing from it a number of new plants, which, on development, furnish the means of propagating an improved variety in large quantity. So, when I am after a chemical result that I have in mind, I may make hundreds or thousands of experiments, out of which there may be one that promises results in the right direction. This I follow up to its legitimate conclusion, discarding the others, and usually get what I am after. There is no doubt about this being empirical, but when it comes to problems of a mechanical nature, I want to tell you that all I have ever tackled and solved have been done by hard, logical thinking. The intense earnestness and emphasis with which this was said were very impressive to the auditors. This empirical method may perhaps be better illustrated by a specific example. During the latter part of the storage battery investigations, after the form of positive element had been determined upon, it became necessary to ascertain what definite proportions and what quality of nickel hydrate and nickel flake would give the best results. A series of positive tubes were filled with the two materials in different proportions, say, nine parts hydrate to one of flake, eight parts hydrate to two of flake, seven parts hydrate to three of flake, and so on, through varying proportions. Three sets of each of these positives were made, and all put into separate test tubes with a uniform type of negative element. These were carried through a long series of charges and discharges under strict test conditions. From the tabulated results of hundreds of tests there were selected three that showed the best results. These, however, showed only the superiority of certain proportions of the materials. The next step would be to find out the best quality. Now, as there are several hundred variations in the quality of nickel flake, and perhaps a thousand ways to make the hydrate, it will be realized that Edison's methods led to stupendous detail, for these tests embraced a trial of all the qualities of both materials in the three proportions found to be the most suitable. Among these many thousands of experiments, any that showed extraordinary results were again elaborated by still further series of tests, until Edison was satisfied that he had obtained the best result in that particular line. 
the laboratory notebooks do not always tell the whole story or meaning of an experiment that may be briefly outlined on one of their pages for example the early filament made of a mixture of lamp black and tar is merely a suggestion in the notes but its making afforded an example of edison's pertinacity these materials when mixed became a friable mass which he had found could be brought into such a cohesive putty-like state by manipulation as to be capable of being rolled out into filaments as fine as seven thousandths of an inch in cross-section one of the laboratory assistants was told to make some of this mixture knead it and roll some filaments after a time he brought the mass to edison and said there's something wrong about this for it crumbles even after manipulating it with my fingers how long did you knead it said edison oh more than an hour replied the assistant well just keep on for a few hours more and it will come out all right was the rejoinder and this proved to be correct for after a prolonged kneading and rolling the mass changed into a cohesive stringy homogeneous putty it was from a mixture of this kind that spiral filaments were made and used in some of the earliest forms of successful incandescent lamps indeed they are described and illustrated in edison's fundamental lamp patent number two hundred and twenty thousand eight hundred ninety eight the present narrative would assume the proportions of a history of the incandescent lamp should the authors attempt to follow edison's investigations through the thousands of pages of notebooks away back in the eighties and early nineties improvement of the lamp was constantly in his mind all those years and besides the vast amount of detail experimental work he laid out for his assistants he carried on a great deal of research personally sometimes whole books are filled in his own handwriting with records of experiments showing every conceivable variation of some particular line of inquiry each trial bearing some terse comment expressive of results in one book appear the details of one of these experiments on september third eighteen ninety one at four thirty a m with the comment brought up lamp higher than a sixteen c p two forty was ever brought before hurrah notwithstanding the late hour he turns over to the next page and goes on to write his deductions from this result as compared with those previously obtained proceeding day by day as appears by this same book he follows up another line of investigation on lamps apparently full of difficulty for after one hundred and thirty two other recorded experiments we find this note saturday three thirty went home disgusted with incandescent lamps this feeling was evidently evanescent for on the succeeding monday the work was continued and carried on by him as keenly as before as shown by the next batch of notes this is the only instance showing any indication of impatience that the authors have found in looking through the enormous mass of laboratory notes all his assistants agree that edison is the most patient tireless experimenter that could be conceived of failures do not distress him indeed he regards them as always useful as may be gathered from the following related by dr e g atchison formerly one of his staff i once made an experiment in edison's laboratory at menlo park during the latter part of eighteen eighty and the results were not as looked for i considered the experiment a perfect failure and while bemoaning the results of this apparent failure mr edison entered and after learning the facts of the case cheerfully remarked that i should not look upon it as a failure for he considered every experiment a success as in all cases it cleared up the atmosphere and even though it failed to accomplish the results sought for it should prove a valuable lesson for guidance in future work i believe that mr edison's success as an experimenter was to a large extent due to this happy view of all experiments edison has frequently remarked that out of a hundred experiments he does not expect more than one to be successful and as to that one he is always suspicious until frequent repetition has verified the original results this patient optimistic view of the outcome of experiments has remained part of his character down to this day just as his painstaking minute incisive methods are still unchanged but to the careless stupid or lazy person he is a terror for the short time they remain around him honest mistakes may be tolerated but not carelessness incompetence or lack of attention to business in such cases edison is apt to express himself freely and forcibly as when he was asked why he had parted with a certain man he said oh he was so slow that it would take him half an hour to get out of the field of a microscope another instance will be illustrative soon after the brockton massachusetts central station was started in operation many years ago he wrote a note to mr w s andrews containing suggestions as to future stations part of which related to the various employees and their duties after outlining the duties of the meter man edison says i should not take too young a man for this say 
a man from twenty-three to thirty years old, bright and business-like, don't want any one who yearns to enter a laboratory and experiment. We have a bad case of that at Brockton. He neglects business to potter. What we want is a good lamp average and no unprofitable customer. You should have these men on probation and subject to passing an examination by me. This will wake them up. Edison's examinations are no joke, according to Mr. J. H. Vale, formerly one of the Menlo Park staff. I wanted a job, he said, and was ambitious to take charge of the dynamo room. Mr. Edison led me to a heap of junk in a corner and said, Put that together and let me know when it's running. I didn't know what it was, but received a liberal education in finding out. It proved to be a dynamo, which I finally succeeded in assembling and running. I got the job. Another man who succeeded in winning a place as an assistant was Mr. John F. Ott, who has remained in his employ for over forty years. In 1869, when Edison was occupying his first manufacturing shop, the third floor of a small building in Newark, he wanted a first-class mechanician, and Mr. Ott was sent to him. He was then an ordinary-looking young fellow, says Mr. Ott, dirty as any of the other workmen, unkempt, and not much better dressed than a tramp, but I immediately felt that there was a great deal in him. This is the conversation that ensued. Led by Mr. Edison's question, What do you want? Work. Can you make this machine work? Exhibiting it and explaining its details. Yes. Are you sure? Well, you needn't pay me if I don't. And thus Mr. Ott went to work and succeeded in accomplishing the results desired. Two weeks afterward Mr. Edison put him in charge of the shop. Edison's life fairly teems with instances of unruffled patience in the pursuit of experiments. When he feels thoroughly impressed with the possibility of accomplishing a certain thing, he will settle down composedly to investigate it to the end. This is well illustrated in a story relating to his invention of the type of storage battery bearing his name. Mr. W. S. Mallory, one of his closest associates for many years, is the authority for the following. When Mr. Edison decided to shut down the ore milling plant at Edison, New Jersey, in which I had been associated with him, it became a problem as to what he could profitably take up next, and we had several discussions about it. He finally thought that a good storage battery was a great requisite, and decided to try and devise a new type, for he declared emphatically he would make no battery requiring sulfuric acid. After a little thought he conceived the nickel-iron idea, and started to work at once with characteristic energy. About 7 or 7.30 a.m. he would go down to the laboratory and experiment, only stopping for a short time at noon to eat a lunch sent down from the house. About six o'clock the carriage would call to take him to dinner, from which he would return by seven-thirty or eight o'clock to resume work. The carriage came again at midnight to take him home, but frequently had to wait until two or three o'clock, and sometimes return without him, as he had decided to continue all night. This had been going on more than five months, seven days a week, when I was called down to the laboratory to see him. I found him at a bench about three feet wide and twelve to fifteen feet long, on which there were hundreds of little test cells that had been made up by his corps of chemists and experimenters. He was seated at this bench, testing, figuring, and planning. I then learned that he had thus made over nine thousand experiments in trying to devise this new type of storage battery, but had not produced a single thing that promised to solve the question. In view of this immense amount of thought and labor, my sympathy got the better of my judgment, and I said, isn't it a shame that with the tremendous amount of work you have done you haven't been able to get any results? Edison turned on me like a flash, and with a smile replied, Results? Why, man, I have gotten a lot of results. I know several thousand things that won't work. At that time he sent me out west on a special mission. On my return a few weeks later, his experiments had run up to over ten thousand, but he had discovered the missing link in the combination sought for. Of course, we all remember how the battery was completed and put on the market. Then, because he was dissatisfied with it, he stopped the sales and commenced a new line of investigation, which has recently culminated successfully. I shouldn't wonder if his experiments on the battery ran up pretty near to 50,000, for they fill more than 150 of the notebooks, to say nothing of some thousands of tests and curve sheets. Although Edison has an absolute disregard for the total outlay of money in investigation, he is particular to keep down the cost of individual experiments to a minimum, for, as he observed to one of his assistants, a good many inventors try to develop things life-size, and thus spend all their money, instead of first experimenting more freely on a small scale. To Edison, life is not only a grand opportunity to find out things by experiment, 
but, when found, to improve them by further experiment. One night, after receiving a satisfactory report of progress from Mr. Mason, superintendent of the cement plant, he said, the only way to keep ahead of the procession is to experiment. If you don't, the other fellow will. When there's no experimenting, there's no progress. Stop experimenting, and you go backward. If anything goes wrong, experiment until you get to the very bottom of the trouble. It is easy to realize, therefore, that a character so thoroughly permeated with these ideas is not apt to stop and figure out expense when in hot pursuit of some desired object. When that object has been attained, however, and it passes from the experimental to the commercial stage, Edison's monetary views again come into strong play. But they take a diametrically opposite position, for then he begins immediately to plan the extreme of economy in the production of the article. A thousand and one instances could be quoted in illustration, but as they would tend to change the form of this narrative into a history of economy and manufacture, it will suffice to mention but one, and that a recent occurrence, which serves to illustrate how closely he keeps in touch with everything, and also how the inventive faculty and instinct of commercial economy run close together. It was during Edison's winter stay in Florida, in March 1909. He had reports sent to him daily from various places, and studied them carefully, for he would write frequently with comments, instructions, and suggestions. And in one case, commenting on the oiling system at the cement plant, he wrote, "'Your oil losses are now getting lower, I see.' Then, after suggesting some changes to reduce them still further, he went on to say, Here is a chance to save a mill per barrel based on your regular daily output. This thorough consideration of the smallest detail is essentially characteristic of Edison, not only in economy of manufacture, but in all his work, no matter of what kind, whether it be experimenting, investigating, testing, or engineering. To follow him through the labyrinthine passages of investigation, contained in the great array of laboratory notebooks, is to become involved in a mass of minutely detailed researches, which seek to penetrate the inmost recesses of nature by an ultimate analysis of an infinite variety of parts. As the reader will obtain a fuller comprehension of this idea, and of Edison's methods, by concrete illustration rather than by generalization, the authors have thought it well to select at random two typical instances of specific investigations out of the thousands that are scattered through the notebooks. These will be found in the following extracts from one of the notebooks, and consist of Edison's instructions to be carried out in detail by his experimenters. Take, say, 25 pounds hard Cuban asphalt, and separate all the different hydrocarbons, etc., as far as possible by means of solvents. It will be necessary first to dissolve everything out by, say, hot turpentine, then successfully treat the residue with bisulfide carbon, benzol, ether, chloroform, naphtha, toluol, alcohol, and other probable solvents. After you can go no further, distill off all the solvents so the asphalt material has a tar-like consistency. Be sure all the ash is out of the turpentine portion. Now, after distilling the turpentine off, act on the residue with all the solvents that were used on the residue, using for the first the solvent which is least likely to dissolve a great part of it. By thus manipulating the various solvents, you will be enabled, probably, to separate the crude asphalt into several distinct hydrocarbons. Put each in a bottle after it has been dried, and label the bottle with the process, etc., so we may be able to duplicate it. Also give bottle a number, and describe everything fully in notebook. Destructively distill the following substances down to a point just short of carbonization, so that the residuum can be taken out of the retort, powdered, and acted on by all the solvents, just as the asphalt in previous page. The distillation should be carried to, say, 600 degrees or 700 degrees Fahrenheit, but not continued long enough to wholly reduce mass to charcoal, but always run to blackness. Separate the residuum in as many different parts as possible, bottle and label, and keep accurate records as to process, weights, etc., so a reproduction of the experiment can at any time be made. Gelatin, 4 pounds, asphalt, hard cuban, 10 pounds, coal tar or pitch, 10 pounds, wood pitch, 10 pounds, Syrian asphalt, 10 pounds, bituminous coal, 10 pounds, cane sugar, 10 pounds, glucose, 10 pounds, dextrin, 10 pounds, glycerin, 10 pounds, Tartaric acid, 5 pounds, gum guiac, 5 pounds, gum amber, 3 pounds, gum tragacanth, 3 pounds, aniline red, 1 pound, aniline oil, 1 pound, crude anthracene, 5 pounds, petroleum pitch, 10 pounds, albumin from eggs, 2 pounds, tar from passing chlorine through aniline oil, 2 pounds, citric acid, 5 pounds, 
sawdust of boxwood three pounds starch five pounds shellac three pounds gum arabic five pounds castor oil five pounds the empirical nature of his method will be apparent from an examination of the above items, but in pursuing it he leaves all uncertainty behind, and trusting nothing to theory he acquires absolute knowledge. Whatever may be the mental processes by which he arrives at the starting point of any specific line of research, the final results almost invariably prove that he does not plunge in at random. Indeed, as an old associate remarked, when Edison takes up any proposition in natural science, his perceptions seem to be elementally broad and analytical. That is to say, in addition to the knowledge he has acquired from books and observation, he appears to have an intuitive apprehension of the general order of things, as they might be supposed to exist in natural relation to each other. It has always seemed to me that he goes to the core of things at once. Although nothing less than results from actual experiments are acceptable to him as established facts, this view of Edison may also account for his peculiar and somewhat weird ability to guess correctly a faculty which has frequently enabled him to take shortcuts to lines of investigation whose outcome has verified, in a most remarkable degree, statements apparently made off-hand and without calculation. Mr. Upton says, One of the main impressions left upon me, after knowing Mr. Edison for many years, is the marvellous accuracy of his guesses. He will see the general nature of a result long before it can be reached by mathematical calculation. This was supplemented by one of his engineering staff, who remarked, Mr. Edison can guess better than a good many men can figure, and so far as my experience goes, I have found that he is almost invariably correct. His guess is more than a mere starting point, and often turns out to be this final solution of a problem. I can only account for it by his remarkable insight and wonderful natural sense of the proportion of things, in addition to which he seems to carry in his head determining factors of all kinds, and has the ability to apply them instantly in considering any mechanical problem. While this mysterious intuitive power has been of the greatest advantage in connection with the vast number of technical problems that have entered into his life work, there have been many remarkable instances in which it has seemed little less than prophecy, and it is deemed worth while to digress to the extent of relating two of them. One day, in the summer of 1881, when the incandescent lamp industry was still in swaddling clothes, Edison was seated in the room of Major Eaton, Vice President of the Edison Electric Light Company, talking over business matters, when Mr. Upton came in from the lamp factory at Menlo Park and said, "'Well, Mr. Edison, we completed a thousand lamps today.' Edison looked up and said, "'Good,' then relapsed into a thoughtful mood. In about two minutes he raised his head and said, "'Upton, in fifteen years you will be making forty thousand lamps a day.' None of those present ventured to make any remark on this assertion, although all felt that it was merely a random guess, based on the sanguine dream of an inventor." The business had not then really made a start, and being entirely new, was without precedent upon which to base any such statement, but as a matter of fact, the records of the lamp factory show that in 1896 its daily output of lamps was actually about 40,000. The other instance referred to occurred shortly after the Edison Machine Works was moved up to Schenectady in 1886. One day, when he was at the works, Edison sat down and wrote on a sheet of paper fifteen separate predictions of the growth and future of the electrical business. Notwithstanding the fact that the industry was then in an immature state, and that the great boom did not set in until a few years afterward, twelve of these predictions have been fully verified by the enormous growth and development in all branches of the art. What the explanation of this gift, power, or intuition may be is perhaps better left to the psychologist to speculate on. If one were to ask Edison, he would probably say, Hard work, not too much sleep, and free use of the imagination. Whether or not it would be possible for the average mortal to arrive at such perfection of guessing by faithfully following this formula, even reinforced by the Edison recipe for stimulating a slow imagination with pastry, is open for demonstration. Somewhat allied to this curious faculty is n another no less remarkable, and that is the ability to point out instantly an error in a mass of reported experimental results. While many instances could be definitely named, a typical one related by Mr. J. D. Flack, formerly master mechanic at the lamp factory, may be quoted. During the many years of lamp experimentation, batches of lamps were sent to the photometer department for test, and Edison would examine the tabulated test sheets. He ran over every item of the tabulations rapidly, and apparently without any calculation whatever, would check off errors as fast as he came to them, saying, You have made a mistake. Try this one over. 
In every case the second test proved that he was right. This wonderful aptitude for infallibly locating an error without an instant's hesitation for mental calculation has always appealed to me very forcibly. The ability to detect errors quickly in a series of experiments is one of the things that has enabled Edison to accomplish such a vast amount of work as the records show. Examples of the minuteness of detail into which his researches extend have already been mentioned, and as there are always a number of such investigations in progress at the laboratory, this ability stands Edison in good stead, for he is thus enabled to follow, and if necessary, correct each one, step by step. In this he is aided by the great powers of a mind that is able to free itself from absorbed concentration on the details of one problem, and instantly to shift over and become deeply and intelligently concentrated in another and entirely different one. For instance, he may have been busy for hours on chemical experiments and be called upon suddenly to determine some mechanical questions. The complete and easy transition is the constant wonder of his associates, for there is no confusion of ideas resulting from these quick changes, no hesitation or apparent effort, but a plunge into the midst of the new subject, and an instant acquaintance with all its details, as if he had been studying it for hours. A good stiff difficulty, one which may perhaps appear to be an unsurmountable obstacle, only serves to make Edison cheerful, and brings out variations of his methods in experimenting. Such an occurrence will start him thinking, which soon gives rise to a line of suggestions for approaching the trouble from various sides, or he will sit down and write out a series of eliminations, additions, or changes to be worked out and reported upon, with such variations as may suggest themselves during their progress. It is at such times as these that his unfailing patience and tremendous resourcefulness are in evidence. Ideas and expedients are poured forth in a torrent, and although some of them have temporarily appeared to the staff to be ridiculous or irrelevant, they have frequently turned out to be the ones leading to the correct solution of the trouble. Edison's inexhaustible resourcefulness and fertility of ideas have contributed largely to his great success, and have ever been a cause of amusement to those around him. Frequently, when it would seem to others that the extreme end of an apparently blind alley had been reached, and that it was impossible to proceed further, he has shown that there were several ways out of it, Examples without number could be quoted, but one must suffice by way of illustration. During the progress of the ore milling work at Edison, it became desirable to carry on a certain operation by some special machinery. He requested the proper person on his engineering staff to think this matter up and submit a few sketches of what he would propose to do. He brought three drawings to Edison, who examined them and said none of them would answer. The engineer remarked that it was too bad, for there was no other way to do it. Mr. Edison turned to him quickly and said, Do you mean to say that those drawings represent the only way to do this work? To which he received the reply, I certainly do. Edison said nothing. This happened on a Saturday. He followed his usual custom of spending Sunday at home in Orange. When he returned to the works on Monday morning, he took with him the sketches he had made, showing forty-eight other ways of accomplishing the desired operation, and laid them on the engineer's desk without a word. Subsequently, one of these ideas, with modifications suggested by some of the others, was put into successful practice. Difficulties seem to have a peculiar charm for Edison, whether they relate to large or small things, and although the larger matters have contributed most to the history of the arts, the same carefulness of thought has often been the means of leading to improvements of permanent advantage, even in minor details. For instance, in the very earliest days of electric lighting, the safe insulation of two bare wires fastened together was a serious problem that was solved by him. An iron pot over a fire, some insulating material melted therein, and narrow strips of linen drawn through it by means of a wooden clamp, furnished a readily applied and adhesive insulation, which was just as perfect for the purpose as the regular and now well-known insulating tape, of which it was the forerunner. Dubious results are not tolerated for a moment in Edison's experimental work. Rather than pass upon an uncertainty, the experiment will be dissected and checked minutely in order to obtain absolute knowledge pro and con. This searching method is followed not only in chemical or other investigations into which complexities might naturally enter, but also in more mechanical questions, where simplicity of construction might naturally seem to preclude possibilities of uncertainty. For instance, at the time when he was making strenuous endeavors to obtain copper wire of high conductivity, strict laboratory tests were made of samples sent by manufacturers. 
one of these samples tested out poorer than a previous lot furnished from the same factory. A report of this to Edison brought the following note. Perhaps the blank wire had a bad spot in it. Please cut it up into lengths and test each one and send results to me immediately. Possibly the electrical fraternity does not realize that this earnest work of Edison, twenty-eight years ago, resulted in the establishment of the high quality of copper wire that has been the recognized standard since that time. Says Edison on this point, I furnished the expert and apparatus to the Ansonia Brass and Copper Company in 1883, and he is there yet. It was this expert and this company who pioneered high-conductivity copper for the electrical trade. Nor is it generally appreciated in the industry that the adoption of what is now regarded as a most obvious proposition, the high-economy incandescent lamp, was the result of that characteristic foresight which there has been occasion to mention frequently in the course of this narrative, together with the courage and horse-sense which have always been displayed by the inventor in his persistent pushing out with far-reaching ideas in the face of pessimistic options. As is well known, the lamps of the first ten or twelve of years of incandescent lighting were of low economy, but had long life. Edison's study of the subject had led him to the conviction that the greatest growth of the electric lighting industry would be favored by a lamp taking less current, but having shorter, though commercially economical, life. And after gradually making improvements along this line, he developed finally a type of high economy lamp which would introduce a most radical change in existing conditions, and led ultimately to highly advantageous results. His start on this lamp, and an expressed desire to have it manufactured for regular use, filled even some of his business associates with dismay, for they could see nothing but disaster ahead in forcing such a lamp on the market. His persistence and profound conviction of the ultimate results were so strong and his arguments so sound, however, that the campaign was entered upon. Although it took two or three years to convince the public of the correctness of his views, the idea gradually took strong root, and has now become an integral principle of the business. In this connection it may be noted that with remarkable prescience Edison saw the coming of the modern lamps of today, which, by reason of their small consumption of energy to produce a given candle power, have dismayed central station managers. A few years ago a consumption of 3.1 watts per candle power might safely be assumed as an excellent average, and many stations fix their rates in business on such a basis. The results on income, when the consumption, as in the new metallic filament lamps, dropped to 1.25 watts per candle, can readily be imagined. Edison has insisted that central stations are selling light and not current, and he points to the predicament now confronting them as truth of his assertion that when selling light they share in all the benefits of improvement, but that when they sell current the consumer gets all those benefits without division. The dilemma is encountered by central stations in a bewildered way, as a novel and unexpected experience. But Edison foresaw the situation and warned against it long ago. It is one of the greatest gifts of statementship, to see new social problems years before they arise, and solve them in advance. It is one of the greatest attributes of invention to foresee and meet its own problems in exactly the same way. End of chapter 24 Recording by Col Chapter 25 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Your reader is Alec Datesman. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 25 the laboratory at Orange, and the staff. A living interrogation point, and a born investigator from childhood, Edison has never been without a laboratory of some kind for upward of half a century. In youthful years, as already described in this book, he became ardently interested in chemistry, and even at the early age of twelve felt the necessity for a special nook of his own where he could satisfy his unconvinced mind of the correctness or inaccuracy of statements and experiments contained in the few technical books then at his command. Ordinarily, he was like other normal lads of his age, 
full of boyish, hearty enjoyments, but withal possessed of an unquenchable spirit of inquiry and an insatiable desire for knowledge. Being blessed with a wise and discerning mother, his aspirations were encouraged, and he was allowed a corner in her cellar. It is fair to offer tribute here to her bravery as well as to her wisdom, for at times she was in mortal terror lest the precocious experimenter below should, in his inexperience, make some awful combination that would explode and bring down the house in ruins on himself and the rest of the family. Fortunately, no such catastrophe happened, but young Edison worked away in his embryonic laboratory, satisfying his soul and incidentally depleting his limited pocket money to the vanishing point. It was, indeed, owing to this latter circumstance, that in a year or two his aspirations necessitated an increase of revenue, and the consequent determination to earn some money for himself led to his first real commercial enterprise as Candy Butcher on the Grand Trunk Railroad, already mentioned in a previous chapter. It has also been related how his precious laboratory was transferred to the train, how he and it were subsequently expelled, and how it was re-established in his home, where he continued studies and experiments until the beginning of his career as a telegraph operator. The nomadic life of the next few years did not lessen his devotion to study, but it stood seriously in the way of satisfying the ever-present craving for a laboratory. The lack of such a place never prevented experimentation, however, as long as he had a dollar in his pocket and some available hole in the wall. With the turning of the tide of fortune that suddenly carried him in New York in 1869, from poverty to the opulence of three hundred dollars a month, he drew nearer to a realization of his cherished ambition in having money, place, and some time, stolen from sleep, for more serious experimenting. Thus, matters continued until, at about the age of twenty-two, Edison's inventions had bought him a relatively large sum of money, and he became a very busy manufacturer and a leasee of a large shop in Newark, New Jersey. Now, for the first time since leaving that boyish laboratory in the old home at Port Huron, Edison had a place of his own to work in, to think in, but no one in any way acquainted with Newark as a swarming center of miscellaneous and multitudinous industries would recommend it as a cloistered retreat for brooding reverie and introspection, favorable to creative effort. Some people revel in surroundings of hustle and bustle, and find therein no hindrance to great accomplishment. The electrical genius of Newark is Edward Weston who has thriven amid its turmoil, and there has developed his beautiful instruments of precision, just as Brush worked out his arc lighting system in Cleveland, or even as Faraday, surrounded by the din and roar of London, laid the intellectual foundations of the whole modern science of dynamic electricity. But Edison, though deaf, could not make too hurried a retreat from Newark to Menlo Park, where, as if to justify his change of base, vital inventions soon came thick and fast, year after year. The story of Menlo has been told in another chapter, but the point was not emphasized that Edison then, as later, tried hard to drop manufacturing. He would infinitely rather be philosopher than producer, but somehow the necessity of manufacturing is constantly thrust back upon him by a profound, perhaps finical, sense of dissatisfaction with what other people make for him. The world never saw a man more deeply and desperately convinced that nothing in it approaches perfection. Edison is the doctrine of evolution incarnate, applied to mechanics. As to the removal from Newark, he may be allowed to tell his own story. I had a shop at Newark in which I manufactured stock tickers and such things. When I moved to Menlo Park, I took out only the machinery that would be necessary for experimental purposes and left the manufacturing machinery in place. It consisted of many milling machines and other tools for duplicating. I rented this to a man who had formerly been my bookkeeper, who had thought he could make money out of manufacturing. There was about $10,000 worth of machinery. He was to pay me $2,000 a year for the rent of the machinery and keep it in good order. After I moved to Menlo Park, I was very busy with the telephone and phonograph, and I paid no attention to this little arrangement. About three years afterward, it occurred to me that I had not heard at all from the man who had rented this machinery so I thought I would go over to Newark and see how things were going. When I got there, I found that instead of being a machine shop, it was a hotel. I have since been utterly unable to find out what became of the man or the machinery. Such incidents tend to justify Edison in his rather cynical remark that he has always been able to improve machinery much quicker than men. All the way up he has had discouraging experiences, 
One day, while I was carrying on my work in Newark, a Wall Street broker came from the city and said he was tired of the street and wanted to go into something real. He said he had plenty of money. He wanted some kind of a job to keep his mind off Wall Street. So we gave him a job as a mucker in chemical experiments. The second night he was there, he could not stand the long hours and fell asleep on a sofa. One of the boys took a bottle of bromine and opened it under the sofa. It floated up and produced a violent effect on the mucous membrane. The broker was taken with such a fit of coughing, he burst a blood vessel, and the man who let the bromine out got away and never came back. I suppose he thought there was going to be a death, but the broker lived and left the next day, and I have never seen him since, either. Edison tells also of another foolhardy laboratory trick of the same kind. Some of my assistants in those days were very green in the business, as I did not care whether they had any experience or not. I generally tried to turn them loose. One day I got a new man and told him to conduct a certain experiment. He got a quart of ether and started to boil it over a naked flame. Of course it caught fire. The flame was about four feet in diameter and eleven feet high. We had to call out the fire department, and they came down and put a stream through the window. That let all the fumes and chemicals out and overcame the firemen, and there was the devil to pay. Another time we experimented with a tub full of soapy water and put hydrogen into it to make large bubbles. One of the boys, who was washing bottles in the place, had read in some book that hydrogen was explosive, so he proceeded to blow the tub up. There was about four inches of soap in the bottom of the tub, fourteen inches high, and he filled it with soap bubbles up to the brim. Then he took a bamboo fish pole, put a piece of paper at the end, and touched it off. It blew every window out of the place. Always a shrewd, observant, and kindly critic of character, Ederson tells many anecdotes of the men who gathered around him in various capacities at that quiet corner of New Jersey, Menlo Park, and later at Orange, in the Llewellyn Park Laboratory, and these serve to supplement the main narrative by throwing vivid sidelights on the whole scene. Here, for example, is a picture drawn by Edison of a laboratory interlude, just a bit Rabelaisian. When experimenting at Menlo Park, we had all the way from forty to fifty men. They worked all the time. Each man was allowed from four to six hours sleep. We had a man who kept tally, and when the time came for one to sleep, he was notified. At midnight, we had lunch brought in and served at a long table in which the experimenters sat down. I also had an organ which I procured from Hillborn Roosevelt, uncle of the ex-president, and we had a man play this organ while we ate our lunch. During the summertime, after we had made something which was successful, I used to engage a brick sloop at Perth Amboy and take the whole crowd down to the fishing banks on the Atlantic for two days. On one occasion, we got outside Sandy Hook on the banks and anchored. A breeze came up, the sea became rough, and a large number of the men were sick. There was straw in the bottom of the boat, which we all slept on. Most of the men adjourned to this straw very sick. Those who were not got a piece of rancid salt pork from the skipper and cut a large thick slice out of it. This was put on the end of a fish hook and drawn across the men's faces. The smell was terrific, and the effect added to the hilarity of the excursion. I went down once with my father and two assistants for a little fishing inside Sandy Hook. For some reason or other, the fishing was very poor. We anchored, and I started in to fish. After fishing for several hours, there was not a single bite. The others wanted to pull up anchor, but I fished two days and two nights without a bite, until they pulled up anchor and went away. I would not give up. I was going to catch that fish if it took a week. This is general. Let us quote one or two piquant personal observations of a more specific nature as to the odd characters Edison drew around him in his experimenting. Down at Menlo Park, a man came in one day and wanted a job. He was a sailor. I hadn't any particular work to give him, but I had a number of small induction coils, and to give him something to do, I told him to fix them up and sell them among his sailor friends. They were fixed up, and he went over to New York and sold them all. He was an extraordinary fellow. His name was Adams. One day I asked him how long it was since he had been to sea, and he replied two or three years. I asked him how he had made a living in the meantime before he came to Menlo Park. He said he made a pretty good living by going around to different clinics and getting ten dollars at each clinic because of having the worst case of heart disease on record. I told him if that was the case, he would have to be very careful around the laboratory. I had him there to help in experimenting, and the heart disease did not seem to bother him at all. It appeared that he had once been a slaver, and although he was a tough character, 
Having no other man I could spare at that time, I sent him over with my carbon transmitter telephone to exhibit it in England. It was exhibited before the post office authorities. Professor Hughes spent an afternoon in examining the apparatus, and in about a month came out with his microphone, which was absolutely nothing more nor less than my exact invention. But no mention was made of the fact that, just previously, he had seen the whole of my apparatus. Adams stayed over in Europe connected with the telephone for several years, and finally died of too much whiskey, but not of heart disease. This shows how whiskey is the more dangerous of the two. Adams said that at one time he was aboard a coffee ship in the harbor of Santos, Brazil. He fell down a hatchway and broke his arm. They took him up to the hospital, a Portuguese one, where he could not speak the language, and they did not understand English. They treated him for two weeks for yellow fever. He was certainly the most profane man we ever had around the laboratory. He stood high in his class. And there were others of a different stripe. We had a man with us at Menlo Park called Segredor. He was a queer kind of fellow. The men got in the habit of plaguing him, and, finally, one day he said to the assembled experimenters in the top room of the laboratory, The next man that does it, I will kill him. They paid no attention to this, and next day one of them made some sarcastic remark to him. Segredor made a start for his boarding house, and when they saw him coming back up the hill with a gun, they knew there would be trouble. So they all made for the woods. One of the men went back and mollified him. He returned to his work, but he was not teased any more. At last, when I sent men out hunting for bamboo, I dispatched Segregor to Cuba. He arrived in Havana on Tuesday, and on the Friday following he was buried, having died of the black vomit. On the receipt of the news of his death, half a dozen of the men wanted his job, but my searcher in the Astor Library reported that the chances of finding the right kind of bamboo for lamps in Cuba were very small, so I did not send a substitute. Another thumbnail sketch made of one of his associates is this. When experimenting with vacuum pumps to exhaust the incandescent lamps, I required some very delicate and close manipulation of glass, and hired a German glass blower who was said to be the most expert man of his kind in the United States. He was the only one who could make clinical thermometers. He was the most extraordinarily conceited man I have ever come across. His conceit was so enormous, life was made a burden to him by all the boys around the laboratory. He once said that he was educated in a university where all the students belonged to families of the aristocracy, and the highest class in the university all wore little red caps. He said he wore one. Of somewhat different caliber was honest John Cruisi, who first made his mark at Menlo Park, and of whom Edison says, One of the workmen I had at Menlo Park was John Cruisi, who afterward became, from his experience, engineer of the lighting station, and subsequently engineer of the Edison General Electric Works at Schenectady. Cruisi was very exact in his expressions. At the time we were promoting and putting up electric light stations in Pennsylvania, New York, and New England, there would be delegations of different people who proposed pay for these stations. They would come to our office in New York at 65 to talk over the specifications, the cost, and other things. At first, Mr. Cruisi was brought in, but whenever a statement was made which he could not understand or did not believe could be substantiated, he would blurt right out among these prospects that he didn't believe it. Finally, it disturbed these committees so much and raised so many doubts in their minds that one of my chief associates said, Here, Carisi, we don't want you to come to these meetings any longer. You are too painfully honest. I said to him, We always tell the truth. It may be deferred truth, but it is the truth. He could not understand that. Various reasons conspired to cause the departure from Menlo Park midway in the 80s. For Edison, in spite of the achievement with which its name will forever be connected, it had lost all its attractions and all its possibilities. It had been outgrown in many ways, and straight as the remark may seem, it was not until he had left it behind and had settled in Orange, New Jersey, that he could be said to have given definite shape to his life. He was only forty in 1887, and all that he had done up to that time tremendous as much of it was, had worn a haphazard bohemian air, with all the inconsequential freedom and crudeness somehow attaching to pioneer life. The development of the new laboratory in West Orange, just at the foot of Llewellyn Park, on the Orange Mountains, not only marked the happy beginning of a period of perfect domestic and family life, but saw in the planning and equipment of a model laboratory plant the consummation of youthful dreams, and of the keen desire to enjoy resources adequate at any moment to whatever strain the fierce fervor of research might put upon them. Curiously enough, 
While hitherto Edison had sought to dissociate his experimenting from his manufacturing, here he determined to develop a large industry, to which a thoroughly practical laboratory would be a central feature, and ever a source of suggestion and inspiration. Edison's standpoint today is that an evil to be dreaded in manufacture is that of over-standardization, and that as soon as an article is perfect, that is the time to begin improving it, but he who would improve must experiment. The Orange Laboratory, as originally planned, consisted of a main building 250 feet long and three stories in height, together with four other structures, each 100 by 25 feet and only one story in height. All these were substantially built of brick. The main building was divided into five chief divisions, the library, office, machine shops, experimental and chemical rooms, and stock room. The use of the smaller buildings will be presently indicated. Surrounding the hall was erected a high picket fence with a gate placed on Valley Road. At this point, a gatehouse was provided and put in charge of a keeper. For then, as at the present time, Edison was greatly sought after, and, in order to accomplish any work at all, he was obliged to deny himself to all but the most important callers. The keeper of the gate was usually chosen with reference to his capacity for stony-hearted implacability and adherence to instructions, and this choice was admirably made in one instance when a new gateman, not yet thoroughly initiated, refused admittance to Edison himself. It was of no use to try and explain. To the gateman, everyone was persona non grata without proper credentials, and Edison had to wait outside until he could get someone to identify him. On entering the main building, the first doorway from the ample passage leads the visitor into a handsome library, finished throughout in yellow pine, occupying the entire width of the building, and almost as broad as long. The center of this spacious room is an open rectangular space, about forty by twenty-five feet, rising clear about forty feet from the main floor to a paneled ceiling. Around the sides of the room, bounding this open space, run two tiers of gallery, divided as is the main floor beneath them, into alcoves of liberal dimensions. These alcoves are formed by racks extending from floor to ceiling, fitted with shelves except on two sides of both galleries, where they are formed by a series of glass-fronted cabinets containing extensive collections of curious and beautiful mineralogical and geological specimens, among which is the notable Tiffany Kunz collection of minerals acquired by Edison some years ago. Here and there in these cabinets may also be found a few models which he has used at times in his studies of anatomy and physiology. The shelves on the remainder of the upper gallery and part of those on the first gallery are filled with countless thousands of specimens of ores and minerals of every conceivable kind gathered from all parts of the world, and all tagged and numbered. The remaining shelves of the first gallery are filled with current numbers, and some back numbers, of the numerous periodicals to which Edison subscribes. Here may be found the popular magazines, together with those of a technical nature relating to electricity, chemistry, engineering, mechanics, building, cement, building materials, drugs, water and gas, power, automobiles, railroads, aeronautics, physiology, philosophy, hygiene, physics, telegraphy, mining, metallurgy, metals, music, and others. Also theatrical weeklies, as well as the proceedings and transactions of various learned and technical societies. The first impression received as one enters on the main floor of the library and looks around is that of noble proportions and symmetry as a whole. The open central space of liberal dimensions and height, flanked by the galleries and relieved by four handsome electric lighting fixtures suspended from the ceiling by long chains, conveys an idea of lofty spaciousness, while the huge open fireplace, surmounted by a great clock built into the wall at one end of the room, the large rugs, the armchairs scattered around, the tables and chairs in the alcoves, give a general air of comfort combined with utility. In one of the larger alcoves, at the sunny end of the main hall, is Edison's own desk, where he may usually be seen for a while in the early morning hours, looking over his mail or otherwise busily working on matters requiring his attention. At the opposite end of the room, not far from the open fireplace, is a long table surrounded by swivel desk chairs. It is here that directors' meetings are sometimes held, and also where weighty matters are often discussed by Edison at conference with his closer associates. It has been the privilege of the writers to be present at some of these conferences, not only as participants, but in some cases as lookers-on while awaiting their turn. 
On such occasions, an interesting opportunity is afforded to study Edison in his intense and constructive moods. Apparently oblivious to everything else, he will listen with concentrated mind and close attention, and then pour forth a perfect torrent of ideas and plans, and, if the occasion calls for it, will turn around to the table, seize a writing pad, and make sketch after sketch with lightning-like rapidity, tearing off each sheet as filled and tossing it aside to the floor. It is an ordinary indication that there has been an interesting meeting when the caretaker about fills a wastebasket with these discarded sketches. Directly opposite the main door is a beautiful marble statue purchased by Edison at the Paris Exposition in 1889, on the occasion of his visit there. The statue, mounted on a base three feet high, is an allegorical representation of the supremacy of electric light over all other forms of illumination, carried out by the life-size figure of a youth with half-spread wings, seated upon the ruins of a street gas lamp, holding triumphantly high above his head an electric incandescent lamp. Grouped about his feet are a gear wheel, voltaic pile, telegraph key, and telephone. This work of art was executed by A. Bordiga of Rome and held a prominent place in the department devoted to Italian art at the Paris Exposition and naturally appealed to Edison as soon as he saw it. In the middle distance, between the entrance door and this statue, has long stood a magnificent palm, but at the present writing it has been set aside to give place to a fine model of the first type of the Edison poured cement house, which stands in a miniature artificial lawn upon a special table prepared for it, while on the floor at the foot of the table are specimens of the full-size molds in which the house will be cast. The balustrades of the galleries and all other available places are filled with portraits of great scientists and men of achievement, as well as with pictures of historic and scientific interest. Over the fireplace hangs a large photograph showing the Edison cement plant in its entire length, flanked on one end of the mantel by a boast of Humboldt, and on the other by a statuette of Sandow, the latter having been presented to Edison by the celebrated athlete after a visit he made to Orange to pose for the motion pictures in the earliest days of their development. While looking up under the second gallery at the end is seen a great roll resting in sockets placed on each side of the room. There is a huge screen or curtain which may be drawn down to the floor to provide a means of projection for lantern slides or motion pictures, for the entertainment or instruction of Edison and his guests. In one of the larger alcoves is a large terrestrial globe pivoted in its special stand together with a relief map of the United States, and here and there are handsomely mounted specimens of underground conductors and electric wells that were made at the Edison machine works at Schenectady before it was merged into the General Electric Company. On two pedestals stand, respectively, two other mementos of the works one a fifteen-light dynamo of the Edison type, and the other an elaborate electric fan, both of them gifts from associates or employees. In noting these various objects of interest, one must not lose sight of the fact that this part of the building is primarily a library, if indeed that fact did not at once impress itself by a glance at the well-filled, unglazed bookshelves in the alcoves of the main floor. Here Edison's Catholic taste in reading becomes apparent, as one scans the titles of thousands of volumes ranged upon the shelves, for they include astronomy, botany, chemistry, dynamics, electricity, engineering, forestry, geology, geography, mechanics, mining, medicine, metallurgy, magnetism, philosophy, psychology, physics, steam, steam engines, telegraphy, telephony, and many others. Besides these, there are the journals and proceedings of numerous technical societies, encyclopedias of various kinds, bound series of important technical magazines, a collection of United States and foreign patents embracing some hundreds of volumes, together with an extensive assortment of miscellaneous books of special and general interest. There is another big library up in the house on the hill. In fact, there are books upon books all over the home, and wherever they are, those books are read. As one is about to pass out of the library, attention is arrested by an incongruity in the form of a cot, which stands in an alcove near the door. Here Edison, throwing himself down, sometimes seeks a short rest during specially long working tours. Sleep is practically instantaneous and profound, and he awakes in immediate and full possession of his faculties, arising from the cot and going directly back to the job without a moment's hesitation just as a person wide awake would arise from a chair and proceed to attend to something previously determined upon. 
Immediately outside the library is the famous stock room, about which much has been written and invented. Its fame arose from the fact that Edison planned it to be a repository of some quantity, great or small, of every known and possibly useful substance not readily perishable, together with the most complete assortment of chemicals and drugs that experience and knowledge could suggest. Always strenuous in his experimentation, and the living embodiment of the spirit of the song, I want what I want when I want it, Edison had known for years what it was to be obliged to wait, and sometimes lack for some substance or chemical that he thought necessary to the success of an experiment. Naturally impatient at any delay, which interposed in his insistent and searching methods, and realizing the necessity of maintaining the inspiration attending his work at any time, he determined to have within his immediate reach the natural resources of the world. Hence it is not surprising to find the stockroom not only a museum, but a sample room of nature, as well as a supply department. To a casual visitor the first view of this heterogeneous collection is quite bewildering, but on more mature examination it resolves itself into a natural classification, as, for instance, objects pertaining to various animals, birds, and fishes, such as skins, hides, hair, fur, feathers, wool, quills, down, bristles, teeth, bones, hoofs, horns, tusks, shells, natural products, such as woods, barks, roots, leaves, nuts, seeds, herbs, gums, grains, flowers, meals, bran, also minerals in great assortment, mineral and vegetable oils, clay, mica, ozokirite, etc. In the line of textiles, cotton and silk threads in great variety, with woven goods of all kinds, from cheesecloth to silk plush. As for paper, there is everything in white and colored, from thinnest tissue up to the heaviest asbestos, even a few newspapers always being on hand. Twines of all sizes, inks, waxes, cork, tar, resin, pitch, turpentine, asphalt, plumbago, glass in sheets and tubes, and a host of miscellaneous articles revealed on looking around the shelves, as well as an interminable collection of chemicals, including acids, alkalis, salts, regents, every conceivable essential oil, and all the thinkable extracts. It may be remarked that this collection includes the 1,800 or more fluorescent salts made by Edison during his experimental search for the best material for a fluoroscope in the initial X-ray period. All known metals in form of sheet, rod, and tube, and of great variety and thickness, are here found also, together with a most complete assortment of tools and accessories for machine shop and laboratory work. The list is confined to the merest general mention of the scope of this remarkable and interesting collection, and specific details which stretch out into a catalog of no small proportions. When it is stated, however, that a stock clerk is kept exceedingly busy all day answering the numerous and various demands upon him, the reader will appreciate that this comprehensive assortment is not merely a fad of Edison's, but stands rather as a substantial tribute to his wide-angled view of possible requirements as his various investigations take him far afield. It has no counterpart in the world. Beyond the stock room and occupying about half the building on the same floor lie a machine shop, engine room, and boiler room. This machine shop is well equipped, and in it is constantly employed a large force of mechanics, whose time is occupied in constructing the heavier class of models and mechanical devices called for by the varied experiments and inventions always going on. Immediately above, on the second floor, is found another machine shop in which is maintained a core of expert mechanics who are called upon to do work of greater precision and fineness in the construction of tools and experimental models. This is the realm presided over lovingly by John F. Ott, who has been Edison's designer of mechanical devices for over forty years. He still continues to ply his craft with unabated skill and oversees the work of the mechanics as his productions are wrought into concrete shape. In one of the many experimental rooms lining the sides of the second floor may usually be seen his younger brother, Fred Ott, whose skill as a dexterous manipulator and ingenious mechanic has found ample scope for exercise during the thirty-two years of his service with Edison, not only at the regular laboratories, but also at that connected with the inventor's winter home in Florida. Still another of the Ott family, the son of John F., for some years past, has been on the experimental staff of the Orange Laboratory. Although possessing in no small degree the mechanical and manipulative skill of the family, he has chosen chemistry as his special domain, 
and may be found with the other chemists in one of the chemical rooms. On this same floor is the vacuum pump room with a glass blower's room adjoining, both of them historic by reason of the strenuous work done on incandescent lamps and x-ray tubes within their walls. The tools and appliances are kept intact, for Edison calls occasionally for their use in some of his later experiments, and there is a suspicion among the laboratory staff that someday he may resume work on incandescent lamps. Adjacent to these rooms are several others devoted to physical and mechanical experiments, together with a drafting room. Last to be mentioned, but the first in order as one leaves the head of the stairs leading up to this floor, is number 12, Edison's favorite room, where he will frequently be found. Plain of aspect, being merely a space boarded off with tongued and grooved planks, as all the other rooms are, without ornament or floor covering, and containing only a few articles of cheap furniture, this room seems to exercise a nameless charm for him. The door is always open, and often he could be seen seated at a plain table in the center of the room, deeply intent on some of the numerous problems in which he is interested. The table is usually pretty well filled with specimens or data of experimental results, which have been put there for his examination. At the time of this writing, these specimens consist largely of sections of positive elements of the storage battery, together with many samples of nickel hydrate, to which Edison devotes deep study. Close at hand is a microscope, which is in frequent use by him in these investigations. Around the room, on shelves, are hundreds of bottles, each containing a small quantity of nickel hydrate, made in as many different ways, each labeled correspondingly. Always at hand will be found one or two of the laboratory notebooks, with frequent entries or comments in the handwriting, which once seen is never forgotten. Number 12 is at times a chemical, a physical, or a mechanical room, occasionally a combination of all, while sometimes it might be called a consultation room or a clinic. For often Edison may be seen there in animated conference with a group of his assistants, but its chief distinction lies in its being one of his favorite haunts, and in the fact that within its walls have been settled many of the perplexing problems and momentous questions that have brought about great changes in electrical and engineering arts during the twenty-odd years that have elapsed since the Orange Laboratory was built. Passing now to the top floor, the visitor finds himself at the head of a broad hall, running almost the entire length of the building, and lined mostly with glass-fronted cabinets containing a multitude of experimental incandescent lamps, and an immense variety of models of phonographs, motors, telegraph and telephone apparatus, meters, and a host of other inventions upon which Edison's energies have at one time and another been bent. Here also are other cabinets containing old papers and records, while further along the wall are piled up boxes of historical models and instruments. In fact, this hallway, with its conglomerate contents, may well be considered a scientific attic. It is hoped that at no distant day these Edisoniana will be assembled and arranged in a fireproof museum for the benefit of posterity. In the front end of the building, and extending over a library, is a large room intended originally and used for a time as the phonograph music hall for record making, but now used only as an experimental room for phonograph work, as the growth of the industry has necessitated a very much larger and more central place where records can be made on a commercial scale. Even the experimental work imposes no slight burden on it. On each side of the hallway above mentioned, rooms are partitioned off and used for experimental work of various kinds, mostly phonographic, although on this floor are also located the storage battery testing room, a chemical and physical room, and Edison's private office, where all his personal correspondence and business affairs are conducted by his personal secretary, Mr. H. F. Miller. A visitor to this floor of the laboratory building cannot but be impressed with the consciousness of the incessant efforts that are being made to improve the reproducing qualities of the phonograph, as he hears from all sides the sounds of vocal and instrumental music constantly varying in volume and timbre due to changes in the experimental devices under trial. The traditions of the laboratory include cots placed in many of the rooms of these upper floors, but that was in the earlier years, when the strenuous scenes of Menlo Park were repeated in the new quarters. Edison and his closest associates were, accustomed to carry their labors far into the wee small hours, and when physical nature demanded a respite from work, a short rest would be obtained by going to bed on a cot. One would naturally think that the wear and tear of this intense application, day after day and night after night, would have tended to induce a heaviness and gravity of demeanor in these busy men. But on the contrary, the old spirit of good humor and prankishness was ever present, as its frequent outbursts manifested from time to time.
one instance will serve as an illustration. One morning, about 2.30, the late Charles Batchelor announced that he was tired and would go to bed. Leaving Edison and the others busily working, he went out and returned quietly in slippered feet, with his nightgown on, the handle of a feather duster stuck down his back with the feathers waving over his head, and his face marked. With unearthly howls and shrieks, a uh, Leninian, he practiced about the room, incidentally giving Edison a scare that made him jump from his work. He saw the joke quickly, however, and joined in the general merriment caused by this prank. Leaving the main building with its core of busy experimenters, and coming out into the spacious yard, one notes the four long, single-story brick structures mentioned above. The one nearest the valley road is called the galvanometer room, and it was originally intended by Edison to be used for the most delicate and minute electrical measurements. In order to provide rigid resting places for the numerous and elaborate instruments he had purchased for this purpose, the building was equipped along three-quarters of its length with solid pillars, or tables, of bricks set deep in the earth. These were built up to a height of about two and a half feet, and each was surmounted with a single heavy slab of black marble. A cement floor was laid, and every precaution was taken to render the building free from all magnetic influences, so that it would be suitable for electrical work of the utmost accuracy and precision. Hence, iron and steel were entirely eliminated in its construction, copper being used for fixtures for steam and water piping, and indeed for all other purposes where metal was employed. This room was for many years the headquarters of Edison's able assistant, Dr. A. E. Kennelly, now professor of electrical engineering in Harvard University, to whose energetic and capable management were entrusted many scientific investigations during his long sojourn at the laboratory. Unfortunately, however, for the continued success of Edison's elaborate plans, he had not been many years established in the laboratory before a trolley road through West Orange was projected and built, a line passing through the plant and within 75 feet of the galvanometer room thus making it practically impossible to use it for the delicate purposes for which it was originally intended. For some time past it has been used for photography and some special experiments on motion pictures, as well as for demonstrations connected with physical research, but some reminders of its old-time glory still remain in evidence. In lofty and capacious glass-enclosed cabinets, in company with numerous models of Edison's inventions, repose many of the costly and elaborate instruments rendered useless by the ubiquitous trolley, Instruments are all about, on walls, tables, on shelves, the photometer is covered up, induction coils of various capacities, with other electrical paraphernalia, lie around, almost as if the experimenter were absent for a few days, but would soon return and resume his work. In numbering the group of buildings, the galvanometer room is number one, while the other single-story structures are numbered respectively two, three, and four. On passing out of number one, and proceeding to the succeeding building is noticed, between the two, a garage of ample dimensions and a smaller structure, at the door of which stands a concrete mixer. In this small building, Edison has made some of his most important experiments in the process of working out his plans for the poured house. It is in this little place that there was developed the remarkable mixture which is to play so vital a part in the successful construction of these everlasting homes for living millions. Drawing near to building two, olfactory evidence presents itself of the immediate vicinity of a chemical laboratory. This is confirmed as one enters the door and finds that the entire building is devoted to chemistry. Long rows of shelves and cabinets filled with chemicals line the room, a profusion of retorts, alembics, filters, and other chemical apparatus on numerous tables and stands greet the eye, while a corps of experimenters may be seen busy in the preparation of various combinations, some of which are boiling or otherwise cooking under their dexterous manipulation. It would not require many visits to discover that in this room, also, Edison has a favorite nook. Down at the far end in a corner are a plain little table and chair, and here he is often to be found deeply immersed in a study of the many experiments that are being conducted. Not infrequently, he is actively engaged in the manipulation of some compound of special intricacy, whose results might be illuminative of obscure facts not patent to others than himself. Here, too, is a select little library of chemical literature. The next building, number three, has a double mission, the father half being partitioned off for a pattern making shop, while the other half is used as a storeroom for chemicals in quantity and for chemical apparatus and utensils. A grimly humorous incident, as related by one of the laboratory staff, attaches to number three. It seems that some time ago, one of the helpers in the chemical department, an excitable foreigner, 
became dissatisfied with his wages, and after making an unsuccessful application for an increase, rushed in desperation to Edison and said, F, I not get more money. I go to take the cyanide potassia. Edison gave him one quick searching glance and, detecting a bluff, replied in an offhand manner, there is a five-pound bottle in number three, and turned to his work again. The foreigner did not go to get the cyanide, but gave up his job. The last of these original buildings, number four, was used for many years in Edison's ore concentrating experiments, and also for rough-and-ready operations of other kinds, such as furnace work and the like. At the present writing, it is used as a general stockroom. In the foregoing details, the reader has been afforded but a passing glance at the great practical working equipment which constitutes the theater of Edison's activities, for, in taking a general view of such a unique and comprehensive laboratory plant, its salient features only can be touched upon to advantage. It would be but repetition to enumerate here the practical results of the laboratory work during the past two decades, as they appear on other pages of this work, nor can one assume for a moment that the history of Edison's laboratory is a closed book. On the contrary, its territorial boundaries have been increasing step by step with the enlargement of its labors. Until now, it has been obliged to go outside its own proper domains to occupy some space in and about the great Edison industrial buildings and space immediately adjacent. It must be borne in mind that the laboratory is only the core of a group of buildings devoted to the production on a huge scale by hundreds of artisans. Incidental mention has already been made of the laboratory at Edison's winter residence in Florida, where he goes annually to spend a month or six weeks. This is a miniature copy of the Orange Laboratory, with its machine shop, chemical room, and general experimental department. While it is only in use during his sojourn there, and carries no extensive corps of assistance, the work done in it is not of a perfunctory nature, but is a continuation of his regular activities, and serves to keep him in touch with the progress of experiments at Orange, and enables him to give instructions for their variation and continuance, as their scope is expanded by his own investigations made while enjoying what he calls vacation. What Edison in Florida speaks of as loafing would be for most of us extreme and healthy activity in the cooler far north. A word or two may be devoted to the visitors received at the laboratory and to the correspondence. It might be injudicious to gauge the greatness of a man by the number of his callers or his letters, but they are at least an indication of the degree to which he interests the world. In both respects, for these forty years, Edison has been a striking example of the manner in which the sentiment of hero worship can manifest itself, and of the deep desire of curiosity to get satisfaction by personal observation or contact. Edison's mail, like that of most well-known men, is extremely large, but composed in no small degree of letters, thousands of them yearly, that concern only the writers, and might well go to the waste paper basket without prolonged consideration. The serious and important part of the mail, some personal and some business, occupies the attention of several men, all such letters finding their way promptly into the proper channels, often with a pithy endorsement by Edison scribbled on the margin. What to do with a host of others it is often difficult to decide, even when written by cranks, who imagine themselves subject to strange electrical ailments from which Edison alone can relieve them. Many people write asking his opinion as to a certain invention, or offering him an interest in it if he will work it out. Other people abroad ask his help in locating lost relatives, and many want advice as to what they shall do with their sons, frequently budding geniuses whose ability to wire a bell has demonstrated unusual qualities. A great many persons want autographs, and some would like photographs. The amazing thing about it all is that this flood of miscellaneous letters flows on in one steady, uninterrupted stream, year in and year out. Always a curious psychological study in its variety and volume, and ever a proof of the fact that once a man has become established as a personality in the public eye and mind, nothing can stop the tide of correspondence that will deluge him. It is generally in the nature of things easier to write a letter than to make a call, and the semi-retirement of Edison at a distance of an hour by train from New York stands as a means of protection to him against those who would certainly present their respects in person, if he could be got at without trouble. But it may be less time-consuming than his epistolary besiegers. It is the common experience of any visitor to the laboratory that there are usually several persons ahead of him, no matter what the hour of the day, and some whose business has been sufficiently vital to get them inside the porter's gate, or even into the big library and lounging room. Celebrities of all kinds and distinguished foreigners are numerous, princes, noblemen, ambassadors, artists, 
literateurs, scientists, financiers, women. A very large part of the visiting is done by scientific bodies and societies, and then the whole place will be turned over to hundreds of eager, well-dressed men and women, anxious to see everything and to be photographed in the big courtyard around the central hero. Nor are these groups and delegations limited to this country, for even large parties of English, Dutch, Italian, or Japanese visitors come from time to time and are greeted with the same ready hospitality, although Edison, it is easy to see, is torn between the conflicting emotions of a desire to be courteous and an anxiety to guard the precious hours of work or watch the critical stage of a new experiment. One distinct group of visitors has always been constituted by the newspaper men. Hardly a day goes by that the journals do not contain some reference to Edison's work or remarks, and the items are generally based on an interview. The reporters are never away from the laboratory very long, for if they have no actual mission of inquiry, there is always the chance of a good story being secured offhand, and the easy, inveterate good nature of Edison toward reporters is proverbial in the craft. Indeed, it must be stated here that once in a while this confidence has been abused, that stories have been published utterly without foundation, that interviews have been printed which never took place, that articles with Edison's name as author have been widely circulated, although he never saw them, and that in such ways he has suffered directly. But such occasional incidents tend in no wise to lessen Edison's warm admiration of the press or his readiness to avail himself of it whenever a representative goes over to Orange to get the truth or the real facts in regard to any matter of public importance. As for the newspaper clippings containing such articles, or others in which Edison's name appears, they are literally like sands of the seashore for number, and the archives of the laboratory that preserve only a very minute percentage of them are a further demonstration of what publicity means when a figure like Edison is concerned. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heidi Preuss. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. CHAPTER Twenty Six, EDISON IN COMMERCE AND MANUFACTURE An applicant for membership in the Engineers Club of Philadelphia is required to give a brief statement of the professional work he has done. Some years ago, a certain application was made, and contained the following terse and modest sentence. I have designed a concentrating plant, and built a machine shop, etc., etc. Thomas A. Edison. Although in the foregoing pages the reader has been made acquainted with the tremendous import of the actualities lying behind those etc., etc., the narrative up to this point has revealed Edison chiefly in the light of inventor, experimenter, and investigator. There have been some side glimpses of the industries he has set on foot, and of their financial aspects, and a later chapter will endeavor to sum up the intrinsic value of Edison's work to the world. But there are some other interesting points that may be touched on now in regard to a few of Edison's financial and commercial ventures not generally known or appreciated. It is a popular idea, founded on experience, that an inventor is not usually a businessman. One of the exceptions, proving the rule, may perhaps be met in Edison, though all depends on the point of view. All his life he has made a great deal to do with finance and commerce, and, as one looks at the magnitude of the vast industries he has helped to create, it would not be at all unreasonable to expect him to be among the multimillionaires. That he is not is due to the absence of certain qualities, the lack of which Edison is himself the first to admit. Those qualities may not be amiable, 
but great wealth is hardly ever accumulated without them. If he had not been so intent on inventing, he would have made more of his great opportunities for getting rich. If this utter detachment from any love of money for its own sake has not already been illustrated in some of the incidents narrated, one or two stories are available to emphasize the point. They do not involve any want of the higher business acumen that goes to the proper conduct of affairs. It was said of Gladstone that he was the greatest Chancellor of the Exchequer England ever saw, but that as a retail merchant he would soon have ruined himself by his bookkeeping. Edison confesses that he has never made a cent out of his patents in electric light and power. In fact, that they have been an expense to him, and thus a free gift to the world. See footnote 18. Footnote 18. Edison received some stock for the parent lighting company, but as the capital stock of that company was increased from time to time, his proportion grew smaller, and he ultimately used it to obtain ready money with which to create and finance the various shops in which were manufactured the various items of electric lighting apparatus necessary to exploit his system. Besides, he was obligated to raise additional large sums of money from other sources for this purpose. He thus became a manufacturer with capital raised by himself, and the stock that he received later, on the formation of the General Electric Company, was not for his electric light patents, but was in payment for his manufacturing establishments, which had then grown to be of great commercial importance. End of footnote. This was true of the European patents as well as the American. I endeavored to sell my lighting patents in different countries of Europe and made a contract with a couple of men. On account of their poor business capacity and lack of practicality, they conveyed under the patents all rights to different corporations, but in such a way and with such confused wording of the contracts that I never got a cent. One of the companies started was the German Edison, now the great Allgemeine Elektrizitätsgesellschaft. The English company I never got anything for, because a lawyer had originally advised Drexel, Morgan and Co. as to the signing of a certain document, and said it was all right for me to sign. I signed, and never got a cent, because there was a clause in it which prevented me from ever getting anything. A certain easy-going belief in human nature, and even a certain carelessness of attitude towards business affairs, are here revealed. We have already pointed out two instances where, in his dealings with the Western Union Company, he stipulated that payments of 6000 per year for 17 years were to be made instead of $100,000 in cash, evidently forgetful of the fact that the annual sum so received was nothing more than legal interest, which could have been earned indefinitely if the capital had been only insisted upon. In later life Edison has been more circumspect, but throughout his early career he was constantly getting into some kind of scrape. Of one experience, he says, In the early days I was experimenting with metallic filaments for the incandescent light, and sent a certain man out to California in search of platinum. He found a considerable quantity in the sluice boxes of the Cherokee Valley Mining Company, but just then he found also that fruit gardening was the thing, and dropped the subject. He then came to me and said that if he could raise four thousand dollars, he could go into some kind of orchard arrangement out there, and would give me half the profits. I was unwilling to do it, not having very much money just then, but his persistence was such that I raised the money and gave it to him. He went back to California 
and got into mining claims and into fruit growing and became one of the politicians of the coast and i believe was on the staff of the governor of the state a couple of years ago he wounded his daughter and shot himself because he had become ruined financially i never heard from him after he got the money edison tells of another similar episode i had two men working for me one a german the other a jew they wanted me to put up a little money to start them in a shop in new york to make repairs etc i put up eight hundred dollars and was to get half of the profits and each of them one quarter i never got anything for it a few years afterwards i went to see them and asked what they were doing and said i would like to sell my interest and they said sell out what why i said my interest in the machinery they said you don't own this machinery this is our machinery you have no papers to show anything you had better get out i am inclined to think that the percentage of crooked people was smaller when i was young this has been steadily rising and has got up to a very respectable figure now i hope it will never reach par to which lugubrious episode so provocative of cynicism edison adds when i was a young fellow the first thing i did when i went to a town was to put something into the savings bank and start an account when i came to new york i put thirty dollars into a savings bank under the new york sun office after the money had been in about two weeks the bank busted that was in eighteen seventy in nineteen o nine i got back six dollars and forty cents with a charge for one dollar seventy five cents for law expenses that shows the beauty of new york receiverships it is hardly to be wondered at that edison is rather frank and unsparing in some of his criticisms of shady modern business methods and the mention of the following incident always provokes him to a fine scorn i had an interview with one of the wealthiest men in new york he wanted me to sell out my associates in the electric lighting business and offered me all i was going to get and a hundred thousand dollars besides of course i would not do it i found out that the reason for this offer was that he had had trouble with mr morgan and wanted to get even with him wall street is in fact a frequent object of rather sarcastic reference applying even to its regular and probably correct methods of banking when i was running my ore mine he says and got up to the point of making shipments to john fritz i didn't have capital enough to carry the ore so i went to j p morgan and company and said i wanted them to give me a letter to the city bank i wanted to raise some money i got a letter to mr stillman and went over and told him i wanted to open an account and get some loans and discounts he turned me down and would not do it well i said isn't it banking to help a man in this way he said what you want is a partner i felt very much crestfallen i went over to a bank in newark the merchants and told them what i wanted they said certainly you can have the money i made my deposit and they pulled me through all right my idea of wall street banking has been very poor since that time merchant banking seems to be different as a general thing edison has had no trouble with raising money when he needed it the reason being that people have faith in him as soon as they come to know him a little incident bears on this point in the operating the schenectady works mr insull and i had a terrible burden we had enormous orders and little money and had great difficulty to meet our payrolls and buy supplies at one time we had so many orders on hand we wanted two hundred thousand dollars worth of copper and didn't have a cent to buy it 
We went down to the Ansonia Brass and Copper Company, and told Mr. Cowles just how we stood. He said, I will see what I can do. Will you let my bookkeeper look at your books? We said, Come right up, and look them over. He sent his man up, and found we had the orders, and were all right, although we didn't have the money. He said, I will let you have the copper, and for years he trusted us for all the copper we wanted, even if we didn't have the money to pay for it. It is not generally known that Edison, in addition to being a newsboy and a contributor to the technical press, has also been a backer and an angel for various publications. This is perhaps the right place at which to refer to the matter, as it belongs in the list of his financial or commercial enterprises. Edison sums up this chapter of his life very pithily. I was interested as a telegrapher in journalism, and started the Telegraph Journal, and got out about a dozen numbers when it was taken over by W. J. Johnston, who afterward founded the electrical world on it as an offshoot from the operator. I also started science, and ran it for a year and a half. It cost me too much money to maintain, and I sold it to Gardner Hubbard, the father-in-law of Alexander Graham Bell. He carried it along for years. Both these papers are still in prosperous existence, particularly the electrical world, as the recognized exponent of electrical development in America, where now the public spends as much annually for electricity as it does for daily bread. From all that has been said above, it will be understood that Edison's real and remarkable capacity for business does not lie in ability to take care of himself, nor in the direction of routine office practices, nor even in ordinary administrative affairs. In short, he would and does regard it as a foolish waste of his time to give attention to the mere occupancy of a desk. His commercial strength manifests itself rather in the outlining of matters relating to organization and broad policy with a sagacity arising from a shrewd perception and appreciation of general business requirements and conditions, to which should be added his intensely comprehensive grasp of manufacturing possibilities and details, and an unceasing vigilance in devising means of improving the quality of products and increasing the economy of their manufacture. Like other successful commanders, Edison also possesses the happy faculty of choosing suitable lieutenants to carry out his policies and to manage the industries he has created, such, for instance, as those in which this chapter has to deal, namely the phonograph, motion picture, primary battery, and storage battery enterprises. The Portland cement business has already been dealt with separately, and although the above remarks are appropriate to it also, Edison being its head and informing spirit, the following pages are intended to be devoted to those industries that are grounded around the laboratory at Orange, and that may be taken as typical of Edison's methods on the manufacturing side. Within a few months after establishing himself at the present laboratory in 1887, Edison entered upon one of those intensely active periods of work that have been so characteristic of his methods in commercializing his other inventions. In this case, his labors were directed toward improving the phonograph so as to put it into thoroughly practicable form, capable of ordinary use by the public at large. The net result of this work was the general type of machine of which the well-known phonograph of today is a refinement, evolved through many years of sustained experiment and improvement. 
After a considerable period of strenuous activity in the 80s, the phonograph and its wax records were developed to a sufficient degree of perfection to warrant him in making arrangements for their manufacture and commercial introduction. At this time, the surroundings of the Orange Laboratory were distinctly rural in character. Immediately adjacent to the main building and the four smaller structures, constituting the laboratory plant, were grass meadows that stretched away for some considerable distance in all directions. And, at its back door, so to speak, ducks paddled around and quacked in a pond, undisturbed. Being now ready for manufacturing, but requiring more facilities, Edison increased his real estate holdings by purchasing a large tract of land lying contiguous to what he already owned. At one end of the newly acquired land, two unpretentious brick structures were erected, equipped with first-class machinery, and put into commission as shops for manufacturing phonographs and their record blanks. While the capacious hall forming the third story of the laboratory over the library was fitted up and used as a music room where records were made. Thus, the modern Edison phonograph made its modest debut in 1888 in what was then called the improved form to distinguish it from the original style of machine he invented in 1877, in which the recording was made on a sheet of tin foil held in place upon a metallic cylinder. The improved form is the general type so well known for many years and sold at the present day, viz. the spring or electric motor-driven machine with a cylindrical wax record. In fact, the regulation Edison phonograph. It did not take a long time to find a market for the products of the newly established factory, for a worldwide public interest in the machine had been created by the appearance of newspaper articles from time to time announcing the approaching completion by Edison of his improved phonograph. The original tinfoil machine had been sufficient to illustrate the fact that the human voice and other sounds could be recorded and reproduced, but such a type of machine had sharp limitations in general use, hence the coming into being of a type that any ordinary person could handle was sufficient of itself to ensure a market. Thus demand for the new machines and wax records grew apace as the corporations organized to handle the business extended their lines. An examination of the newspaper files of the year 1888, 1889, and 1890 will reveal the great excitement caused by the bringing out of the new phonograph and how frequently and successfully it was employed in public entertainments, either for the whole or part of an evening. In this, and other ways, it became popularized to a still further extent. This led to the demand for a nickel-in-the-slot machine, which, when established, became immensely popular over the whole country. In its earlier forms, the improved phonograph was not capable of such general non-expert handling as is the machine of the present day, and consequently there was a constant endeavor on Edison's part to simplify the construction of the machine and its manner of operation. Experimentation was incessantly going on with this in view, and in the process of evolution changes were made here and there that resulted in a still greater measure of perfection. In various ways, there was a continual, slow, and steady growth of the industry thus created, necessitating the erection of many additional buildings as the years passed by. During part of the last decade, there was a lull caused mostly from the failure of corporate interests to carry out their contract relations with Edison, 
and he was thereby compelled to resort to legal proceedings, at the end of which he bought in the outstanding contracts and assumed command of the business personally. Being thus freed from many irksome restrictions that had hung heavily upon him, Edison now proceeded to push the phonograph business under a broader policy than that which obtained under his previous contractual relations. With the ever-increasing simplification and efficiency of the machine and a broadening of its application, the results of this policy were manifested in a still more rapid growth of the business that necessitated further additions to the manufacturing plant. And thus matters went on until the early part of the present decade, when the factory facilities were becoming so rapidly outgrown as to render radical changes necessary. It was in these circumstances that Edison's sagacity and breadth of business capacity came to the front. With characteristic boldness and foresight, he planned the erection of the series of magnificent concrete buildings that now stand adjacent to and around the laboratory, and in which the manufacturing plant is at present housed. There was no narrowness in his views in designing these buildings, but on the contrary, great faith in the future. For his plans included not only the phonograph industry, but provided also for the coming development of motion pictures and of the primary and storage battery enterprises. In aggregate, there are twelve structures, including the administration building, of which six are of imposing dimensions, running from 200 feet long by 50 feet wide to 440 feet in length by 115 feet in width. All these larger buildings, except one, being five stories in height. They are constructed entirely of reinforced concrete with Edison cement, including walls, floors, and stairways, thus eliminating fire hazard to the utmost extent and ensuring a high degree of protection, cleanliness, and sanitation. As fully three-fourths of the area of their exterior framework consists of windows, an abundance of daylight is secured. These many advantages, combined with lofty ceilings on every floor, provide ideal conditions for the thousands of working people engaged in this immense plant. In addition to these twelve concrete structures, there are a few smaller brick and wooden buildings on the grounds, in which some special operations are conducted. These, however, are few in number, and at some future time will be concentrated in one or more additional concrete buildings. It will afford a cleaner idea of the extent of the industries clustered immediately around the laboratory when it is stated that the combined floor space which is occupied by them in all these buildings is equivalent in the aggregate to over 14 acres. It would be instructive, but scarcely within the scope of the narrative, to conduct the reader through this extensive plant and see its many interesting operations in detail. It must suffice, however, to note that its complete and ample equipment with modern machinery of every kind applicable to the work, its numerous, and some of them wonderfully ingenious, methods, processes, machines, and tools specially designed or invented for the manufacture of special parts and supplemental appliances for the phonograph or other Edison products, and also to note the interesting variety of trades represented in the different departments in which are included chemists, electricians, electrical mechanicians, machinists, mechanics, pattern makers, carpenters, cabinet makers, varnishers, japaners, tool makers, lapidaries, wax experts, phonographic developers and printers, opticians, electroplaters, furnace men, and others, 
together with factory experimenters and a host of general employees, who by careful training have become specialists and experts in numerous branches of these industries. Edison's plans for this manufacturing plant were sufficiently well outlined to provide ample capacity for the natural growth of the business, and although that capacity, so far as phonographs is concerned, has actually reached an output of over 6,000 complete phonographs per week and upward of 300,000 molded records per day, with a payroll embracing over 3,500 employees, including office force, and amounting to about $45,000 per week. The limits of production have not yet been reached. The constant outpouring of products in such large quantities bespeaks the unremitting activities of an extensive and busy selling organization to provide for their marketing and distribution. This important department, the National Phonograph Company, in all its branches, from president to office boy, includes about 200 employees on its office payroll and makes its headquarters in the administration building, which is one of the large concrete structures above referred to. The policy of the company is to dispose of its wares through regular trade channels rather than to deal direct with the public, trusting to local activities as stimulated by a liberal policy of national advertising. Thus there has been gradually built up a very extensive business until at the present time an enormous output of phonographs and records is distributed to retail customers in the United States and Canada through the medium of about 150 jobbers and over 13,000 dealers. The Edison phonograph industry, thus organized, is helped by frequent conventions of this large commercial force. Besides this, the National Phonograph Company maintains a special staff for carrying on the business with foreign countries. While the aggregate transactions of this department are not as extensive as those for the United States and Canada, they are of considerable volume as the Foreign Office distributes in bulk a very large number of phonographs and records to selling companies and agencies in Europe, Asia, Australia, Japan, and, indeed, to all the countries of the civilized world. Footnote 19 Like England's drumbeat, the voice of the Edison phonograph is heard around the world in undying strains, throughout the twenty-four hours. Footnote 19 It may be of interest to the reader to note some parts of the globe to which shipments of phonographs and records are made. Samoan Islands, Falkland Islands, Siam, Korea, Crete Island, Paraguay, Chile, Canary Islands, Egypt, British East Africa, Cape Colony, Portuguese East Africa, Liberia, Java Strait Settlements, Madagascar, Fanning Islands, New Zealand, French Indochina, Morocco, Ecuador, Brazil, Madeira, South Africa, Azores, Manchuria, Ceylon, Sierra Leone. End of footnote 19 in addition to the main manufacturing plant at Orange, another important adjunct must not be forgotten, and that is the recording department in New York City, where the master records are made under the superintendence of experts who have studied the intricacies of the art with Edison himself. This department occupies an upper story in a lofty building, and in its various rooms may be seen and heard many prominent musicians, vocalists, speakers, and vaudeville artists studiously and busily engaged in making the original records, which are afterwards sent to Orange, and which, if approved by the expert committee, 
are passed on to the proper department for reproduction in large quantities. When we consider the subject of motion pictures, we find a similarity in general business methods, for while the projecting machines and copies of picture films are made in quantity at the Orange Works, just as phonographs and duplicate records are so made, the original picture or film, like the master record, is made elsewhere. There is this difference, however, that, from the particular nature of the work, practically all master records are made at one convenient place, while the essential interest in some motion pictures lies in the fact that they are taken in various parts of the world, often under exceptional circumstances. The silent drama, however, calls also for many representations which employ conventional acting, staging, and the varied appliances of stagecraft. Hence, Edison saw early the necessity of providing a place especially devised and arranged for the production of dramatic performances in pantomime. It is a far cry from the crude structures of early days. The Black Maria of 1891 swung around on its pivot in the Orange Laboratory Yard to the well-appointed Edison Theatres, or pantomime studios, in New York City. The largest of these is located in the suburban borough of the Bronx, and consists of a three-story and basement building of reinforced concrete, in which are the offices, dressing rooms, wardrobe and property rooms, library and developing department. Contiguous to this building, and connected to it, is the theater proper, a large lofty structure whose sides and roof are of glass, and whose floor space is sufficiently ample for six different sets of scenery at one time, with plenty of room left for a profusion of accessories, such as tables, chairs, pianos, bunch lights, searchlights, cameras, and a host of various paraphernalia pertaining to stage effects. The second Edison Theatre, or studio, is located not far from the shopping district in New York City. In all essential features, except size and capacity, it is a duplicate of the one in the Bronx, of which it is a supplement. To a visitor coming on the floor of such a theatre for the first time, there is a sense of confusion in beholding the heterogeneous sets of scenery and the motley assemblage of characters represented in the various plays in the process of taking or rehearsal. While each set constitutes virtually a separate stage, they are all on the same floor, without wings or proscenium arches, and separated only by a few feet. Thus, for instance, a Japanese house interior may be seen cheek by jowl with an ordinary prison cell, flanked by a mining camp, which in turn stands next to a drawing-room set, and in each set of appropriate characters in pantomimic motion. The action is incessant, for in any dramatic representation intended for the motion picture film, Every second counts. The production of several completed plays per week necessitates the employment of a considerable staff of people of miscellaneous trades and abilities. At each of these two studios there is employed a number of stage directors, scene painters, carpenters, property men, photographers, costumers, electricians, clerks, and general assistants besides a capable stock company of actors and actresses whose generous numbers are frequently augmented by the addition of a special star or by a number of extra performers, such as rough riders or other specialists. It may be, occasionally, that the exigencies of the occasion require the work of a performing horse, dog, or other animal. No matter what the object required may be, whether animate or inanimate, 
If it is necessary for the play, it is found and pressed into service. These two studios, while separated from the main plant, are under the same general management, and their original negative films are forwarded as made to the Orange Works, where the large copying department is located in one of the concrete buildings. Here, after the film has been passed upon by a committee, a considerable number of positive copies are made by ingenious processes, and after each one is separately tested or run off in one or other of the three motion picture theaters in the building, they are shipped out to film exchanges in every part of the country. How extensive this business has become may be appreciated when it is stated that at the orange plant there are produced at this time over eight million feet of motion picture film per year, and Edison's company is only one of many producers. Another of the industries at the Orange Works is the manufacture of projecting kinetoscopes, by means of which the motion pictures are shown. While this, of itself, is also a business of considerable magnitude in its aggregate yearly transactions, it calls for no special comment in regard to commercial production, except to note that a corps of experimenters is constantly employed refining and perfecting details of the machine. Its basic features of operation, as conceived by Edison, remain unchanged. On coming to consider the Edison battery enterprises, we must preforce extend the territorial view to include a special chemical manufacturing plant, which is in reality a branch of the laboratory and the orange works, although actually situated about three miles away. Both the primary and the storage battery employ certain chemical products as essential parts of their elements, and indeed owe their very existence to the peculiar preparation and quality of such products, as exemplified by Edison's years of experimentation and research. Hence the establishment of his own chemical works at Silver Lake, where, under his personal supervision, the manufacturer of these products is carried on in charge of specially trained experts. At the present writing, the plant covers about seven acres of ground, but there is ample room for expansion, as Edison, with wise forethought, secured over forty acres of land, so as to be prepared for developments. Not only is the Silver Lake Works used for the manufacture of the chemical substances employed in the batteries, but it is the plant at which the Edison primary battery is wholly assembled and made up for distribution to customers. This in itself is a business of no small magnitude, having grown steadily on its merits year by year until it has now arrived at a point where its sales run into the hundreds of thousands of cells per annum, furnished largely to the steam railroads of the country for their signal service. As to the storage battery, the plant at Silver Lake is responsible only for the production of the chemical compounds, nickel hydrate and iron oxide, which enter into its construction. All the mechanical parts, the nickel plating, the manufacture of nickel flake, the assembling and testing, are carried on at the Orange Works in two of the large concrete buildings above referred to. A visit to this part of the plant reveals an amazing fertility of resourcefulness and ingenuity in the devising of the special machines and appliances employed in constructing the mechanical parts of these cells, for it is practically impossible to fashion them by means of machinery and tools to be found in the open market, notwithstanding the immense variety that may be there obtained. Since Edison completed his final series of investigations on his storage battery and brought it to its present state of perfection, 
The commercial values have increased by leaps and bounds. The battery, as it was originally put out some years ago, made for itself an enviable reputation. But with its improved form, there has come a vast increase of business. Although the largest of the concrete buildings, where its manufacture is carried on, is over 400 feet long and four stories in height, it has already become necessary to plan extensions and enlargements of the plant in order to provide for the production of batteries to fill the present demands. It was not until the summer of 1909 that Edison was willing to pronounce the final verdict of satisfaction with regard to this improved form of storage battery. But subsequent commercial results have justified his judgment, and it is not too much to predict that in all probability the business will assume gigantic proportions within a very few years. At the present time, 1910, the Edison storage battery enterprise is in its early stages of growth, and its status may be compared with that of the electric light system about the year 1881. There is one more industry, though of comparatively small extent, that is included in the activities of the Orange Works, namely the manufacture and sale of the Bates numbering machine. This is a well-known article of commerce used in mercantile establishments for the stamping of consecutive, duplicate, and manifold numbers on checks and other documents. It is not an invention of Edison, but the organization owning it, together with the patent rights, were acquired by him some years ago, and he has since continued and enlarged the business both in scope and volume, besides, of course, improving and perfecting the apparatus itself. These machines are known everywhere throughout the country, and while the annual sales are of comparatively moderate amount in comparison with the totals of the other Edison industries at Orange, they represent in the aggregate a comfortable and encouraging business. In this brief outline review of the flourishing and extensive commercial enterprises centered around the Orange Laboratory, the facts, it is believed, contain a complete refutation of the idea that an inventor cannot be a businessman. They also bear abundant evidence of the compatibility of these two widely convergent gifts existing even to a high degree in the same person. A striking example of the correctness of this proposition is afforded in the present case when it is borne in mind that these various industries above described, whose annual sales run into many millions of dollars, owe not only their very creation, except the Bates machine, and existence to Edison's inventive originality and commercial initiative, but also their continued growth and prosperity to his incessant activities in dealing with their multifarious business problems. In publishing a portrait of Edison this year, one of the popular magazines placed under it this caption, Were the age called upon to pay Thomas A. Edison all it owes to him, the age would have to make an assignment. The present chapter will have thrown some light on the idiosyncrasies of Edison as financier and as manufacturer, and it will have shown that while the claim thus suggested may be quite good, it will certainly never be pressed or collected. Chapter 27 of Edison, His Life and Inventions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit 
LibriVox.org. Edison and His Inventions By Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 27 The Value of Edison's Inventions to the World If the world were to take an account of stock, so to speak, and proceed in orderly fashion to marshal its tangible assets in relation to dollars and cents, the natural resources of our globe, from center to circumference, would head the list. Next would come inventors, whose value to the world as an asset could be readily estimated from an increase of its wealth resulting from the actual transformations of these resources into items of convenience and comfort through the exercise of their inventive ingenuity. Inventors of practical devices may be broadly divided into two classes. First, those who may be said to have made two blades of grass grow where only one grew before, and second, great inventors who have made grass grow plentifully on hitherto unproductive ground. The vast majority of practical inventors belong to and remain in the first of these divisions, but there have been, and probably always will be, a less number who, by reason of their greater achievements, are entitled to be included in both classes. Of these latter, Thomas Alva Edison is one, but in the pages of history he stands conspicuously preeminent, a commanding, towering figure even among giants. The activities of Edison have been of such great range, and his conquests in the domains of practical arts so extensive and varied, that it is somewhat difficult to estimate with any satisfactory degree of accuracy the money value of his inventions to the world of today, even after making due allowance for the work of other great inventors and the propulsive effect of large amounts of capital thrown into the enterprises which took root, wholly or in part through the production of his genius and energies. This difficulty will be apparent, for instance, when we consider his telegraph and telephone inventions. These were absorbed in enterprises already existing, and were the means of assisting their rapid growth and expansion, particularly the telephone industry. Again, in considering the fact that Edison was one of the first in the field to design and perfect a practical and operative electric railway, the main features of which are used in all electric roads of today. We are confronted with the problem as to what proportion of their colossal investment and earnings should be ascribed to him. Difficulties are multiplied when we pause for a moment to think of Edison's influence on collateral branches of business. In the public mind, he is credited with the invention of the incandescent electric light, the phonograph, and other widely known devices. But how few realize his actual influence on other trades that are not generally thought of in connection with these things. For instance, let us note what a prominent engine builder the late gardener C. Sims, has said, Watt, Corliss, and Porter brought forth steam engines to a high state of proficiency, yet it remained for Mr. Edison to force better proportions, workmanship, designs, use of metals, regulation, the solving of the complex problems of high speed and endurance, and the successful development of the shaft governor. 
Mr. Edison is preeminent in the realm of engineering. Close quote. The phenomenal growth of the copper industry was due to a rapid and ever-increasing demand, owing to the exploitation of the telephone, electric light, electric motor, and electric railway industries. Without these, there might never have been the romance of coppers, and the rise and fall of countless fortunes. And, although one cannot estimate in definite figures the extent of Edison's influence in the enormous increase of copper production, it is to be remembered that his basic inventions constitute a most important factor in the demand for the metal. Besides, one must also give him the credit, as already noted, for having recognized the necessity for a pure quality of copper for electric conductors, and for his persistence in having compelled the manufacturers of that period to introduce new and additional methods of refinement, so as to bring about that result which is now a sine qua non. Still, considering his influence on other staples and collateral trades, let us enumerate briefly and in a general manner some of the more important and additional ones that have been not merely stimulated, but, in many cases, the business and sales have been directly increased and new arts established through the inventions of this one man namely, iron, steel, brass, zinc, nickel, platinum, five dollars per ounce in 1878, now twenty-six dollars an ounce, rubber, oils, wax, bitumen, various chemical compounds, belting, boilers, injectors, structural steel, iron tubing, glass, silk, cotton, porcelain, fine woods, slate, marble, electrical measuring instruments, miscellaneous machinery, coal, wire, paper, building materials, sapphires, and many others. The question before us is, to what extent has Edison added to the wealth of the world by his inventions, and his energy, and perseverance? It will be noted from the foregoing that no categorical answer can be offered to such a question, but sufficient material can be gathered from a statistical review of the commercial arts, directly influenced, to afford an approximate idea of the increase in national wealth that has been affected by or has come into being through the practical application of his ideas. First of all, as to the inventions capable of fairly definite estimate, let us mention the incandescent electric light and systems of distribution of electric light, heat, and power which may justly be considered as the crowning inventions of Edison's life. Until October 21, 1879, there was nothing in existence resembling our modern incandescent lamp. On that date, as we have seen in a previous chapter, Edison's labors culminated in his invention of a practical incandescent electric lamp, embodying absolutely all the essentials of the lamp of today, thus opening to the world the doors of a new art and industry. Today there are in the United States more than 41 million of these lamps connected to existing central station circuits in active operation. Such circuits necessarily imply the existence of central stations with their equipment. Until the beginning of 1882, 
there were only a few arc lighting stations in existence for the limited distribution of current. At the present time, there are over 6,000 central stations in this country for the distribution of electric current for light, heat, and power, with capital obligations amounting to not less than one billion dollars. Besides the above-named 41 million incandescent lamps connected to their mains, there are about 500,000 arc lamps and 150,000 motors, using 750,000 horsepower, besides countless fan motors and electric heating and cooking appliances. When it is stated that the gross earnings of these central stations approximate the sum of two hundred and twenty five million dollars yearly the significant import of these statistics of an art that came so largely from edison's laboratory about thirty years ago will undoubtedly be apparent but the above are not by any means all the facts relating to incandescent electric lighting in the United States. For, in addition to electrical stations, there are upward of 100,000 isolated or private plants in mills, factories, steamships, hotels, theaters, etc., owned by the persons or concerns who operate them. These plants represent an approximate investment of $500 million, and the connection of not less than 25 million incandescent lamps, or their equivalent. Then there are the factories where these incandescent lamps are made, about 40 in number, representing a total investment that may be approximated at $25 million. It is true that many of these factories are operated by other than the interests which came into control of the Edison Patents, the General Electric Company, but the 150 million incandescent electric lamps now annually made are broadly covered in principle by Edison's fundamental ideas and patents. It will be noted that these figures are all in round numbers, but they are believed to be well within the mark, being primarily founded upon the special reports of the Census Bureau, issued in 1902 and 1907, with the natural increase from that time computed by experts who are in position to obtain the facts. It would be manifestly impossible to give exact figures of such a gigantic and swiftly moving industry whose totals increase from week to week. The reader will naturally be disposed to ask whether it is intended to claim that Edison has brought about all this magnificent growth of the electric lighting art. The answer to this is decidedly in the negative, for the fact is that he laid some of the foundations and erected a building thereon, and in the natural progressive order of things other inventors of more or less fame have laid substructures, or added a wing here and a story there, until the resultant great structure has attained such proportions as to evoke the admiration of the beholder. But the old foundation and the fundamental building still remain to support other parts. In other words, Edison created the incandescent electric lamp, and invented certain broad and fundamental systems of distribution of current, with all the essential devices of detail necessary for successful operation. These formed a foundation. He also spent great sums of money and devoted several years of patient labor in the early practical exploitation of the dynamo and central station and isolated plants, 
often under adverse and depressing circumstances, with a dogged determination that outlived an opposition steadily threatening defeat. These efforts resulted in the firm commercial establishment of modern electric lighting. It is true that many important inventions of others have a distinguished place in the art as it is exploited today, but the fact remains that the broad essentials, such as the incandescent lamp, systems of distribution, and some important details, are not only universally used, but are as necessary today for successful commercial practice as they were when Edison invented them many years ago. The electric railway next claims our consideration, but we are immediately confronted by a difficulty which seems insurmountable when we attempt to formulate any definite estimate of the value and influence of Edison's pioneer work and inventions. There is one incontrovertible fact namely that he was the first man to devise, construct, and operate from a central station a practicable life-size electric railroad, which was capable of transporting, and did transport, passengers and freight at variable speeds over varying grades, and under complete control of the operator. These are the essential elements in all electric railroading of the present day. But while Edison's original broad ideas are embodied in present practice, the perfection of the modern electric railway is greatly due to the labors and inventions of a large number of other well-known inventors. There was no reason why Edison could not have continued the commercial development of the electric railway after he had helped to show its practicability in 1880, 1881, and 1882, just as he had completed his lighting system, had it not been that his financial allies of the period lacked faith in the possibilities of electric railroads and therefore declined to furnish the money necessary for the purpose of carrying on the work. With these facts in mind, we shall ask the reader to assign to Edison a due proportion of credit for his pioneer and basic work in relation to the prodigious development of electric railroading that has since taken place. The statistics of 1908 for American street and elevated railways show that within 25 years the electric railway industry has grown to embrace 38,812 miles of track on streets and for elevated railways operated under the ownership of 1,238 separate companies whose total capitalization amounted to the enormous sum of four billion one hundred and twenty three million eight hundred and thirty four thousand five hundred and ninety eight dollars in the equipments owned by such companies there are included sixty eight thousand six hundred and thirty six electric cars and 17,568 trailers and others, making a total of 86,204 of such vehicles. These cars and equipments earned over $425,000,000 in 1907 in giving the public transportation at a cost, mostly transfers, of a little over three cents per passenger for whom a fifteen-mile ride would be possible. It is the cheapest transportation in the world. Some mention 
should also be made of the great electrical works of the country, in which the dynamos, motors, and other varied paraphernalia are made for electric lighting, electric railway, and other purposes. The largest of these works, which is undoubtedly that of the General Electric Company at Schenectady, New York, a continuation and enormous enlargement of the shops which Edison established there in 1886. This plant, at the present time, embraces over 275 acres, of which 60 acres are covered by fifty large and over one hundred small buildings, besides which the company also owns other large plants elsewhere, representing a total investment approximating the sum of thirty-four million eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, up to 1908. The productions of the General Electric Company alone average annual sales of nearly $75 million, but they do not comprise the total of the country's manufactures in these lines. Turning our attention now to the telephone, we again meet a condition that calls for thoughtful consideration before we can properly appreciate how much the growth of this industry owes to Edison's inventive genius. In another place there has already been told the story of the telephone, from which we have seen that to Alexander Graham Bell is due the broad idea of transmission of speech by means of an electrical circuit, also that he invented appropriate instruments and devices through which he accomplished this result although not to that extent which gave promise of any great commercial practicability for the telephone as it then existed. While the art was in this inefficient condition, Edison went to work on the subject, and in due time, as we have already learned, invented and brought out the carbon transmitter, which is universally acknowledged to have been the needed device that gave to the telephone the element of commercial practicability, and has since led to its phenomenally rapid adoption and world-wide use. It matters not that others were working in the same direction. Edison was legally adjudicated to have been the first to succeed in point of time, and his inventions were put into actual use and may be found in principle in every one of the seven million telephones which are estimated to be employed in the country at the present day. Basing the statements upon facts shown by the census reports of 1902 and 1907, and adding thereto the growth of the industry since that time, we find on a conservative estimate that at this writing the investment has been not less than eight hundred million dollars in now existing telephone systems, while no fewer than ten billion five hundred million talks went over the lines during the year 1908. These figures relate only to telephone systems and do not include any details regarding the great manufacturing establishments engaged in the construction of telephone apparatus, of which there is a production amounting to at least fifteen million per annum. Leaving the telephone, let us now turn our attention to the telegraph, and endeavor to show, as best we can, some idea of the measure to which it has been affected by Edison's inventions. Although, as we have seen in a previous part of this book, his earliest fame arose from his great practical work in telegraphic inventions and improvements, there is no way in which any definite computation can be made of the value of his contributions in the art, except, perhaps, in the case of his quadruplex, 
through which alone it is estimated that there has been saved from fifteen million to twenty million in cost of line construction in this country if this were the only thing that he had ever accomplished it would entitle him to consideration as an inventor of note the quadruplex however has other material advantages but how far they and the natural growth of the business have contributed to the investment and earnings of the telegraph companies is beyond practicable computation it would perhaps be interesting to speculate upon what might have been the growth of the telegraph and the resultant benefit to the community had edison's automatic telegraph inventions been allowed to take their legitimate place in the art but we shall not allow ourselves to indulge in flights of fancy as the value of this chapter rests not upon conjecture but only upon actual fact nor shall we attempt to offer any statistics regarding edison's numerous inventions relating to telegraphs and kindred devices such as stock tickers relays magnets rheotomes repeaters printing telegraphs messenger calls etc on which he was so busily occupied as an inventor and manufacturer during the ten years that began with january eighteen sixty nine the principles of many of these devices are still used in the arts but have become so incorporated in other devices as to be inseparable and cannot now be dealt with separately to know what they mean however it might be noted that new york city alone has three thousand stock tickers consuming fifty thousand miles of record tape every year turning now to other important arts and industries which have been created by edison's inventions and in which he is at this time taking an active personal interest let us visit orange new jersey when his present laboratory was nearing completion in eighteen eighty seven he wrote to mr j hood wright a partner in the firm of drexel morgan and company quote, my ambition is to build up a great industrial works in the orange valley starting in a small way and gradually working up Close quote. in this plant which represents an investment approximating the sum of four million dollars are grouped a number of industrial enterprises of which edison is either the sole or controlling owner and the guiding spirit these enterprises are the national phonograph company the edison business phonograph company the edison phonograph works the edison manufacturing company the edison storage battery company and the bates manufacturing company the importance of these industries will be apparent when it is stated that at this plant the maximum payroll shows the employment of over four thousand two hundred persons with annual earnings in salaries and wages of more than two million seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in considering the phonograph in its commercial aspect and endeavoring to arrive at some idea of the world's estimate of the value of this invention we feel the ground more firm under our feet for edison has in later years controlled its manufacture and sale it will be remembered that the phonograph lay dormant commercially speaking for about ten years after it came into being and then later invention reduced it to a device capable of more popular utility a few years of rather unsatisfactory commercial experience brought about a reorganization through which edison resumed possession of the business 
It has since been continued under his general direction and ownership, and he has made a great many additional inventions tending to improve the machine in all its parts. The uses made of the phonograph up to this time have been of four kinds, generally speaking. First, and principally, for amusement. Second, for instruction in languages. Third, for business in the dictation of correspondence. And fourth, for sentimental reasons in preserving the voices of friends. No separate figures are available to show the extent of its employment in the second and fourth classes, as they are probably included in machines coming under the first subdivision. Under this head we find that there have been upward of 1,310,000 phonographs sold during the last twenty years, with and for which there have been made and sold no fewer than 97,845,000 records of a musical or other character. Phonograph records are now being manufactured at Orange at the rate of 75,000 a day, the annual sale of phonographs and records being approximately $7 million, including business phonographs. This does not include blank records, of which large numbers have also been supplied to the public. The adoption of the business phonograph has not been characterized by the unanimity that obtained in the case of the one used merely for amusement, as its use involves some changes in methods that businessmen are slow to adopt, until they realize the resulting convenience and economy. Although it is only a few years since the business phonograph has begun to make some headway, it is not difficult to appreciate that Edison's prediction in 1878 as to the value of such an appliance is being realized when we find that up to this time the sales run up to 12,695 in number. At the present time the annual sales of the business phonographs and supplies, cylinders, etc., are not less than $350,000. We must not forget that the basic patent of Edison on the phonograph has long since expired, thus throwing open to the world the wonderful art of reproducing human speech and other sounds. The world was not slow to take advantage of the fact. Hence there are, in the field, numerous other concerns in the same business. It is conservatively estimated, by those who know the trade, and are in a position to form an opinion, that the figures above represent only about one-half of the entire business of the country, in phonographs, records, cylinders, and supplies. Taking next his inventions that pertain to a more recently established but rapidly expanding branch of business that provides for the amusement of the public, popularly known as motion pictures, we also find a general recognition of value created. Referring the reader to a previous chapter for a discussion of Edison's standing as a pioneer inventor in this art, let us glance at the commercial proportions of this young but lusty business, whose ramifications extend to all but the most remote and primitive hamlets of our country. The manufacture of the projecting machines and accessories, together with the reproduction of films, is carried on at the Orange Valley plant, and, from the inception of the motion picture business, to the present time, there have been made upward of 16,000 projecting machines and many millions of feet of films carrying small photographs of moving objects. 
Although the motion picture business, as a commercial enterprise, is still in its youth, it is of sufficient moment to call for the annual production of thousands of machines and many million feet of films in Edison's shops, having a sale value of not less than seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. To produce the originals from which these Edison films are made, there have been established two studios, the largest of which is in the Bronx, New York City. In this, as well as in the phonograph business, there are many other manufacturers in the field. Indeed, the annual product of the Edison Manufacturing Company in this line is only a fractional part of the total that is absorbed by the 8,000 or more motion picture theaters and exhibitions that are in operation in the United States at the present time, and which represent an investment of some $45 million. Licensees under Edison patents, in this country alone, produce upward of 60 million feet of films annually containing more than a billion and a half separate photographs. To what extent the motion picture business may grow in the not remote future, it is impossible to conjecture, for it has taken a place in the front rank of rapidly increasing enterprises. The manufacture and sale of the Edison Leland primary battery, conducted by the Edison Manufacturing Company at the Orange Valley plant, is a business of no mean importance. Beginning about twenty years ago with a battery that, without polarizing, would furnish large currents specially adapted for gas engine ignition and other important purposes, the business has steadily grown in magnitude until the present output amounts to about 125,000 cells annually. The total number of cells put into the hands of the public up to date being approximately 1,500,000. It will be readily conceded that to most men this alone would be an enterprise of a lifetime, and sufficient in itself to satisfy a moderate ambition. But although it has yielded a considerable profit to Edison, and gives employment to many people, it is only one of the many smaller enterprises that owe an existence to his inventive ability and commercial activity. So it also is in regard to the mimeograph, whose forerunner, the electric pen, was born of Edison's brain in 1877. He had been long impressed by the desirability of the rapid production of copies of written documents, and, as we have seen by a previous chapter, he invented the electric pen for this purpose, only to improve upon it later with a more desirable device, which he called the mimeograph, that is in use in various forms at this time. Although the electric pen had a large sale and use in its time, the statistics relating to it are not available. The mimeograph, however, is and has been for many years a standard office appliance, and is entitled to consideration as the total number put into use up to this time is approximately 180,000, valued at three million five hundred thousand dollars, while the annual output is in the neighborhood of nine thousand machines, sold for about a hundred fifty thousand dollars, besides the vast quantity of special paper and supplies which its use entails in the production of the many millions of facsimile letters and documents. The extent of production and sale of supplies for the mimeograph may be appreciated when it is stated that they bring annually an equivalent of three times the amount realized from sales of machines. 
The manufacture and sale of the mimeograph does not come within the enterprises conducted under Edison's personal direction, as he sold out the whole thing some years ago to Mr. A. B. Dick of Chicago. In making a somewhat radical change of subject, from duplicating machines to cement, we find ourselves in a field in which Edison has made a most decided impression. The reader has already learned that his entry into this field was, in a manner, accidental, although logically in line with pronounced convictions of many years standing and following up the fund of knowledge gained in the magnetic or milling business. From being a newcomer in the cement business, his corporation in five years has grown to be the fifth largest producer in the United States, with a still increasing capacity. From the inception of this business, there has been a steady and rapid development, resulting in the production of a grand total of over 7,300,000 barrels of cement up to the present date, having a value of about $6 million, exclusive of package. At the time of this writing, the rate of production is over 8,000 barrels of cement per day, or, say, 2,500,000 barrels per year, having an approximate selling value of a little less than $2 million. With prospects of increasing in the near future to a daily output of 10,000 barrels. This enterprise is carried on by a corporation called the Edison Portland Cement Company, in which he is very largely interested, and of which he is the active head and guiding spirit. Had not Edison suspended the manufacture and sale of his storage battery a few years ago, because he was not satisfied with it, there might have been given here some noteworthy figures of an extensive business, for the company's books show an astonishing number of orders that were received during the time of the shutdown. He was implored for batteries, but in spite of the fact that good results had been obtained from the 18,000 or 20,000 cells sold some years ago, he adhered firmly to his determination to perfect them to a still higher standard before resuming and continuing their manufacture as a regular commodity. As we have noted in a previous chapter, however, deliveries of the perfected type were begun in the summer of 1909, and since that time the business has continued to grow in the measure indicated by the earlier experience. Thus far we have concerned ourselves chiefly with those figures which exhibit the extent of investment in production, but there is another and humanly important side that presents itself for consideration, namely the employment of a vast industrial army of men and women who earn a living through their connection with some of the arts and industries to which our narrative has direct reference. To this the reader's attention will now be drawn. The following figures are based upon the special reports of the Census Bureau, 1902 and 1907, with additions computed upon the increase that has subsequently taken place. In the totals following is included the compensation paid to salaried officials and clerks. Details relating to telegraph systems are omitted. Taking the electric light into consideration first, we find that in the central stations of the United States there are not less than an average of 50,000 persons employed, requiring an aggregate yearly payroll of over $40 million. This does not include the 100,000 or more isolated electric light plants scattered throughout the land. Many of these are quite large, 
and at least one-third of them require one additional helper, thus adding, say, 33,000 employees to the number already mentioned. If we assume as low a wage as $10 per week for each of these helpers, we must add to the foregoing an additional sum of over $17 million paid annually for wages, almost entirely in the isolated incandescent electric lighting field. Central stations and isolated plants consume over 100 million incandescent electric lamps annually, and in the production of these there are engaged about 40 factories, on whose payrolls appear an average of 14,000 employees, earning an aggregate yearly sum of $8 million. Following the incandescent lamp, we must not forget an industry exclusively arising from it, and absolutely dependent upon it, namely that of making fixtures for such lamps, the manufacture of which gives employment to upward of 6,000 persons, who annually receive at least $3,750,000 in compensation. The detailed devices of the incandescent electric lighting system also contribute a large quota to the country's wealth in the millions of dollars paid out in salaries and wages to many thousands of persons who are engaged in their manufacture. The electric railways of our country show even larger figures than the lighting stations and plants, as they employ on the average over 250,000 persons, whose annual compensation amounts to not less than $155 million. In the manufacture of about $50 million worth of dynamos and motors annually for central station equipment, isolated plants, electric railways, and other purposes, the manufacturers of the country employ an average of not less than 30,000 people, whose yearly payroll amounts to no less a sum than $20 million. The growth of the telephone systems of the United States also furnishes us with statistics of an analogous nature, for we find that the average number of employees engaged in this industry is at least 140,000 whose annual earnings aggregate a minimum of $75 million, besides which the manufacturers of telephone apparatus employ over 12,000 persons, to whom is paid annually about $5,500,000. No attempt is made to include figures of collateral industries, such, for instance, as copper, which is very closely allied, with the electrical arts, and the great bulk of which is refined electrically. The 8,000 or so motion picture theaters of the country employ no fewer than 40,000 people, whose aggregate annual income amounts to not less than $37 million. Coming now to the Orange Valley plant, we take a drop from these figures to the comparatively modest ones, which give us an average of 3,600 employees, and calling for an annual payroll of about $2,250,000. It must be remembered, however, that the sums mentioned above represent industries operated by great aggregations of capital, while the Orange Valley plant, as well as the Edison Portland Cement Company, with an average daily number of 530 employees and over $400,000 annual payroll, represent in a large measure industries that are more in the nature of closely held enterprises and practically under the direction of one mind. The table herewith given summarizes the figures that have been presented and affords an idea of the totals affected by the genius of this one man. 
It is well known that many other men and many other inventions have been needed for the perfection of these arts, but it is equally true that, as already noted, some of these industries are directly the creation of Edison, which in every one of the rest his impress has been deep and significant. Before he began inventing, only two of them were known at all as arts, telegraphy and the manufacture of cement. Moreover, these figures deal only with the United States, and take no account of the development of many of the Edison inventions in Europe, or of their adoption throughout the world at large. Let it suffice that in America alone the work of Edison has been one of the most potent factors in bringing into existence new industries now capitalized at nearly seven billion dollars, earning annually over one billion dollars, and giving employment to an army of more than six hundred thousand people. A single diamond prismatically flashing from its many facets, the beauties of reflected light, comes well within the limits of comprehension of the human mind, and appeals to appreciation by the finer sensibilities. But in viewing an exhibition of thousands of these beautiful gems, the eye and brain are simply bewildered with the richness of a display which tends to confuse the intellect until the function of analysis comes into play and leads to more adequate apprehension. So, in presenting the mass of statistics contained in this chapter, we fear that the result may have been the bewilderment of the reader to some extent. Nevertheless, in writing a biography of Edison, the main object is to present the facts as they are, and leave it to the intelligent reader to classify, apply, and analyze them in such manner as appeals most forcibly to his intellectual processes. If in the foregoing pages there has appeared to be a tendency to attribute to Edison the entire credit for the growth to which many of the above-named great enterprises have in these latter days attained, we must especially disclaim any intention of giving rise to such a deduction. No one who has carefully followed the course of this narrative can deny, however, that Edison is the father of some of the arts and industries that have been mentioned, and that, as to some of the others, it was the magic of his touch that helped make them practicable. Not only to his work and ingenuity is due the present magnitude of these arts and industries, but it is attributable also to the splendid work and numerous contributions of such other great inventors, such as Brush, Bell, Elihu Thompson, Weston, Sprague, and many others, as well as to the financiers and investors who in the past thirty years have furnished the vast sums of money that were necessary to exploit and push forward these enterprises. The reader may have noticed in a perusal of this chapter the lack of autobiographical quotations such as have appeared in other parts of this narrative. Edison's modesty has allowed us but one remark on the subject. This was made by him to one of the writers a short time ago, when, after an interesting indulgence in reminiscences of old times and early inventions, he leaned back in his chair, and with a broad smile on his face, said reflectively, Say, I have been mixed up in a whole lot of things, haven't I? End of chapter 27 of Edison, His Life and Inventions 
Read by Dennis Sayers for LibriVox in Modesto, California, summer 2008. Chapter 28 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mitch Leppard. Edison, His Life and Inventions. By Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 28. Throughout the forty-odd years of his creative life, Anderson has realized by costly experience the truth of the cynical proverb that, quote, a patent is merely a title to a lawsuit, end quote. It is not intended, however, by this statement to lead to any inference on the part of the reader that he stands particularly alone in any such experience for it has been, and still is, the common lot of every successful inventor sooner or later. To attribute dishonesty or cupidity as the root of the defense in all patent litigation would be aiming very wide of the mark, for in no class of suits that come before the courts are there any that present a greater variety of complex, finely shaded questions or that require more delicacy of interpretation than those that involve the construction of patents, particularly those relating to electrical devices. Indeed, a careful study of legal procedure of this character could not be carried far without discovery of the fact that in numerous instances the differences of opinion between litigants were marked by the utmost bona fides. On the other hand, such study would reveal many cases of undoubted fraudulent intent, as well as many bold attempts to deprive the inventor of the fruits of his endeavors by those who have sought to evade, through subtle technicalities of the law, the penalty justly due them for trickery, evasion, or open contempt of the rights of others. In the history of science and of the arts to which the world has owed its continued progress from year to year, there is disclosed one remarkable fact, and that is, that whenever any important discovery or invention has been made and announced by one man, it has almost always been disclosed later that other men, possibly widely separated and knowing nothing of the other's work, have been following up the same general lines of investigation, independently, with the same object in mind. Their respective methods might be dissimilar while tending to the same end, but it does not necessarily follow that any one of these other experimenters might ever have achieved the result aimed at, although after the proclamation of success by one, it is easy to believe that each of the other independent investigators might readily persuade himself that he would ultimately have reached the goal in just that same way. This peculiar coincidence of simultaneous but separate work not only comes to light on the bringing out of great and important discoveries or inventions, but becomes more apparent if a new art is disclosed. For then, the imagination of previous experimenters is stimulated through wide dissemination of the tidings, sometimes resulting in more or less effort to enter the newly opened field with devices or methods that resemble closely the original and fundamental ones in principle and application. In this and other ways, there arises constantly in the United States Patent Office a large number of contested cases, called, quote, interferences, end quote, where applications for patents covering the invention of a similar device have been independently filed by two or even more persons. In such cases, 
only one patent can be issued, and that to the inventor, who on the taking of testimony shows priority in date of invention. See footnote 20. Footnote 20. A most remarkable instance of contemporaneous invention, and without a parallel, in the annals of the United States Patent Office, occurred when, on the same day, February 15, 1876, two separate descriptions were filed in that office, one a complete application, and the other a caveat, but each covering an invention for, quote, transmitting vocal sounds telegraphically, end quote. The application was made by Alexander Graham Bell of Salem, Massachusetts, and the caveat by Elisha Gray of Chicago, Illinois. On examination of the two papers, it was found that both of them covered practically the same ground. Hence, as only one patent could be granted, it became necessary to ascertain the precise hour at which the documents were respectively filed and put the parties in interference. This was done with the result that the patent was ultimately awarded to Bell. End of footnote. In the opening up and development of any new art, based upon a fundamental discovery or invention, there ensues naturally an era of supplemental or collateral inventive activity, the legitimate outcome of the basic original ideas. Part of this development may be due to the inventive skill and knowledge of the original inventor and his associates, who by reason of prior investigation would be in better position to follow up the art in its earliest details than others who might be regarded as mere outsiders. Thus a new enterprise may be presented before the world by its promoters in the belief that they are strongly fortified by patent rights which will protect them in a degree commensurate with the risks they have assumed. Supplemental inventions, however, in any art, new or old, are not limited to those which emanate from the original workers, for the ingenuity of man, influenced by the spirit of the times, seizes upon any novel line of action and seeks to improve or enlarge upon it, or at any rate to produce more or less variation of its phases. Consequently, there is a constant endeavor on the part of a countless host of men possessing some degree of technical skill and inventive ability to win fame and money by entering into the already open fields of endeavor with devices and methods of their own, for which subsidiary patents may be obtainable. Some of such patents may prove to be valuable, while it is quite certain that in the natural order of things others will be commercially worthless but none may be entirely disregarded in the history and development of the art. It will be quite obvious, therefore, that the advent of any useful invention or discovery, great or small, is followed by a clashing of many interests which become complex in their interpretation by reason of the many conflicting claims that cluster around the main principle. Nor is the confusion less confounded through efforts made on the part of dishonest persons, who, like vultures, follow closely on the trail of successful inventors, and, sometimes through information derived by underhand methods, obtain patents on alleged inventions closely approximating the real ones, solely for the purpose of harassing the original patentee until they are bought up or else with the intent of competing boldly in the new business, trust in the delays of legal proceedings to obtain a sure foothold in their questionable enterprise. Then again, there are still others who, having no patent rights, but waving aside all compunction and in downright fraud, simply enter the commercial field against the whole world, using ruthlessly whatever inventive skill and knowledge the original patentee may have disclosed, and, trusting to the power of money, rapid movement, and mendacious advertising to build up a business which shall presently assume such formidable proportions as to force a compromise or stave off an injunction until the patent has expired. In nine cases out of ten, such a course can be followed with relative impunity 
and guided by skillful experts who may suggest really trivial changes here and there over the patented structure. And with the aid of keen and able counsel, hardly a patent exists that could not be invaded by such infringers. Such is the condition of our laws and practice that the patentee, in seeking to enforce his rights, labors under terrible handicap. And finally, in this recital of perplexing conditions confronting the inventor, there must not be forgotten the commercial, quote, shark, end quote, whose predatory instincts are ever keenly alert for tender victims. In the wake of every newly developed art of worldwide importance, there is sure to follow a number of unscrupulous adventurers who hasten to take advantage of general public ignorance of the true inwardness of affairs. Basing their operations on this lack of knowledge and upon the tendency of human nature to give credence to widely advertised and high-sounding descriptions and specious promises of vast profits, these men find little difficulty in conjuring money out of the pockets of the unsophisticated and gullible who rush to become stockholders in concerns that have, quote, airy nothings, end quote, for a foundation, and that collapse quickly when the bubble is pricked. See footnote 21. Footnote 21. A notable instance of the fleecing of unsuspecting and credulous persons occurred in the early 80s, during the furor occasioned by the introduction of Mr. Edison's electric light system. A corporation claiming to have a self-generating dynamo, practically perpetual motion, advertised its preposterous claims extensively, and actually succeeded in selling a large amount of stock, which of course proved to be absolutely worthless. End of footnote. To one who is unacquainted with the trying circumstances attending the introduction and marketing of patented devices, it might seem unnecessary that an inventor and his business associates should be obliged to take into account the unlawful or ostensible competition of pirates or schemers, who in the absence of legal decision may run a free course for a long time. Nevertheless, as public patronage is the element vitally requisite for commercial success, and as the public is not usually in full possession of all the facts, and therefore cannot discriminate between the genuine and the false, the legitimate inventor must avail himself of every possible means of proclaiming and asserting his rights if he desires to derive any benefit from the results of his skill and labor. Not only must he be prepared to fight in the patent office and pursue a regular course of patent litigation against those who may honestly deem themselves to be protected by other inventions or patents of similar character, and also proceed against more palpable infringers who are openly, defiantly, and illegitimately engaged in competitive business operations. But he must, as well, endeavor to protect himself against the assaults of impudent fraud by educating the public mind to a point of intelligent apprehension of the true status of his invention and the conflicting claims involved. When the nature of a patent right is considered, it is difficult to see why this should be so. The inventor creates a thing, an invention of utility, and the people, represented by the federal government, Say to him, in effect, quote, Disclose your invention to us in a patent, so that we may know how to practice it. And we will agree to give you a monopoly for seventeen years, after which we shall be free to use it. If the right thus granted is invaded, apply to a federal court, and the infringer will be enjoined and required to settle in damages. End quote. Fair and false promise. It is generally realized that no matter how flagrant the infringement, nor how barefaced and impudent the infringer, no federal court will grant an injunction until the patent shall have been first litigated to final hearing and sustained? A procedure, it may be stated, 
requiring years and time and thousands of dollars, during which other infringers have generally entered the field and all have grown fat. Thus Edison and his business associates have been forced into a veritable maelstrom of litigation during the major part of the last forty years, in the effort to procure for themselves a small measure of protection for their interests under the numerous inventions of note that he has made at various times in that period. The earlier years of his inventive activity, while productive of many important contributions to electrical industries such as stock tickets and printers, duplex, quadruplex, and automatic telegraphs, were not marked by the turmoil of interminable legal conflicts that arose after the beginning of the telephone and electric light epochs. In fact, his inventions, up to and including his telephone improvements, which entered into already existing arts, had been mostly purchased by the Western Union and other companies, and while there was more or less contesting of his claims, especially in respect of the telephone, the extent of such litigation was not so conspicuously great as that which centered subsequently around his patents covering incandescent electric lighting and power systems. Through these inventions there came into being an entirely new art, complete in its practic capability, evolved by Edison, after protracted experiments founded upon most patent, thorough, and original methods of investigation extending over several years. Long before attaining the goal, he had realized with characteristic insight the underlying principles of the great and comprehensive problem he had started out to solve, and plotted steadily along the path that he had marked out ignoring the almost universal scientific disbelief in his ultimate success. Quote, dreamer, end quote. Quote, fool, end quote. Quote, boaster, end quote, were among the appellations bestowed upon him by unbelieving critics. Ridicule was heaped upon him in the public prints, and mathematics were called into service by learned men to settle the point forever that he was attempting the utterly impossible. But, presto, no sooner had he accomplished the task and shown concrete results to the world than he found himself in the anonymous position of being at once surrounded by the conditions which inevitably confront every inventor. The path through the trackless forest had been blazed, and now everyone could find the way. At the end of the road was a rich prize, belonging rightfully to the man who had opened a way to it, but the struggles of others to reach it by more or less honest methods now began and continued for many years. If, as a former commissioner once said, quote, Edison was the man who kept the path to the patent office hot with his footsteps, end quote, there were other great inventors abreast or immediately on his heels, some, to be sure, with legitimate, original methods and vital improvements representing independent work, while there were also those who did not trouble to invent, but simply helped themselves to whatever ideas were available and coming from any source. Possibly events might have happened differently had Edison been able to prevent the announcement of his electric-like inventions until he was entirely prepared to bring out the system as a whole, ready for commercial exploitation. But the news of his production of a practical and successful incandescent lamp became known, and spread like wildfire to all corners of the globe. It took more than a year after the evolution of the lamp for Edison to get into position to do actual business, and during that time his laboratory was the natural mecca of every inquiring person. Small wonder, then, that when he was prepared to market his invention, he should find these others entering that market, at home and abroad, at the same time, and with substantially similar merchandise. Edison narrates two incidents that may be taken as characteristic of a good deal that had to be contended with, coming in the shape of nefarious attack. Quote, in the early days of my electric light, end quote, he says, quote, Q. 
curiosity, and interest brought a great many people to Menlo Park to see it. Some of them did not come with the best of intentions. I remember the visit of one expert, a well-known electrician, a graduate of Johns Hopkins University, and who then represented a Baltimore gas company. We had the lamps exhibited in a large room, and so arranged on a table as to illustrate the regular layout of circuits for houses and streets. Sixty of the men employed at the laboratory were used as watchers, each to keep an eye on a certain section of the exhibit, and see there was no monkeying with it. This man had a length of insulated number 10 wire passing through his sleeves and around his back so that his hands would conceal the ends, and no one would know he had it. His idea, of course, was to put this wire across the ends of the supplying circuits and short-circuit the whole thing, put it all out of business without being detected. Then he could report how easily the electric light went out and a false impression would be conveyed to the public. He did not know that we had already worked out the safety fuse, and that every group of lights was thus protected independently. He put his jumper slyly in contact with the wires, and just four lamps went out on the section he tampered with. The watchers saw him do it, however, and got hold of him, and just led him out of the place with language that made the recording angels jump for their typewriters. End quote. The other incident is as follows. Quote, Soon after I had got out the incandescent light, I had an interference in the patent office with a man from Wisconsin. He filed an application for a patent and entered into a conspiracy to, quote, swear back, end quote, of the date of my invention so as to deprive me of it. Detectives were put on the case, and we found he was a, quote, faker, end quote. And we took means to break the thing up. Eugene Lewis, of Eaton and Lewis, had this in hand for me. Several years later, this same man attempted to defraud a leading firm of manufacturing chemists in New York and was sent to state prison. A short time after that, a syndicate took up a man named Goebel and tried to do the same thing. But again, our detective work was too much for them. This was along the same lines as the attempt of Drawbaugh to deprive Bell of his telephone. Whenever an invention of large prospective value comes out, these cases always occur. The lamp patent was sustained in the New York Federal Court. I thought that was final and would end the matter, but another federal judge out in St. Louis did not sustain it. The result is that I have never enjoyed any benefits from my lamp patents, although I fought for many years. End quote. The Goebel case will be referred to later in this chapter. The original owner of the patents and inventions covering his electric lighting system, the Edison Electric Light Company, in which Edison was largely interested as a stockholder, thus found at the outset that its commercial position was imperiled by the activity of competitors who had sprung up like mushrooms. It became necessary to take proper preliminary legal steps to protect the interests which had been acquired at the cost of so much money and incessant toil and experiment. During the first few years in which the business of the introduction of the light was carried on with such strenuous and concentrated effort, the attention of Edison and his original associates was constantly focused upon the commercial exploitation and the further development of the system at home and abroad. The difficult and perplexing situation at that time is thus described by Major S. B. Eaton. Quote, the reason for the delay in beginning and pushing suits for infringements of the lamp patent has never been generally understood. In my official position as president of the Edison Electric Light Company, I became the target, along with Mr. Edison for censure from the stockholders and others on account of this delay. And I well remember how deep the feeling was. 
In view of the facts that a final injunction on the lamp patent was not obtained until the life of the patent was near its end, and next, that no damages in money were ever paid by the guilty infringers, it has been generally believed that Mr. Edison sacrificed the interest of his stockholders selfishly when he delayed the prosecution of patent suits and gave all his time and energies to manufacturing. This belief was the stronger because the manufacturing enterprises belonged personally to Mr. Edison and not to his company, but the facts render it easy to dispel this false belief. The Edison inventions were not only a lamp, they comprised also an entire system of central stations. Such a thing was new to the world, and the apparatus, as well as the manufacture thereof, was equally new. Boilers, engines, dynamos, motors, distribution mains, meters, house wiring, safety devices, lamps, and lamp fixtures, all were vital parts of the whole system. Most of them were utterly novel and unknown to the arts, and all of them required quick and, I might say, revolutionary thought and invention. The firm of Babcock and Wilk gave aid on the boilers. Armington and Sims undertook the engines, but everything else was abnormal. No factories in the land would take up the manufacture. I remember, for instance, our interviews with Messrs. Mitchell, Vance, and Company, the leading manufacturers of house gas lighting fixtures, such as brackets and chandeliers. They had no faith in electric lighting, and rejected all our overtures to induce them to take up the new business of making electric light fixtures. As regards other parts of the Edison system, notably the Edison Dynamo, no such machines had ever existed. There was no factory in the world equipped to make them, and, most discouraging of all, the very scientific principles of their construction were still vague and experimental. Quote, what was to be done? Mr. Edison has never been greater than when we met and solved this crisis. Quote, if there are no factories, end quote, he said, quote, to make my inventions, I will build the factories myself. Since capital is timid, I will raise and supply it. The issue is factories or death. End quote. Mr. Edison invited the cooperation of his leading stockholders. They lacked confidence or did not care to increase their investments. He was forced to go on a loan. The chain of Edison shops was then created. By far, the most perplexing of these new manufacturing problems was the lamp. Not only was it a new industry, one without shadow of prototype, but the mechanical devices for making the lamps, and to some extent the very machines to make those devices, were to be invented. All of this was to be done by the courage, capital, and invincible energy of the genius of the great inventor. But Mr. Edison could not create these great and diverse industries and at the same time give requisite attention to litigation. He could not start and develop the new and hard business of electric lighting and yet spare one hour to pursue infringers. One thing or the other must wait. All agreed that it must be the litigation. And right there... A lasting blow was given to the prestige of the Edison patents. The delay was translated as meaning lack of confidence, and the alert infringer grew strong in courage and capital. Moreover, and what was the heaviest blow of all, he had time, thus unmolested, to get a good start. Quote, in looking back on those days and scrutinizing them through the years, I am impressed by the greatness, the solitary greatness, I might say, of Mr. Edison. We all felt then that we were of importance, and that our contribution of effort and zeal were vital. I can see now, however, that the best of us was nothing but the fly on the wheel. Suppose anything had happened to Edison. All would have been chaos and ruin. To him, therefore, 
be the glory, if not the profit. End quote. The foregoing remarks of Major Eaton show authoritatively how the much-discussed delay in litigating the Edison patents was so greatly misunderstood at the time, how imperatively necessary it was for Edison and his associates to devote their entire time and energies to the commercial development of the art. As the lighting business increased, however, and a great number of additional men were initiated into its mysteries, Edison and his experts were able to spare some time to legal matters, and an era of active patent litigation against infringers was opened about the year 1885 by the Edison Company, and thereafter continued for many years. While the history of this vast array of legal proceedings possesses a fascinating interest for those involved, as well as for professional men, legal and scientific, it could not be expected that it would excite any such feeling on the part of a casual reader. Hence, it is not proposed to encumber this narrative with any detailed record of the numerous suits that were brought and conducted through their complicated ramifications by eminent counsel. Suffice it to say that within about sixteen years after the commencement of active patent litigation, there had been spent by the owners of the Edison Lighting Patents upwards of two million dollars in prosecuting more than two hundred lawsuits brought against persons who were infringing many of the patents of Edison on the incandescent electric lamp and component parts of his system. Over fifty separate patents were involved in these suits, including the basic one on the lamp, ordinarily called the filament patent, other detail lamp patents, as well as those on sockets, switches, dynamos, motors, and distributing systems. The principal, or, quote, test, end quote, suit, on the, quote, filament, end quote, patent, was that brought against, quote, the United States Electric Lighting Company, end quote, which became a cause celeb in the annals of American jurisprudence. Edison's claims were strenuously and stubbornly contested throughout a series of intense legal conflicts that raged in the courts for a great many years. Both sides of the controversy were represented by legal talent of the highest order, under whose examination and cross-examination volumes of testimony were taken, until the printed record, including exhibits, amounted to more than 6,000 pages. Scientific and technical literature and records in all parts of the civilized world were subjected to the most minute scrutiny of opposing experts in the endeavor to prove Edison to be merely an adapter of methods and devices already projected or suggested by others. The world was ransacked for anything that might be claimed as an anticipation of what he had done. Every conceivable phase of ingenuity that could be devised by technical experts was exercised in the attempt to show that Edison had accomplished nothing new. Everything that legal acumen could suggest, every subtle technicality of the law, all the complicated variations of phraseology that the novel nomenclature of a young art would allow, all were pressed into service and availed of by the contesters of the Edison invention in their desperate effort to defeat his claims. It was all in vain, however, for the decision of the court was in favor of Edison, and his lamp patent was sustained not only by the tribunal of the first resort, but also by the appellate court some time afterward. The first trial was had before Judge Wallace in the United States Circuit Court for the Southern District of New York, and the appeal was heard by Judges Lacombe and Shipman of the United States Circuit Court of Appeals. Before both tribunals, the cause had been fully represented by counsel chosen from among the most eminent representatives of the bar at that time, those representing the Edison interests being the late Clarence A. Seward, and Grovesvener P. Lowry, together with Sherburne Blake Eaton, Albert H. Walker, and Richard N. Dyer. 
The presentation of the case to the courts had in both instances been marked by masterly and able arguments, elucidated by experiments and demonstrations to educate the judges on technical points. Some appreciation of the magnitude of this case may be gained from the fact that the argument on its first trial employed a great many days, and the minutes covered hundreds of pages of closely typewritten matter, while the argument on appeal required eight days and was set forth in 850 pages of typewriting. Eliminating all purely forensic eloquence and ex parte statements, the addresses of counsel in this celebrated suit are worthy of deep study by an earnest student, for, taken together, they compromise the most concise, authentic, and complete history of the prior state of the art and the development of the incandescent lamp that had been made up to that time. See footnote 22. Footnote 22. The argument on appeal was conducted with the dignity and decorum that characterize such a proceeding in that court. There is usually little that savors of humor in the ordinary conduct of a case of this kind, but in the present instance a pertinent study was related by Mr. Lowry, and is now reproduced. In the course of his address to the court, Mr. Lowry said, quote, I have to mention the name of one expert whose testimony will, I believe, be found as accurate, as sincere, as straightforward as if it were the preaching of the gospel. I do it with great pleasure, and I ask you to read the testimony of Charles L. Clark along with that of Thomas A. Edison. He had rather a hard row to hoe. He's a young gentleman. He's a very well-instructed man in his profession. He is not what I have called in the argument below an expert in the art of testifying, like some of the others. He has not yet become expert. What he may descend to later cannot be known. He entered upon his first experience, I think, with my brother Duncan, who is no trifler when it comes to deal with these questions, and for several months Mr. Clark was pursued up and down over a range of suggestions of what he would have thought if he had thought something else had been said at some time when something else was not said. End quote. Mr. Duncan, quote, I got three pages a day out of him, too. End quote. Mr. Lowry, quote, Well, it was a good result. It always recalled to me what I venture now, since my friend breaks in upon me in this rude manner to tell the court as well illustrative of what happened there. It is the story of the pickerel and the roach. My friend, Professor von Reisenberg of the University of Ghent, pursued a series of investigations into the capacity of various animals to receive ideas. Among the rest he put a pickerel into a tank containing water, and separated across its middle by a transparent glass plate, and on the other side he put a red roach. Now, your honors both know how a pickerel loves a red roach, and I have no doubt you will remember that he is a fish of a very low forehead and an unlimited appetite. When this pickerel saw the red roach through the glass, he made one of those awful dashes which is usually the ruin of whatever stands in its way. But he didn't reach the red roach. He received an impression, doubtless. It was not sufficient, however, to discourage him, and he immediately tried again and he continued to try for three-quarters of an hour. At the end of three-quarters of an hour, he seemed a little shaken and discouraged and stopped, and the red roach was taken out for that day, and the pickerel left. On the succeeding day, the red roach was restored, and the pickerel had forgotten the impressions of the first day, and he repeated this again. At the end of the second day, the roach was taken out. This was continued not through so long a period as the effort to take my friend Clark and devour him, but for a period of about three weeks. At the end of the three weeks, the time during which the pickerel resisted each day had been shortened and shortened, 
until it was at last discovered that he didn't try at all. The plate glass was then removed, and the pickerel and the red roach sailed around together in perfect peace ever afterward. The pickerel doubtless attributed to the roach all this shaking, the rebuff which he had received, and that is about the condition in which my brother Duncan and my friend Clark were at the end of this examination. End quote. Mr. Duncan, quote, I notice on the redirect that Mr. Clark changed his color. End quote. Mr. Lowry, quote, Well, perhaps he has a different kind of a roach then, but you didn't succeed in taking him. Quote, I beg your honors to read the testimony of Mr. Clark in the light of the anecdote of the pickerel and the roach. End quote. Owing to long protracted delays incident to the taking of testimony and preparation for trial, the argument before the United States Circuit Court of Appeals was not had until the late spring of 1892, and its decision in favor of the Edison Lamp patent was filed on October 4, 1892, more than twelve years after the issuance of the patent itself. As the term of the patent had been limited under the law, because certain foreign patents had been issued to Edison before that in this country, there was now but a short time left for enjoyment of the exclusive rights contemplated by the statute and granted to Edison and his assigns by the terms of the patent itself. A vigorous and aggressive legal campaign was therefore inaugurated by the Edison Electric Light Company against the numerous infringing companies and individuals that had sprung up while the main suit was pending. Old suits were revived and new ones instituted. Injunctions were obtained against many old offenders, and it seemed as though the Edison interests were about to come into their own for the brief unexpected term of the fundamental patent when a new bombshell was dropped into the Edison camp in the shape of an alleged anticipation of the invention forty years previously by one Henry Goebel. Thus, in 1893, the litigation was reopened, and a protracted series of stubbornly contested conflicts was fought in the courts. Goebel's claims were not unknown to the Edison Company, for as far back as 1882, they had been officially brought to its notice, coupled with an offer of sale for a few thousand dollars. A very brief examination into their merits, however, sufficed to demonstrate most emphatically that Goebel had never made a practical incandescent lamp, nor had he ever contributed a single idea or device bearing remotely or directly on the development of the art. Edison and his company, therefore, rejected the offer unconditionally, and declined to enter into any arrangements whatever with Goebel. During the prosecution of the suits in 1893, it transpired that the global claims had also been investigated by the counsel of the defendant company in the principal litigation already related but although every conceivable defense and anticipation had been dragged into the case during the many years of its progress, the alleged global anticipation was not even touched upon therein. From this fact, it is quite apparent that they placed no credence on its bona fides. But desperate cases call for desperate remedies. Some of the infringing lamp manufacturing concerns which during the long litigation had grown strong and lusty, and thus far had not been enjoined by the court, now saw injunctions staring them in the face, and in desperation set up the global so-called anticipation as a defense in the suits brought against them. This German watchmaker, Goebel, located in the east side of New York City, had undoubtedly been interested, in a desultory kind of way, in simple physical phenomenon, and a few trifling experiments made by him some forty or forty-five years previously, 
were magnified and distorted into brilliant and all-comprehensive discoveries and inventions. Avalanches of affidavits of himself, quote, his sisters and his cousins and his aunts, and quote, practically all persons in ordinary walks of life and of old friends, contributed a host of recollections that seemed little short of miraculous in their detailed accounts of events of a scientific nature that were said to have occurred as many years before. According to affidavits of Goebel himself and some of his family, nothing that would anticipate Edison's claim had been omitted from his work, for he, Goebel, claimed to have employed the all-glass globe into which were sealed platinum wires carrying a tenuous carbon filament from which the occluded gases had been liberated during the process of high exhaustion. He had even determined upon bamboo as the best material for filaments. On the face of it, he was seemingly gifted with more than human prescience, for in at least one of his exhibit lamps, said to have been made twenty years previously, he claimed to have employed processes which Edison and his associates had only developed by several years of experience in making thousands of lamps. The Goebel story was told by the affidavits in an ingenious manner, with a wealth of simple, homely detail that carried on its face an appearance of truth calculated to deceive the elect, had not the elect been somewhat prepared by their investigation made some eleven years before. The story was met by the Edison interests with counter-affidavits, showing its utter improbabilities and absurdities from the standpoint of men of science and others versed in the history and practice of the art. Also, affidavits of other acquaintances and neighbors of Goebel flatly denying the exhibitions he claimed to have made. The issue thus being joined, the legal battle raged over different sections of the country. A number of contumeliously defiant infringers in various cities based fond hopes of immunity upon the success of this global evidence, but were defeated. The attitude of the courts is well represented in the opinion of Judge Colt, rendered in a motion for injunction against the Beacon Vacuum Pump and Electric Company. The defense alleged the Goebel anticipation, in support of which it offered in evidence four lamps, numbers one, two, and three, purporting to have been made before 1854, and number four, before 1872. After a very full review of the facts in the case, and a fair consideration of the defendant's affidavits, Judge Colt, in his opinion, goes on to say, quote, It is extremely improbable that Henry Goebel constructed a practical incandescent lamp in 1854. This is manifest from the history of the art for the past fifty years. The electrical laws which since that time have been discovered as applicable to the incandescent lamp, the imperfect means which then existed for obtaining a vacuum, the high degree of skill necessary in the construction of all its parts, and the crude instruments with which Goebel worked. Quote, Whether Goebel made the fiddle bow lamps one, two, and three is not necessary to determine. The weight of evidence on this motion is in the direction that he made these lamp or lamps similar in general appearance, though it is manifest that few, if any, of the many witnesses who saw the Goebel lamp could form an accurate judgment of the size of the filament or burner. But assuming they were made, they do not anticipate the invention of Edison. At most, they were experimental toys used to advertise his telescope, or to flash a lamp upon his clock, or to attract customers to his shop. They were crudely constructed, and their life was brief. They could not be used for domestic purposes. They were in no proper sense the practical commercial lamp of Edison. 
The literature of the art is full of better lamps, all of which are held not to anticipate the Edison patent. Quote, As for lamp number four, I cannot but view it with suspicion. It presents a new appearance. The reason given for not introducing it before the hearing is unsatisfactory. This lamp, to my mind, envelops with a cloud of distrust the whole Goebel story. It is simply impossible, under the circumstances, to believe that a lamp so constructed could have been made by Goebel before 1872. Nothing in the evidence warrants such a supposition, and other things show it to be untrue. This lamp has a carbon filament, platinum leading in wires, a good vacuum, and is well sealed and highly finished. It is said that this lamp shows no traces of mercury in the bulb, because the mercury was distilled. But Goebel says nothing about distilled mercury in his first affidavit, and twice he speaks of the particles of mercury clinging to the inside of the chamber, and for that reason he constructed a Geisler pump after he moved to 468 Grand Street, which was in 1877. Again, if this lamp had been in his possession since before 1872, as he and his son swear, why was it not shown to Mr. Crosby, of the American Company, when he visited his shop in 1881 and was much interested in his lamps? Why was it not shown to Mr. Curtis, the leading counsel for the defendants in the New York cases, when he was asked to produce a lamp and promised to do so. Why did not his son take this lamp to Mr. Bull's office in 1892, when he took the old fiddle-bow lamps one, two, and three? Why did not his son take this lamp to Mr. Eaton's office in 1882, when he tried to negotiate the sale of his father's inventions to the Edison Company? A lamp so constructed and made before 1872, was worth a large sum of money to those interested in defeating the Edison patent, like the American company. And Goebel was not a rich man. Both he and one of his sons were employed in 1881 by the American company. Why did he not show this lamp to McMahon when he called in the interest of the American company and talked over the electrical matters? When Mr. Dreyer tried to organize a company in 1882 and procured an option from him of all his inventions relating to electric lighting, for which $925 was paid, and when an old lamp of this kind was of vital consequence and would have ensured a fortune, why was it not forthcoming? Mr. Dreyer asked Goebel to produce an old lamp and was especially anxious to find one pending his negotiations with the Edison Company for the sale of Goebel's inventions. Why did he not produce this lamp in his interview with Bohm of the American Company, or Moses of the Edison Company, when it was for his interest to do so? The value of such an anticipation of the Edison lamp was made known to him. He was desirous of realizing upon his inventions. He was proud of his incandescent lamps, and was pleased to talk about them with anybody who would listen. Is it conceivable, under all these circumstances, that he should have had this all-important lamp in his possession from 1872 to 1893, and yet no one have heard of it or seen it except his son? It cannot be said that ignorance of the English language offers an excuse. He knew English very well, although Bohm and Breyer conversed with him in German. His children spoke English. Neither his ignorance nor his simplicity prevented him from taking out these patents, the first in 1865 for a sewing machine hammer, and the last in 1882 for an improvement in incandescent lamps. If he made lamp number four previous to 1872, why was it not also patented? Quote, 
There are other circumstances which throw light on this alleged global anticipation. The suit against the United States Electric Lighting Company was brought in the Southern District of New York in 1885. Large interests were at stake, and the main defense in the Edison patent was based on prior inventions. This global claim was then investigated by the leading counsel for the defense, Mr. Curtis. It was further inquired into in 1892, in the case against the Sawyer Man Company. It was brought to the attention and consideration by the Edison Company in 1882. It was at that time known to the American Company, who hoped by this means to defeat the monopoly under the Edison patent. Dreyer tried to organize a company for its purchase. Young Goebel tried to sell it. It must have been known to hundreds of people. And now, when the Edison Company, after years of litigation, leaving but a short time for the patent to run, have obtained a final adjudication establishing its validity, this claim is again resurrected to defeat the operation of the judgment so obtained. A court in equity should not look with favor on such a defense. Upon the evidence here presented, I agree with the first impression of Mr. Curtis and with the opinion of Mr. Dickerson that whatever Goebel did must be considered as an abandoned experiment. Quote, it has often been laid down that a meritorious invention is not to be defeated by something which rests in speculation or experiment, or which is rudimentary or incomplete. End quote. Quote, the law requires not conjecture, but certainty. It is easy, after an important invention has gone into public use, for persons to come forward with claims that they invented the same thing years before and to endeavor to establish this by the recollection of witnesses as to events long past. Such evidence is to be received with great caution, and the presumption of novelty arising from the grant of the patent is not to be overcome except upon clear and convincing proof. When the defendant company entered upon the manufacture of incandescent lamps in May 1891, it well knew the consequences which must follow a favorable decision for the Edison Company in the New York case. End quote. The injunction was granted. Other courts took practically the same view of the Goebbels story as was taken by Judge Colt, and the injunctions asked in behalf of the Edison interests were granted on all applications except one in St. Louis, Missouri in proceedings instituted against a strong local concern of that city. Quote, Thus, at the eleventh hour, in the life of this important patent, after a long period of costly litigation, Edison and his associates were compelled to assume the defensive against a claimant whose utterly baseless pretensions had already been thoroughly investigated and rejected years before by every interested party, and ultimately, on examination by the courts, pronounced legally untenable, if not indeed actually fraudulent. Irritating as it was to be forced into the position of combating a proposition so well known to be preposterous and insincere, there was nothing else to do but to fight this fabrication with all the strenuous and deadly earnestness that would have been brought to bear on a really meritorious defense. Not only did this Goebel episode divert for a long time the energies of the Edison interests from activities in other directions, but the cost of overcoming the extravagantly absurd claims ran up into hundreds of thousands of dollars. Another quotation for Major Eaton is of interest in this connection. Quote, now a word about the Goebel case. I took personal charge of running down this man and his pretensions in the section of the city where he lived and among his old neighbors. They were a typical east side lot, ignorant, generally stupid, incapable of long memory, but ready to oblige a neighbor and to turn an easy dollar by putting a cross mark 
at the bottom of a forthcoming friendly affidavit. I can say in all truth and justice that their testimony was utterly false, and that the lawyers who took it must have known it. The Goebel case emphasizes two defects in the court procedure in patent cases. One is that they must be spun out almost interminably, even, possibly, to the end of the life of the patent. The other is that the judge who decides the case does not see the witnesses. That adverse decision at St. Louis would never have been made if the court could have seen the man who swore for Goebel. When I met Mr. F. P. Fish on his return from St. Louis, after he had argued the Edison side, he felt keenly that disadvantage to say nothing of the hopeless difficulty of educating the court. End quote. In the earliest days of the art, when it was apparent that incandescent lighting had come to stay, the Edison Company was a shining mark at which the shafts of the dishonest were aimed. Many there were who stood ready to furnish affidavits that they or someone else whom they controlled had really invented the lamp, but would obligingly withdraw and leave Edison in possession of the field on payment of money. Investigation of those cases, however, revealed invariably the purely fraudulent nature of all such offers, which were uniformly declined. As the incandescent light began to advance rapidly in public favor, the immense proportions of the future market became sufficiently obvious to tempt unauthorized persons to enter the field and become manufacturers. When the lamp became a thoroughly established article, it was not a difficult matter to copy it, especially when there were employees to be hired away at increased pay, and their knowledge utilized by the more unscrupulous of these new competitors. This is not conjecture, but known to be fact, and the practice continued many years, during which new lamp companies sprang up on every side. Hence, it is not surprising that on the whole, the Edison lamp litigation was not less remarkable for quantity than quality. Between eighty and ninety separate suits upon Edison's fundamental lamp and detailed patents were brought in the courts of the United States and prosecuted to completion. In passing, it may be mentioned that in England, France, and Germany also, the Edison Fundamental Lamp Patent was stubbornly fought in the judicial arena, and his claim to be the first inventor of practical incandescent lighting was uniformly sustained in all those countries. Infringement was not, however, confined to the lamp alone, but in America extended all along the line of Edison patents relating to the production and distribution of electric light including those on dynamos, motors, distributing systems, sockets, switches, and other details which he had from time to time embedded. Consequently, in order to protect its interest at all points, the Edison Company had found it necessary to pursue a vigorous policy of instituting legal proceedings against the infringers of these various patents. And in addition to the large number of suits on the lamp alone, not less than 125 other separate actions involving some 50 or more of Edison's principal electric lighting patents were brought against concerns which were wrongfully appropriating his ideas and actively competing with his companies in the market. The ramifications of this litigation became so extensive and complex as to render it necessary to institute a special bureau or department through which the immense detail could be systematically sifted, analyzed, and arranged in collaboration with the numerous experts and counsel responsible for the conduct of the various cases. This department was organized in 1889 by Major Eaton, who was at this time, and for some years afterward, its general counsel. In the selection of the head of this department, a man of methodical and analytical habit of mind was necessary, 
capable of clear reasoning, and at the same time, one who had gained a thoroughly practical experience in electric light and power fields. And the choice fell upon Mr. W. J. Jenks, the manager of the Edison Central Station at Brockton, Massachusetts. He had resigned that position in 1885, and had spent the intervening period in exploiting the Edison Municipal System of Lighting, as well as taking an active part in various other branches of the Edison Enterprises. Thus, throughout the life of Edison's patents on electric light, power, and distribution, the interminable legal strife has continued from day to day, from year to year. Other inventors, some of them great and notable, have been coming into the field since the foundation of the art. Patents have multiplied exceedingly. Improvement has succeeded improvement. Great companies have grown greater. New concerns have come into existence. Coalitions and mergers have taken place, all tending to produce changes in methods, but not much in diminution of patent litigation. While Edison has not for a long time past interested himself particularly in electric light and power inventions, the Bureau which was initiated under the old regime in 1889 still continues, enlarged in scope, directed by its original chief, but now conducted under the auspices of several allied companies, whose great volumes of combined patents, including those of Edison, cover a very wide range of the electrical field. As the general conception and theory of a lawsuit is the recovery of some material benefit, the lay mind is apt to conceive of great sums of money being awarded to a complainant by way of damages upon a favorable decision in an important patent case. It might therefore be natural to ask how far Edison or his companies have benefited pecuniarily by reason of the many belated victories they had scored in the courts. To this question a strict regard for truth compels the answer that they have not been benefited at all, not to the extent of a single dollar, so far as cash damages are concerned. It is not to be denied, however, that substantial advantages have accrued to them more or less directly through the numerous favorable decisions obtained by them as a result of the enormous amount of litigation, in the prosecution of which so great a sum of money has been spent, and so concentrated an amount of effort and time lavished. Indeed, it would be strange and unaccountable were the results otherwise. While the benefits derived were not directly pecuniary in their nature, they were such as tended to strengthen commercially the position of the rightful owners of the patents. Many irresponsible and purely piratical concerns were closed altogether. Others were compelled to take out royalty licenses, consolidations of large interests were brought about, the public was gradually educated to a more correct view of the true merits of conflicting claims and, generally speaking, the business has been greatly unified and brought within well-defined and controlled lines. Not only in relation to his electric light and power inventions has the progress of Edison and his associates been attended by legal controversy all through the years of their exploitation, but also in respect to other inventions, notably those relating to the phonograph and to motion pictures. The interesting endeavors of infringers to divert into their own pockets some of the proceeds arising from the marketing of the devices covered by Edison's inventions on these latter lines necessitated the institution by him some years ago of a legal department which, as in the case of the light inventions, was designed to consolidate all law and expert work and place it under the management of a general counsel. The department is of considerable extent, including a number of resident and other associate counsel, and a general office staff, all of whom are constantly engaged from day to day in patent litigation and other legal work necessary to protect the Edison interests. 
Through their labors, the old story is reiterated in the contesting of approximate but conflicting claims, the never-ending effort to suppress infringement, and the destruction as far as possible of the commercial pirates who set sail upon the seas of all successful enterprises. The details, circumstances, and technical questions are, of course, different from those relating to other classes of inventions. And although there has been no cause celeb concerning the phonograph and motion picture patents, the contention is as sharp and strenuous as it was in the cases relating to electric lighting and heavy current techniques. Mr. Edison's storage battery and the poured cement house have not yet reached the stage of great commercial enterprises, and therefore have not yet risen to the dignity of patent litigation. If, however, the experience of past years is any criterion, there will probably come a time in the future when, despite present widely expressed incredulity and contemptuous sniffs of unbelief in the practicability of his ideas in these directions, ultimate success will give rise to a series of hotly contested legal conflicts such as have signalized the practical outcome of his past efforts in other lines. When it is considered what Edison has done, what the sum and substance of his contributions to human comfort and happiness have been, the results, as measured by legal success, have been pitiable. With the exception of the favorable decision on the incandescent lamp filament patent, coming so late, however, that but little practical good was accomplished, the reader may search the law books in vain for a single decision squarely and fairly sustaining a single patent of first order. There never was a monopoly in incandescent electric lighting, and even from the earliest days competitors and infringers were in the field reaping the benefits, and though defeated in the end, paying not a cent of tribute. The market was practically as free and open as if no patent existed. There never was a monopoly in the phonograph. Practically all of the vital inventions were deliberately appropriated by others, and the inventor was laughed at for his pains. Even so beautiful a process as that for the duplication of phonograph records was solely held by a federal judge as lacking invention as being obvious to anyone. The mere fact that Edison spent years of his life in developing that process counted for nothing. The invention of the three-wire system, which, when it was first announced as saving over 60% of copper in the circuits, was regarded as an utter impossibility. This patent was likewise held by a federal judge to be lacking in invention. In the motion picture art, Infringements began with its very birth, and before the inevitable litigation could be terminated, no less than ten competitors were in the field, with whom compromises had to be made. In a foreign country, Edison would have undoubtedly received signal honors. In his own country, he has won the respect and admiration of millions. But in his chosen field, as an inventor, and as a patentee, his reward has been empty. The courts abroad have considered his patents in a liberal spirit and given him his due. The decisions in this country have fallen wide of the mark. We make no criticism of our federal judges. As a body, they are fair, able, and hard-working. But they operate under a system of procedure that stifles absolutely the development of inventive genius. Until that system is changed, and an opportunity offered for a final, swift, and economical adjudication of patent rights, American inventors may well hesitate before openly discussing their inventions to the public, and may seriously consider the advisability of retaining them as, quote, trade secrets, end quote. End of chapter 28. Recording by Mitch Leppard, Atlanta. HTTP 
colon double forward slash mitchleppard.voices.com. <laughs>